Good morning, everybody. I'm Councilmember Steve Levin, Chair of the Council's Committee on General Welfare, and I want to thank you all for joining me for the Fiscal 2020 Preliminary Budget Hearing for the General Welfare Committee. Today, we will hear from three agencies, the Human Resources Administration, HRA, the Department for Homeless Services, DHS, uh, who will be testifying as one under the umbrella of the Department of Social Services, DSS, as, and we will be hearing from the Administration for Children's Services later, each on their proposed fiscal 2020 budgets. The city's proposed fiscal 2020 preliminary budget totals $92.2 billion, of which approximately $15 billion fund HRA, DHS, and ACS. Funding for these agencies is a bit more than 16% of the city's total preliminary expense budget for fiscal 2020. With each social services agency here today, we will be asking how new needs, various funding and headcount adjustments, performance indicators, and new policies will impact and enhance each city's ability to serve the most vulnerable populations in New York City. This morning, we will begin with the testimony from the Department of Social Services, which encompasses the Human Resources Administration and the Department of Homeless Services. As the largest social services agency in the country, HRA provides cash assistance, emergency food assistance and SNAP, HIV AIDS support services, also referred to as HASA, legal services, anti-eviction services, rental arrears, rental assistance through the FAHEPS program, and many other public assistance programs to aid low-income New Yorkers and prevent homelessness. DHS provides transitional shelter for homeless single adults, adult families, and families with children in accordance with New York City's right to shelter mandate. DHS also helps clients to exit shelter and move into permanent and supportive housing. Since the adoption of the fiscal 2019 budget, HRA's fiscal 2020 preliminary budget has grown by $96.3 million, or approximately 1% to $10.2 billion. Overall, HRA's proposed fiscal 2020 preliminary budget reflects a vision that shows a continued commitment to helping low-income New Yorkers and provide them with meaningful and impactful services. This administration and HRA's commissioner, Stephen Banks, or DSS's commissioner, Stephen Banks, uh, continue to tackle some of the city's most complex issues, including homelessness, support services, and housing. HRA's fiscal 2020 preliminary budget reflects a financial commitment to addressing these issues. New needs totaling $120 million in the agency's budget include bringing the allowance rate up to the 2016 fair market rent with 2% annual increase thereafter for HASA scatter site housing. Uh, implicit bias training for 17,000 HRA and DHS staff in response to the Jasmine Headley incident this past fall. Funding for the rollout of the Fair Fares program, which provides half price metro cars to low income New Yorkers and was a priority of our speaker, Corey Johnson, and the council in last budget. And the Thrive funding to train staff and screen for mental health at NYCHA Job Plus program sites. Since the adoption of the fiscal 2019 budget, DHS's fiscal 2020 preliminary budget has grown by $44.2 million, or approximately 2% to $2.1 billion. Overall, DHS's proposed fiscal 2020 preliminary budget is largely comprised of the cost of providing shelter to the over 60,000 individuals a day that are in New York City's shelter system. One new need of $25 million was added to the DHS preliminary budget for the Street Solutions Program, which works with the, particular, with the particularly vulnerable street homeless population. This funding will increase the number of safe haven beds and add two new drop-in centers as well. Even with these impactful investments, more can and should be done, and we need to think more deeply about where we can effectively allocate our city's resources. I'm especially concerned with the shelter census, that has continued to increase despite investments in preventive services, rental assistance vouchers, and aftercare services. There has been no meaningful decrease in the number of people in shelter each night, and in fact, it continues to rise, as does the average length of stay. Annually, DHS spends $376 million on shelter hotels and $65 million on cluster sites, but that money could and should be spent on affordable housing to permanently move people out of shelter. This past fall, the Link Rental Assistance Programs were collapsed into the new FEPS program, 
We, but we are concerned with the efficacy of this program and the ability of voucher holders to find and sustain housing placements. There are also potential funding cuts that are of concern. The state proposed a detrimental 10% cut in TANF funding that would reduce funding to DSS by $125 million, impacting shelter spending and cash assistance. If this proposed state cut were to be enacted, difficult decisions would have to be made at DSS on how to fill this budget gap, and we are concerned on how it could impact the services provided to the city's most vulnerable populations. In addition, HRA and DSS DHS have a combined PEG target of $50 million, which would be reflected in which will be reflected in the executive budget. We'd like to hear more about that today. Other areas of concern, uh, er areas of concerns that we would like to discuss during this hearing include DHS's model budgeting, which has been slow and challenging for providers, leaving many with very delayed payments, and the city's dependency on commercial hotels and cluster sites. The need also for uh, more aftercare and preventive services, uh, and the lack of transparency in the DHS budget, which only has two units of appropriations for a budget in excess of $2 billion. Lastly, I did want to point out the general difficulty that the Council has had with getting timely, meaningful reporting and responses to questions from DSS. Legally required reports are routinely issued well past their due dates in difficult to read formats with the manner in which the data is displayed often changing from reporting period to reporting period. As part of last year's budget negotiations with the Council, DSS promised to provide a monitor's package report to the Council with each financial plan within two weeks of the plan being released. The first report related to the November plan was received on March 3rd after several requests and reporting for the preliminary plan was sent to the Council this past Friday, March 22nd, at 3.50 p.m., less than one business day before this hearing. Uh, obviously, we were unable to incorporate that information into the briefings for council members for this hearing. In order for the council to do our due diligence to analyze 16% of the city's total budget, we need this information in a timely manner and presented in such a way that is organized and easy to synthesize. We would like the agency to commit today on the record to provide this reporting going forward on time, complete, and in a mutually agreed upon, easily readable format. Additionally, we would like the agency to commit to be more reliably and expeditiously responsive to questions from the Council on matters relating to budget and program operations. Before I welcome the Commissioner and the Administrators and staff, I would like to acknowledge my colleagues who are here today. Council Members Adrian Adams and Barry Gradenchik of Queens and Council Member Antonio Reynoso of Brooklyn. I'd also like to thank the General Welfare Committee staff for their amazingly hard work uh, in, in uh, preparing for today's hearing um, and providing uh, the Council Members with uh, and the public with information that is uh, essential for our understanding of how these agencies operate. Uh, and and uh, their, their work is really uh, incredible, and I want to thank them. Uh, Dohini Sampora, Unit Head, Regina Pareda Ryan, our Deputy Finance Director, Julia Haramis, our Finance Analyst, Aminta Kilowan, Senior Counsel, and Tanya Cyrus and Crystal Pond, Senior Policy Analyst, for putting this hearing together. Uh, again, uh, a, a really a, a amazing work. Thank you. Uh, I'd also like to thank my Chief of Staff, Jonathan Boucher, and my Legislative Director, Elizabeth Adams. And now, Commissioner Banks, our counsel will swear you in, and anyone that is testifying today. So if you could all raise your hand, please. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before the committee today and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. yes. I do. You may begin. Good morning. I'd like to thank the City Council's General Welfare Committee and Chair Steve Levin for giving us this opportunity to testify today about the Department of Social Services fiscal year 2020 preliminary budget and our reforms to improve benefits and services for low-income New Yorkers. My name is Stephen Banks and I'm the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Social Services. In this capacity, I oversee the Human Resources Administration and the Department of Homeless Services. Joining me today, are the DSS First Deputy Commissioner Molly Murphy, HRA Administrator Grace Benia, DHS Administrator Jocelyn Carter, uh, DSS Chief Program and Planning and Financial Management Officer Ellen Levine, and DSS Chief of Staff Scott French. 
The FY20 preliminary budget reflects the ongoing reforms and initiatives that we have been implementing over the last five years to address past policies that did, uh, 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 that for many years had not served our clients well. During the past five years as the HRA commissioner and the last three heading DHS as well as HRA as the DSS commissioner, we've been focused on addressing the underlying structural barriers our clients face and improving the ways in which clients interact with our agency and access the benefits and services they need. The reforms and initiatives we are implementing are taking hold despite prior decades of underinvestment in affordable housing and ongoing affordability challenges in the uh, rental market. From 2005 to 2015, median rents increased almost five times as fast as household income, with rents going up nearly 19 percent and incomes increasing less than 5 percent. And to make matters worse, our city lost approximately 150,000 units of rent-regulated housing between 1994 and 2012. The New York City Housing and Vacancy Survey reported recently that the vacancy rate is less than 2 percent for low-cost housing and less than 1.1 percent for housing at the lowest cost level, $800 or below. These are the hard realities that our clients and our agency confront every day. As I will outline in our testimony today, funding for our FY20 preliminary budget supports our continued commitment to improve our policies, programs, and operations to reduce income inequality, fight poverty and homelessness, and help New Yorkers in need get back on their feet with dignity. The FY20 HRA DSS preliminary budget is $10.16 billion, consisting of $7.78 billion in city funds. The FY20 DHS preliminary budget is $2.11 uh, billion consisting of 1.21 billion in city funds. The HRA headcount for FY20 includes 11,183 city funded positions and another 3,500 non city funded positions. DHS headcount for FY20 includes 2,613 city funded positions and another approximately 50 non city funded positions, most of which are added to the budget once the fiscal year begins. The preliminary budget maintains our funding for our core missions and provides some important additions, including baseline funding for the street solutions expansion, rent increases in the scattered site housing program for clients with HIV AIDS, funding to provide implicit bias training to all of our combined DHS staff, and funding for body-worn cameras for our peace officers, both of which we described in our testimony last month, and $106 million for the Fair Fares program in FY20 that we will discuss today. As the mayor announced when the FY20 preliminary budget was released last month, we are working with the Office of Management and Budget to develop savings for the FY20 executive budget. These savings will build on efficiencies that we have already achieved over the last five years. For example, during my first year at HRA, we implemented a plan to repurpose more than 500 central administrative staff lines to enhance the provision of frontline client services. Let me talk first about reforming social services policies and access to benefits. Over the past five years, we've made a number of significant reforms to transform the client experience that are supported in the FY20 preliminary budget. Consider, for example, these policies we have changed to benefit our clients. Clients used to have to work off their benefits in the Work Experience Program, or WEP, at city and not-for-profit agencies. We eliminated the WEP program and replaced it with new opportunities and subsidized jobs, more diverse internship and community service opportunities, and education and training programs to help clients move forward on a career pathway. Participation in four-year college was not permissible uh, employment activity for clients. We successfully advocated for a change in state law to permit clients to obtain college degrees that greatly enhance their ability to earn a living wage. Clients who are subjected to punitive sanctions for missing WEP assignments received appointments at the Intensive Services Center number 71, and if they missed those appointments, the entire family would be denied assistance. We closed Center 71. Clients used to be subjected to durational employment sanctions for cash assistance if they were charged with violating a program rule. We successfully advocated for a change in state law as applied to New York City to give clients an opportunity to cure a violation at any time and avert a durational sanction. And we also successfully advocated for reduced state sanction period for SNAP food stamps. That means that people do not have to lose their housing, go hungry, or forgo buying clothing for their children because of a durational sanction. As part of the transformation process for cash assistance to reduce unnecessary office visits, clients can now submit recertification questionnaires online and submit documents from a smartphone through Access HRA, uh, the Access HRA portal 
clients can open an account to gain access to over 100 case-specific points of information for cash assistance and SNAP in real time, including application and case statuses, upcoming appointments, account balances, documents requested for eligibility determinations, and clients can make changes to contact information, view eligibility notices electronically, request a budget letter, and opt into text messages and email alerts, all designed to avoid unnecessary visits to our offices. Clients used to be subjected to churning due to unnecessary case closings, which required clients to request state fair hearings to reopen their case. We put in place new protocols to prevent unnecessary case closings, and state hearing challenges decreased by more than 47%. As a result, clients have access to the benefits they need, and the city is no longer subject to a potential $10 million annual state financial penalty for unnecessary hearings. To prevent both unnecessary case closings and unnecessary sanctions and resulting unnecessary hearings, before an adverse action is taken, we make sure that all required client support services like child care and card fare are in place, reasonable accommodations were honored, mailing addresses were correct, and notices were sent in the correct language. And now conciliation appointments are scheduled at Career Compass and Youth Pathways employment providers rather than at job centers so that we can re-engage clients immediately and avoid unnecessary extra appointments at our offices. Clients recertifying for cash assistance used to be forced to reapply if they failed to return a mail questionnaire or submit requested documentation. Missing paperwork shouldn't mean someone loses their benefits, and we now make it easier for clients to continue their assistance if they submit what is needed within 30 days of a case closing. All homeless clients used to have to travel to a single HRA job center in Queens. We stopped that practice, and homeless clients can now seek assistance at a job center in their home borough. All seniors used to have to go to a single HRA job center in Manhattan. We changed that, and now seniors can receive services at a job center in their home borough. Previously, clients only received a center ticket that did not list the purpose of their visit. In 2017, we worked with the Urban Justice Center's Safety Net Project to pr implement the universal receipt, the confirmation of contact with your center form, to provide an individual who completes a visit to a job or SNAP center with a document that indicates the nature and date of the visit or contact, and a copy of the receipt is also available in Access HRA. This receipt process is now codified in local law as a result of legislation sponsored by Speaker Johnson. We improved uh, Access HRA with a client benefits portal so that SNAP applications, recertifications, and renewals can all be done online without having to go to an HRA SNAP office. Now SNAP clients conduct 87% of these transactions online and documents can be submitted via our mobile app on a smartphone. Clients used to have to conduct SNAP eligibility interviews by phone within a rigid four-hour window. Now interviews are conducted at the client's convenience by phone, and the percentage of completed telephone eligibility interviews increased from 29% in 2013 to 95% in 2018. This change helps clients access the benefits they need to purchase food. Clients classified as able-bodied adults without dependents, or ABODs, were limited to SNAP food stamp benefits for only three out of 36 months if they could not find work for at least 80 hours a month because New York City refused to accept a federal waiver of this rule that every other county in New York State and most other states accepted. We reversed this policy and accepted the waiver that covers areas of New York City with high unemployment so that more clients can retain their SNAP benefits. And now we are fighting back against the Trump administration's efforts to drastically reduce the scope of ABOD waivers. Rent arrears checks used to be processed at each individual HRA job center. We streamlined the system by instituting a centralized rent arrears processing unit to ensure that rent arrears payments are issued by the required due date. New York City Housing Authority rent payments used to be issued in paper checks. Now we have streamlined a system for making these rent payments electronically, and we're developing a similar payment system for private landlords. Moreover, ac using Access HRA, clients can confirm that the rent was paid to their landlords, pursuant to reform now codified in state law to provide this information. This makes the process easier for clients and gives them one less thing to worry about as they pay their rent. In 2014, 90 clients per year received reasonable accommodations. In settling the 2005 Lovely Age class action lawsuit, we began working with expert consultants to develop tools to assess whether clients need reasonable accommodations as a result of physical or mental disabilities. Now 46,000 clients annually receive reasonable accommodations. Clients with HIV used to have to wait until they were diagnosed with AIDS to receive HASA assistance. Working with Speaker Johnson when he was a council member at Housing Works, 
we ended that counterproductive policy so that we can ensure that clients have the services and housing assistance they need. Let me now turn to reforming homeless policies and services. As we've reported previously, homelessness increased 115% in our city from 1994 to 2014, and we've implemented a comprehensive plan that broke this trajectory of growth. We know we have much more to do, but our initiatives are beginning to take hold, keeping the shelter census flat over two years for the first time in a decade, doubling down on preventing homelessness. Evictions are down 37% since 2013, providing more permanent housing, enabling more than 109,000 children and adults to move out of shelter or avoid shelter altogether, bringing people off the streets and out of the subways. Since Homestat began in April 2016, our street teams have helped more than 2,000 people come off the streets and subways and remain off. And transforming the city's approach to shelter, closing more than 180 substandard shelter sites and citing 42 new borough-based shelters to offer help as close as possible to the anchors of life, like jobs, schools, healthcare, houses of worship, and family and support networks. Funding in the FY20 preliminary budget will support these four key pillars of the Mayor's Turn the Tide plan that was released just two, two years ago with these results so far. First pillar, a prevention first approach, progress evictions down 37%. We've provided emergency rent arrears benefits to over 50,000 households each fiscal year since FY15, helping rent burdened New Yorkers at risk of eviction stay in their homes. We've extended, expanded free legal assistance for New Yorkers in danger of eviction, increasing funding for legal services for tenants exponentially from roughly six million to 166 million at full implementation in FY22. Evictions have dropped 37% and more than 100,000 New Yorkers were able to stay in their homes from 2014 to, to, to 2018. We're phasing in over five years the funding necessary to provide universal access to legal services for all New York City tenants facing eviction and housing court or NYCH determination and tenancy cases, a first in the nation initiative of the administration and the council that will benefit more than 400,000 New Yorkers annually at full implementation in FY22 with 166 million in annual funding for tenant legal services. Second pillar, rehousing to alleviate homelessness. Progress, more than 109,000 New Yorkers rehoused. In 2011, the city and state canceled the Advantage Rental Assistance Program, resulting in a 38% increase in homelessness in just three years between 2011 and 2014. We stepped in to fill the gap, creating new rental assistance programs as well as reinstating rehousing programs, which all together have helped more than 109,000 children and adults move out of shelter or avoid shelter altogether since 2014, with the majority exiting shelter into housing. Third pillar, transforming the approach to providing shelter, progress, shrinking DHS's shelter footprint by nearly 30%. Our plan calls for shrinking the DHS shelter footprint by 45% by ending the use of 360 cluster shelter and commercial hotel locations citywide while opening a smaller number of 90 borough-based shelters across the five boroughs. Through these strategies in just two years, we reduced the shelter footprint by nearly 30% citywide, getting out of more than 180 shelter sites that did not meet our standards, including our ready ending use of 70% of the units in the Giuliani era cluster program. And to help us do so, early this month, we announced the conversion of cluster units to permanent housing in 17 buildings that will enable 1,200 homeless children and adults to be permanently housed with rent-stabilized leases and upgraded apartment conditions in buildings that will be owned by reputable nonprofit housing groups. As we phase out the old haphazard Band-Aid approach to providing shelter that built up over the past 40 years, we have cited 42 new high-quality borough-based shelters, 23 of which are already open, offering families and individuals the opportunity to get back on their feet closer to their support networks and the communities they called home. At the same time, while we have held the overall DHS census flat for the last two years, for the first time in a decade, we've also made progress driving down the number of families experiencing homelessness and residing in shelter on any given night, with the peak number of individuals across families declining by nearly 3,000 between 2014 and 2018, even as we provided shelter and services to more than 550 evacuees from Puerto Rico who the Trump administration abandoned. Fourth pillar, addressing street homelessness, progress, more than 2,000 New Yorkers off the streets. 
In 2016, we launched Homestat, the most comprehensive street outreach program in the nation, with outreach teams canvassing all five boroughs 24, 7, 365 days of the year, engaging New Yorkers experiencing homelessness and encouraging them to accept services and transition indoors. Thanks to a doubling in our funding for and the size of those outreach teams and doubling and soon to be tripling our safe haven and stabilization beds, our Homestead program has helped more than 2,000 individuals come off the streets and subways and into transitional and permanent settings and continue to remain off the streets and subways. New initiatives, Fair Fairs NYC. In January, we officially launched Fair Fairs NYC. The program will provide thousands of New Yorkers at or below the poverty level with access to affordable public transportation, ex uh, easing the financial burden of commuting to work and a wide range of essential tasks that require travel. The Fair Fairs NYC MetroCard allows uh, participants to purchase unlimited weekly and monthly passes at 50% discount at MTA vending machines. The city also worked with New York City Transit to phase in a pay-per-ride option, which was launched on March 15, 2019. Starting on the launch date, DSS HRA began contacting New Yorkers who are working and receive cash assistance and who do not already receive transportation assistance from HRA or New York City Transit to inform them of their eligibility and invite them to visit the nearest Fair Fares NYC location to pick up their Fair Fares Metro card. In February, DSS HRA began co uh, contacting some working SNAP food stamp recipients as well. Additional mail notices, reminder phone calls, and texts were and continue to be made to eligible individuals who have not picked up their discounted card. Eligible individuals and those with questions can also call 301 and HRA info line for assistance in receiving the Fair Fares Metro card. In the first week of March, we launched a targeted digital advertising campaign to inform eligible individuals about the program and encourage them to pick up their discounted Metro card. Beginning next month, DSS HRA will expand eligibility to all working New Yorkers with incomes at or below the federal poverty level who are receiving cash assistance or SNAP food stamp benefits and do not already receive transportation assistance. As we are making it, uh, and we're making it even easier for participants to get enrolled and receive their Fair Fares cards. Next month, eligible clients will be able to enroll in the Fair Fares program online using Access HRA and receive their card through the mail without any need to come into an office. Planning is underway to expand the program in the fall of 2019 to more low-income New Yorkers, such as those served by the City University of New York, the New York City Housing Authority, and veterans. In January 2020, we plan to launch the, an open enrollment process for all eligible New Yorkers at or below federal, the federal poverty level who don't have discounted transportation assistance from HRA or New York City Transit. In the preliminary budget, the Fair Fares program was funded $106 million in, in FY20, the second year of implementation. Future funding for the program is subject to budget discussion. We greatly appreciate the, leader of speak, uh, the leadership of Speaker Johnson and the Council and Speaker Johnson's continued collaboration on this initiative as we continue to enroll more New Yorkers. State and federal landscape. Finally, our FY20 preliminary budget has been released against a background of significant challenges at the state and federal levels that imperil our progress and our reforms. The state executive budget, for example, proposes to cut New York City's reimbursement for family assistance funded, at temporary, uh, funded by the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families or TANF program by 10% annually. This cut would mean amount to a $125 million cut in annual public assistance and family shelter funding. Given the impact of this potential $125 million budget gap on our reforms to improve client services, we appreciate the support of the Council to prevent this cut from being enacted in the final state budget that is being negotiated right now. On the federal level, the Trump administration is using the regulatory process as an end run around the compromise reached by Congress in the 2018 Farm Bill. As described earlier in my testimony, in May 2014, New York City accepted the federal able-bodied adults without dependents ABOD waiver, which provides individuals who are unemployed or underemployed with an exemption from the work requirement limitation so they can receive ongoing SNAP food stamps if they cannot find at least 80 hours of work per month. Otherwise, they would be limited to receiving SNAP benefits for only three months in any three-year period unless they qualify for a different exemption or are able to find enough hours of work each month. In the 2018 reauthorization of the Farm Bill, Congress rejected the Trump administration's attempt to significantly roll back the availability of the ABOD waiver. 
However, circumventing Congress's determination to limit the Trump administration's ABOD waiver rollback, the U.S. Department of Agriculture has released a proposed rule that would restrict ABOD waivers to areas where the unemployment rate is higher than the 7 percent compare, uh, uh, than 7 percent compared to the current unemployment rate threshold for ABOD waivers of 10 percent. This attack on unemployed and underemployed low-income single adults will exacerbate food insecurity. Should this rule be adopted, it will result in many New Yorkers losing their SNAP benefits if they are not able to find 80 hours of work in a month. We will be opposing this proposed rule, and we hope we can count on the support of the Council to fight this draconian proposal. Thank you again for this opportunity to testify, and we will continue to work with the Council to keep moving forward with our reforms of these important programs. We welcome any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Uh, and I want to acknowledge uh, Councilmember Ben Kalos, who is here as well. Um, so I might jump around for a little bit, uh, so I apologize for that. But being that we have uh, both HRA and DHS here, um, uh, th that's kind of to be expected. Um, so uh, the first issue I wanted to ask about was um, uh, kind of some housekeeping here, but around that monitor's report mm -hmm. and getting timely data. Um, as I said in my opening remarks, um, uh, the Council's finance staff uh, uh, was given information late um, and not within the agreed upon time frame of two weeks after the release of the financial plan, um, and that the data provided for that, that hearing, uh, this hearing was provided um, uh, um, for the January plan uh, just on Friday. And so when we were preparing for this hearing, we were relying on data that went up to October of last year, uh, and that's outdated. And then the format um, uh, was not conducive to any type of analysis and included very little budget information. Um, obviously, this is not acceptable. Um, we are a co-equal branch of government and we cannot effectively do oversight um, and represent the public's interest if we don't have clear information. So I was wondering if you could speak to uh, uh, that issue and um, uh, reiterate your agency's commitment to providing this council with timely information um, that is in an easily readable format uh, so that we can do our job. But our, that is our commitment. As you know, we, you and I meet quite frequently, and our, uh, your finance staff works very hard and works together with OMB finance staff and the agency finance staff. Uh, this is the first uh, of, of the agreed upon monitoring reports, and I think we're really very committed to making sure that you get it in a timely fashion. I think in terms of the information, the content, there are some challenges in our, in our ability to um, uh, provide it in all of the areas that you're looking for, but we will keep working with you to uh, be able to make sure that we can give you as much information uh, as, as we can so that you can perform the uh, uh, required uh, requirements of, of your role and we can uh, work collaboratively with you. As I said, uh, I think when I testified here last month, uh, in going through all of the reforms that we've implemented, uh, many of them have been implemented in partnership with you and your leadership of this committee, and certainly the speaker, uh, uh, the speaker's leadership is very, very important to our uh, making the reforms that we're making, and we're very committed to getting the information that you need it, uh, and I'm sure we can work uh, through the issues that arose in this first report as we go forward with future reports. Okay, it was, this was the, the second report because the first one was the November plan and the, and the first one and, the, and the, uh, I, I, the second one was the preliminary budget. Right. I think as you know though, the November plan is a much more limited document than the preliminary budget and uh, I know that we will continue to work with you to meet the, meet the time frames that we agreed to. Uh, we want you to have the information and uh, we appreciate the collaboration with you. Okay, do we, I mean, do we have to renegotiate the? I don't think we do. Okay. okay. Um, uh, I want to ask about um, uh, model budgets. Yep. Um, our understanding is that 10 model budget amendments have been registered and there are 48 that are pending. Um, obviously this has been going on for a long time. Can you speak a little bit about the process there and why there are so many that remain unregistered? 
Uh, I mean, how long has this taken? So I think it's important for the sake of the record to draw a distinction between registering contracts and the model budget process, which those are really two separate processes. Okay. Uh, the registration of contracts involves the ongoing registration of contracts. When I first uh, conducted 90 day reviews, there were, as you know, backlogs of registered contracts going back for a long period of time. Model budget is adding additional money to those contracts, and I can report. But they're through, amend through contract amendments. Through, through contract amendments. That's okay. what I okay. wanted to make that distinction. Okay. I appreciate that you uh, made that distinction. Um, in terms of where we are with registration of contracts, we'll come to amendments in a moment. Uh, for FY19, uh, FY19 uh, 98 percent of the FY19 contracts are registered. There were uh, uh, three, uh, I'm sorry, there are 98 percent of the FY19 contracts for DHS are registered and active. Uh, there are six outstanding FY19 contracts, three of which are registered and pending provider budget submissions, and three of which are pending uh, registration. Uh, for HRA, 90% of the contracts are registered. There are nine outstanding legal services contracts that are currently at the Financial Control Board, and we expect to be able to move those through. I think that addresses the issue that first confronted us uh, when we integrated the agencies regarding uh, the simple registration of contracts, period. In terms of model budgeting, uh, there are Currently, let me, there are 126 contracts that needed to be negotiated that were subject to the model budget process. 104 uh, of the providers submitted the information that we needed on time uh, or less than six months late. Uh, 22 providers submitted them uh, over six months late or never submitted them at all. Of the 104 uh, uh, that we've got timely materials, uh, timely budget materials on, 63 uh, of those uh, uh, have all gone through the OMB process and are moving through the process. Uh, and the rest of them we are working through with providers. I think one of the challenges of the model budget, budget process is we didn't present them as a take it or leave it process and we gave a lot of time for back and forth. Having said that, we're committed to achieving the commitment that the mayor made of getting uh, all of these completed uh, by, uh, by the time frame during this fiscal year. And uh, we're really to the point where uh, when negotiations have reached an impasse, we're gonna have to proceed with the, with the amendment because we wanna be able to deliver on our commitments to you and the commitments the mayor's made in terms of completing this process. Okay, I'm sorry, so so um, the number that have been registered though, you, sorry, you cited uh, that, that they've gone through the OMB process, but I don't know where that, where that leaves them in terms of their registration as a right. There are 12 that have been registered by the controller and another uh, 65 that are in state of the process that will be to the, I'm sorry, uh, 53, you did the math wrong, I apologize. Okay. Uh, 65, that's roughly 50% of the total number that we had, uh, are either registered or on their way to moving to be at the control at, in a timely fashion so that they're registered during this fiscal year. Are they, okay, I'm sorry. So, so there are 53 that are, that are at the controller or en route to the on, controller? Uh, on the process, as you know, there are multiple oversights that contracts have to go through. What's but, after OMB and before controller? Uh, there are, uh, there's financial control board, there's MOCs, there's a law department. Okay. Uh, I know that this has been the subject of a lot of conversation about the contracting process, mm -hmm. uh, but I want to again reiterate that the mayor made a commitment not just for our agency, but for uh, contracts across multiple agencies to get these amendments and processes completed. Uh, before the end of this fiscal year, and we're on track to do that. To get all, to get 100% of the contracts? No, there are 22 that are, were either submitted over six months late or never submitted. We're not gonna be able to get those through. Uh, okay. And we've got uh, how many? How many in total are there? 126. We started off seeking to have 126 model budgets completed okay. with providers. And 65, you said, are either registered or 
in the process of yeah. get, going to the controller. That leaves, and then there's 22 that submitted late, and that leaves a difference of, there's another, I don't know, another 30, 40. 30, 30 to 40 in that. And in what's that the status of those? Uh, those are ones where we're still trying to uh, come to some agreement with the providers. Uh, uh -huh. The providers are, uh, are, have been great partners for us, uh, and we want to bring those conversations to a conclusion. Okay, and so the expectation is that for those 30 or 40 that didn't submit six months late but are not on their way already to the controller's office, that those will be that's, that's, registered by the end of this fiscal year. That's what our that's what our commitment is to achieve. Okay, because in order. Okay, so how long does it? I'm sorry. How long does it take between being approved by OMB? to registered. So the, those intermediate steps of the Financial Control Board, it, MOX, controller. There are, as, as I know you know, uh, from the overall focus on the procurement process, there are a number of steps that, uh, let me just finish right. please, yeah. there are a number of steps in any particular contract that can, uh, uh, that vary. Uh, the thing that we know for certain is the controller has 30 days to register a contract, so mm -hmm. we work back from that. Uh, in terms of making the commitment that the mayor made and that we are committed to to achieve. Uh, and the controller has been very helpful uh, in this process. We expect to get the contracts we can to the controller in a timely fashion, and each one of them is on a path to get there. But again, I want to go back and reiterate what I said at the beginning of, of this series of questions. We have registered contracts that are active and paying providers. The model budget process is a process about giving providers more money than they have gotten previously because of a determination that we have made that we think that a greater investment in our providers will be better for the clients and better for the providers. I think sometimes when this topic is talked about, it's talked about as if there's no money being paid. That I think does a disservice to the providers and a disservice to the process. Having said that, we're very focused on the second part of the process, which is completing the amendments so that we can increase the value of the contracts for the providers, having made a judgment that we think it's in our client's interest and helpful to the providers to provide the additional funding through the model budgets. If you were to speak to what are some of the, because honestly, this, is, this has gone on for quite some time now, um, and you know, the expectation probably at the outset was that by March of 2019, these, these contract amendments would have been would have been uh, negotiated and registered. I'm just wondering what was the, you know, if, in, in retrospect, what, um, what led to this delay? I think uh, I, don't, I don't want anything I'm about to say to uh, minimize the importance of what I view as engagement with the providers. I think we did not take a take it or leave it approach. We took a negotiated approach and that it is not a cookie cutter approach when you're talking about shelter. Every location has different issues. Uh, there are different physical uh, requirements in terms of security. There are different rents at different shelters. Uh, there may be different staffing needs for non-security depending on the way the, the, the size of the shelter and how it's configured. We did not take a cookie cutter approach and we believed in uh, negotiations and input and back and forth with our providers. I think that that is a stronger, healthier process than to a year ago have said, here's the amount of money, take it or leave it. Um, were there providers that did not, that refused, that, that have refused to participate? I mean, you said there's just 22 well, that were late. I mean, how many, of those 22, how many are late and how many are not, not participating? I mean, from our purposes, if we don't have anything from them or, uh, or they're simply late, we didn't have the ability to engage them in the way that we want to engage them. I can give you a breakdown of those 22. But uh, we had set last November as a cutoff point to be able to complete the registration of these amendments this fiscal year. Mm -hmm. And uh, we gave a number of opportunities for people to provide us. Again, I do not want anyone to, to, to see this as an adversarial process between the providers and us. They're, they're great, uh, we value them greatly. They've been a, a very important part of the reforms we've been making and providing them with additional funding is an important priority of ours. But the first task at hand was making sure that they go into fiscal years with registered contracts, which we now have, which we didn't have at the time of the 90-day review. Um, 
I have a number of questions around kind of transparency and data that, that we're able to get, but uh, along uh, uh, with this line of questioning around um, the model contracts, we, we at the council don't have any aggregate data on uh, DHS's budget in terms of how much shelters are spending on rent or social workers or case managers or, or any, any budget um, lines. We, we, we see, you know, I, I, well, I'll get to the end of appropriations um, in a minute, but, uh, but we have no clear picture of how much shelters are spending on various budget codes. Um, can you work with our staff to uh, to come up with a a framework so that we can analyze um, how shelters within your contract budget are are um, are uh, determining their budgets? I mean, we can certainly review the model budgeting process. Um, I always want to say, yes, let's sit down and try to work it through, but I'm, I want to just have the caveat that I raised with you a little bit earlier, which is uh, there is variation based upon size, based mm -hmm. upon location, based upon physical configuration, and I don't want to be misleading in saying, yeah, we can come up with a construct that will work, but we can cer I certainly will commit to uh, providing information, uh, and I think it's a commitment I've made at prior hearings which is to say we'll, we can show you budget functions, uh, and I think we've done that before in other areas, particularly legal services, uh, but yes, I commit that we can sit down and try to work through uh, how we do budget functions, and I think that'll give greater insight to you and to the finance staff about uh, where we're ending up with the model budget process. Okay, I mean, I, I, we can proceed uh, after this hearing, but I, I, um, we have no, I, I, if it's, I realize that there's a challenge with aggregating the data because of the um, the fluctuation or the uh, uh, the difference be between different shelters. But um, we have, I mean, we would like to see as specific information as or data as you have. And um, if that's shelter by shelter, we would be interested in looking at that as well, because uh, we just we don't know how much is is spent on. Um, various aspects of the shelter system, and again, the unit of appropriation being that there are two uh, unit of appropriations for the entire agency, PS and OTPS, uh, that's a real challenge for us. Right. So I, I think that a, a meeting would be very helpful because the information I think you're lo looking for is in budget codes that are named as a general matter, but for each individual shelter, we register a contract that's got that kind of information, and I think I think our mm -hmm. staffs could sit down and come up with a way to look at Great. information that's currently available uh, on a shelter by shelter basis. Because, as I said, as part of getting the contract registered, we need to have exactly the information you're offer asking me about. Uh, and obviously, you could add it all up across the system. I'm just reacting to could you mm -hmm. get a construct? I think that that is difficult given the shelter by shelter issues that come up, frankly, in the model budget and why it takes takes more time mm -hmm. uh, than if it was a cookie cutter approach. Mm -hmm. But we'll, let's have our staff sit down and, and look at the budget codes that do exist in terms of budget functionality, uh, and let's look at the budgets for the 100 and 126 shelters. Okay, I mean, one thing just about, and this is just, a, a, I think, something that I, I've been thinking about, um, <coughs> That comes up when you when you mention the the kind of difference between shelters uh, in terms of of their the type of programming they have. In some sense, that's a disparity between shelters. In if if if, if a if a family shelter if a tier two family shelter uh, can't be is 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 wildly different from another tier two family shelter or then, then isn't then then is the, doesn't that indicate that there's not a standard level of service yeah. that families are getting? Because if one shelter is negotiating for social workers and uh, other um, uh, staff lines that could support uh, families and children in shelter, and another one isn't, and negotiating more for rent, and saying, well, we're going to you know, isn't that? Um, 
Doesn't that, doesn't that indicate that there's some disparity within the system? If that were true, you would be correct, but that's actually not what the situation is. So for example, social workers, we have a, we have a one to 25 ratio, uh, uh, and we have been, been uh, funding that through this initiative. But uh, the model budget actually eliminates disparities. When, when I began the 90-day review, uh, shelter providers talked to me about how much you got paid depending on when you brought the shelter online. The model budgeting process limits that. What I was referring to is if you've got a four-story shelter versus a two-story shelter versus a five-story shelter, that has different implications for your staffing. That's not about service delivery. That's mm -hmm. about being able to manage the size of your, the contours of your building. And that's why, again, it's not simply a cookie cutter approach. Mm -hmm. uh, and we certainly looked at, you know, mental health shelters, employment shelters, families with children shelters uh, versus single adult shelters. We, that's, that's what the model budget process did. It's brought rationality to budgeting that was missing for decades. But uh, you're, you're appropriately zeroing in on something I said that had to do with the configuration of the shelter, not the service delivery. Okay. And that's why it's, you can't have it be a cookie cutter approach. Okay. Again, rents could vary. The rent may be different for a shelter in you know, where you, or I, you and I live than in a shelter in a different borough. In the past, that would have resulted in a rejection of the shelter budget because of the desire to have the lowest cost mm -hmm. versus the value that we have in the turn and tide plan, which is to give people an opportunity to be connected to the anchors of life, like schools, jobs, uh, uh, health care, houses of worship, family and friends. That's going to mean rent will vary depending on where the shelter is sited, depending upon the configuration. The security needs will be different. That's why it's not a cookie cutter. Um, okay, I want to ask about unit appropriations. So we have two unit appropriations in DHS. Uh, the council has previously asked in, in prior budget years um, for a PS unit appropriation, OTPS unit appropriation for each of the DHS program areas as outlined in the budget function analysis. Um, we have gotten rebuffed from OMB numerous times on that. Um, it's very frustrating for us to be able to examine um, the budget when we can't, when there's you know, essentially two unit of appropriations for a $2.1 billion budget. Right, I thought that we had come to agreement in the last budget process to look at budget function, uh, functions and functionality, uh, but obviously in all processes it's an ongoing discussion with you uh, and we'll continue to work with you on what we think is a, a way that makes sense for us in the way we run the program, which is to look at budget functions. Again, I come back to the legal services discussion in which there was a request to say, hey, we'd like a special unit of appropriation. And we said, actually, then you lose all the efficiencies and economies of scale of putting the uh, Office of Civil Justice within a large functioning agency so that personnel and legal and fin finance management, all those services are coming from other units of appropriation. Uh, uh, and that let's work with you on uh, budget functionality and we'll continue to work with you to give you the, the transparency that you're looking for uh, without giving up our ability to get efficiencies uh, and economies of scale uh, with these larger units of appropriation. Have you, as DHS's budget staff, been in conversations with OMB concerning the council's request on unit appropriation? I mean, OMB and our agency work closely together as we do with council finance staff and I'm sure there'll be ongoing discussions about what we can provide to you that makes sense for what you need and also makes sense for our ability to get economies of scale in a larger agency. If every piece of the agency is broken into its mm -hmm. uh, small unit of appropriation, you lose the, the, the economy that you get by putting many parts of uh, complex service delivery systems into a large agency. Okay, I mean, I just will say that there have been so many instances where our finance staff is not getting the information that they need that, that I mean, uh, I will um, I'll move on from here, but I, I think that there's a, a level of frustration with our staff not being able to get the proper and timely information. And so um, whether that's, we don't want to um, hamstring your agency or create cumbersome uh, inefficiencies, but at the same time, um, our goal is transparency, and if we, if we are saying it's untransparent, I hope that you will take that at face value, that it's untransparent. 
Look, I, it's, I, I, if, if we're saying that we can't, we don't have the information that we need, I just, I, I would hope that the agency's response is, okay, we'll get you that information. So you, you've been both a, an important supporter of our work and a constructive critic of our work, and we will, we will work with you to try to address what your concerns are. Okay. Um, I will turn it over to my colleagues for questions. First up, Councilmember Grudemczyk. And we've also been joined by Council Members Mark Jonai of the Bronx and Brad Lander of Brooklyn, and I already mentioned Ben when you were out of the room. Thank you, uh, Chair Levin. Um, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good to see you as always. Commissioner, um, it bothers me um, that we are, the mayor has talked about three quarters of a billion dollars in a, a PEG, a po program to eliminate the gap. And um, in your testimony today, which went on for seven pages, and I know it's a very large, you have a large bailiwick, um, there is exactly two sentences about how you plan on wringing efficiencies out of a budget that runs over $10 billion. And I was hoping that we could hear more from you because as the chair has said, it is very difficult for us to do our jobs for oversight um, of this enormous um, agency um, without having uh, compelling information that we can act upon. And I don't know if there's anything more you can tell us this morning, but I would appreciate some of your insight into that. Sure. Um, I think what's important to understand about uh, our budget uh, at HRA in particular is that most of the budget is actually made up of mandated entitlements for clients. So Medicaid is the largest part of our expenditures, uh, cash assistance benefits, foods, uh, uh, and, other, uh, and other benefits. If you look at our, our pie chart, most of what our budget is is actual direct uh, mandated services for clients. Similarly in DHS, shelter is a mandate. So uh, the PEG issue of the $50 million is something that OMB and we are, are very much looking at. I think I highlighted to you as I've highlighted in prior testimony, when I first came to HRA, uh, we needed additional frontline client facing staff, and we did that by repurposing five, more than 500 central administrative staff directly taking those lines. I, I appreciate what's happened in the past. I'm worried about what's going to happen tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day. You know what? You took the words right out of my mouth because the part of my testimony that I want to really focus on today is the state peg that is about to hit us in the next couple of days. Hopefully it, not. Well, we need everybody's help to make sure it doesn't happen. A $125 million cut, if it is enacted in the next several days, will have a dramatic impact on our ability to keep moving forward with the reforms we have put in place, let alone additional reforms. Any portion of that peg that state cut will have a dramatic impact on us because it's not uh, cu cuts in discretion, it's a cut in mandated provision of benefits to clients. It's a cut in TANF benefits to which clients are entitled to receive, and it's a cut in funding for shelter for which clients are entitled to sh receive. So it's not a optional uh, question for us to say, all right, now we've got 10% less in TANF money, we're, not we're gonna provide only 90% worth of the benefits. These are things that actually people are entitled to receive from us. So that means we would have to find up to $125 million in cuts within our agency for services that everybody, I think, here believes were important things that we put in place over the last several years. So if someone wants to say, why don't you just uh, cut your shelter budget? And then tomorrow night, uh, where do we put the people who come in and look for shelter? No, so, I, I understand. So, so that's I, the context in which we have a very real peg potentially hitting us in a couple of days. The council's been very supportive of this, uh, of, of, of our effort to fight back on this, and I appreciate that. But I would encourage everyone to be very focused on this in the final budget negotiations, because it would have a dramatic impact on all of the work we've been doing, let alone the kind of work that, that you have been encouraging us to take on in addition to what we've been doing. I appreciate that, and certainly uh, I have been in touch with my many state elected that. officials that I overlap with. I, I have to say that I, I am, again, disappointed, though, that the, uh, the number of people in the shelter system continues to be about 60,000. Um, I know the work that you're doing, um, but I must state that I am disappointed that we do not see the needle moving downward. 
I'm not going to ask you to comment on that, but I do want to thank you, though, uh, at the end of this for uh, the work in eliminating the last budget dance and uh, for, for the emergency food program. And I know that um, Chair Levin and I and all the members of the committee and really all the members of the council from the speaker on down uh, are uh, happy that uh, we have eliminated that dance. And I've heard from numerous providers, um, citywide major uh, providers, that um, this is had a most positive impact. We even fed Coast Guard workers um, who were uh, stranded, so to speak, uh, when the federal government shut down. Thank I'm you. done, I guess. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your leadership on the FAP issue along with the chair. I think it's a really important uh, collaborative work together on that. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Councilmember Grudenchik. If you uh, uh, have further questions, we'll do a second round. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilmember Adams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Mr. Banks. How are you today? Commissioner? I'm doing well, thank you. Um, just a couple of areas I'd like to touch on if, if time permits. If not, then we'll come back around again. Sure. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't address um, once again uh, my representation as one of three members representing Southeast Queens and the proliferation of shelters, uh, the highest number of uh, shelter positioning um, within the borough of Queens. Uh, we were uh, in instructed the other night at uh, Community Board 12 meeting um, by uh, your representatives and the placing, shall we say, of new shelters uh, coming up in Southeast Queens within the parameters of uh, Community Board 12. Um, I'd just like to hear from you uh, to uh, be on the record what uh, exactly is the nature uh, of the uh, positioning of the shelters? And also, I'd like to hear from you to address the inequity uh, of this placement of the shelters in Southeast Queens. Um, thank you, and I, I appreciate uh, during my time in this position our uh, good working relationship. Uh, and I think that your focus on Southeast Queens uh, is something that both Administrator Carter and I uh, are uh, very much supportive of, but I think as we've said all along about Southeast Queens, uh, when you, when we eliminate all the hotels, which we will do, there'll, there is still a residual need for enough shelter in that part of the borough to make sure that we can deliver on our promise to give an opportunity for families with children uh, and single adults to be sheltered near schools and jobs and health care. Uh, we, I think we've sim similarly previously testified there are about twice as many people sheltered in that community board as uh, come from it originally, and our plan is to bring that number down, but our plan as we close hotels is to make sure we have residual shelter to be able to offer the opportunity for families or children or individuals from that area to go there. We're opening a shelter there and taking down two hotels. Uh, because it was always part of our commitment that we would uh, be bringing down hotels as we were uh, moving forward with the Turn the Tide plan. And so in that particular community, we're taking down two hotels and opening a, uh, a shelter. But again, you, our commitment has not wavered from right-sizing the number of people that will be sheltered in that area when our plan is fully uh, implemented. Citywide, I think, as I said in the general, in the earlier part of the testimony, we've gotten out of 180 locations and we've cited already 42 uh, new uh, shelters, some in parts of the city that never had, never had shelters before uh, as part of the turn the tide approach. But ultimately, in the area you're concerned about, uh, we will be reducing the numbers of people sheltered in that community board to more uh, closely approximate the number of people are in our system. As we do that, we'll be closing uh, hotels and we will be uh, opening a smaller number of shelters so that we end up with that right size number. If you look at Queens overall, there are approximately 8,000 people uh, in the shelter system from Queens overall. Once we close all the hotels in Queens, we'll have enough shelter space for about more than 5,000 people. So you can see that there's a gap uh, and we're going to be placing shelters as we have been across the borough. Uh, we've got shelters in parts of the borough where there hadn't been shelters before, uh, and we're committed to continue to do that. I, I appreciate that. Uh, uh, candidly, a lot of people that I represent see this as a shell game going on right now uh, in the movement 
of displaced individuals from hotels into other facilities, other places, shelters, um, just moving them from one place to, to another. That said, what will happen to these hotels that these individuals are going to be moved out of? Will these hotels be closed? Do you have uh, relationships with these hotels? Are they going to be ghost hotels? What is going to go on with these hotels? I mean, I think that you're raising uh, an important issue. There have been a number of hotels that have opened in recent years, uh, and we've just making, been making it very clear that we're getting out of hotels uh, and that this isn't a business model uh, that should be one in which someone says, oh, I'm going to have, have homeless uh, New Yorkers housed in my hotel. We've been very clear we're getting out of hotels. Where we have exited other hotels, we just exited one in uh, Councilmember Koswitz's district, for example, uh, w we can see that they go on and, and uh, uh, provide regular room rentals like any other operating hotel. Uh, but to the extent that there are concerns that you have, uh, we're happy to to see what other enforcement agencies in the city can deal with whatever issues might arise. But I, I understand your question and it's a fair one. Thank you, I'll, I'll come back around. I'm very concerned because of the number of hotels uh, in Southeast Queens and the number of homeless individuals within these hotels in Southeast Queens and the evacuation of these individuals into shelters in Southeast Queens. The, the, the prospect of all of this is is a little frightening to me, and we, we'll talk about it a little bit more. I understand that. I want to just say this is a sea change in the way the city has been providing shelter for the last 40 years, which is a, an approach that says we're going to end up with people sheltered in parts of the city, including in Southeast Queens, uh, that gives them an opportunity to be housed close to the anchors of their lives. That means in some places there'll be fewer people sheltered in that area, like in Southeast Queens, than are currently sheltered, and in other places there'll be more people that are sheltered there because we're looking to, in this borough-based plan, to have the, where people are sheltered reflect uh, where, where their community-based needs were and are. Thank you, Councilmember Adams. Uh, Councilmember Ben Kalos. Good morning. Uh, first, I want to start off with checking out nyc.gov slash homestat, and we're going to just pull that up right now. Uh, one question is, how is the daily canvas going? I'm concerned that, uh, I'm, I'm curious whether or not you compare the, the homestat numbers to the 311 calls and have any quality control to see whether or not folks are, your canvassers are actually reaching folks because when I check out the homestead, sometimes I'm surprised to see some of the regulars in my community not being, uh, not showing up. Uh, and the reason we pulled this up in part is because it isn't working. Uh, so if you scroll down on that page, if you can scroll down, Yeah, the dashboard is missing, so uh, it, it isn't working on uh, Edge or, or Chrome. It is working on my phone. Uh, the next piece I want to touch on is... Excuse me, Councilmember, so your, your question is you, it's able to work on your mobile app, but not on the... On the uh, not it's not working. I just want to make sure I'm understanding what the request is. We'll certainly look into it. I think... Uh, uh, we I think the sure piece that I'm most work. interested in is comparing the canvassers to 311 calls and doing quality assurance that folks are doing the proactive outreach. Uh, the next can I, question can I is, answer that question. Let me let me stack on the the two additional questions if okay. I may. In terms of families with children, there are 12,418 as of 322, which was uh, Friday. How, what is the average size of those families? How large of, of an apartment do they need? Do they need two bedrooms, three bedrooms, four bedrooms, five bedrooms? And where are we on the mayor's plan for housing? And how many has been built? And can we just say that the next 12,000 apartments that we're going to build will go exclusively to formerly homeless families, period? Uh, and along those lines, the large number 
is total individuals as of uh, the 22nd is 60,315 in our shelters, but when you talk about it, you're really talking about 12,418 families uh, and then 2,515 adult families, and between those two, that accounts for 43,000 people, and then the, the individuals are such much smaller piece, so how can we prioritize to make sure, and, and last but not least, uh, as I hear from my colleagues in other parts of the city, uh, where is the, the 20 or 50 or however many hundreds of millions of dollars are necessary for land acquisition costs on the Upper East Side, and uh, what, what, how much money do you have or are you willing to ask for to build uh, supportive housing and purpose-built shelters in my district on the Upper East Side, and will you do ULERPs to get it done? It's a lot of questions in a lot of different areas. Let me, let me do my best to try to answer them. So in terms of uh, street outreach, again, I know you, you have great respect for the not-for-profits to do the street outreach, uh, and I think we've, we've, we've talked about this before. It takes on average of about five months to build someone's trust to help bring someone uh, off the street. Uh, there are other people that have been on the street for whom it's much more difficult to build trust. So I don't want you to be frustrated by the work of our not-for-profit partners if uh, you continue to see somebody that they are working with and trying to build that, that road off the streets. The 2,000 people who have come off the streets and remained off the streets since the time when Homestead began in April 2016, I think it's testament to the hard work of, of those not-for-profit providers. Uh, and uh, they're, they're out there every day uh, doing that work. I'll look into whatever the technology issue is that you're raising, uh, but we're can, very may, much may focused I, on making sure people actually succeed in bringing people in off the streets. If I may interject? Sure. If I'm making a three-on-one call, which, which you know I do frequently because every time it doesn't end up being satisfactory, you get an email from me. I Having imagine- gotten I, one lately, so I'm surprised about your question today. <laughs> uh, <laughs> In, in all honesty, it's because we're trying to work with individuals in the community, particularly around the Q station right near my district office, and we're putting in the requests, and for whatever reason, the provider is unable to find the person, even though I can look out my window and see them, and we keep getting the not finding, so I, in all honesty, kind of gave up a little bit, but I'm hoping that if there's a person, that there's an ongoing working relationship, that they would be showing up on the Canvas results every single day. So we're very concerned with quality control. It's the reason why we've had success with 2,000 human beings, and we don't use a metric of bringing you off the street if you're gonna go back on. It's off the street to remain off the street. I'd be interested, and we'll have someone follow up with you or your staff about those particular facts so we can see what went wrong and make sure that uh, we can uh, deliver on our everyday work to bring people in off the streets. You asked me uh, a number of other questions about housing. I know there's an HPD hearing on Friday in which they testified with regard to their budget. I'm gonna defer to, to their testimony regarding uh, their funding and, and their programs. We're very focused on the social services programs that we operate. Uh, and uh, I, I want to defer to, to their testimony on Friday. For the 12,000 families, what size units do they need? Is it studios, one bedrooms? Because we keep building those. Well, I think the average family size is three. Uh, it's an adult and two, two children. That's the typical family size. I would point out, as I did in the primary part of the testimony, that for families with children, the number, the peak, census in 2014 versus the peak census currently is about 3,000 fewer people in families with children. And we're gonna keep uh, moving forward with our initiatives to move people out of shelter. You've been a supporter of supportive housing. You've been a supporter of shelter. I know we were at a groundbreaking for a supportive housing facility in your district. And uh, I know that you've been talking to me about a few uh, locations in your district. And we're gonna keep, that, keep those conversations going. And is there money in the budget to build the shelters in my district? If you can identify a site to open, uh, we will be able to proceed. I think there's a misunderstanding a little bit about how shelters open. Shelters operate through reimbursement, particularly families with children's shelters, reimbursement from the state and the federal government. Uh, that would be jeopardized by the $125 million cut that I raised earlier. We'd be getting only a 90% reimbursement rather than 100% reimbursement. So. 
Uh, I want to just reiterate again the point I made earlier. We have a peg coming at us from Albany in the next couple of days, and I want to make sure all hands are on deck to, to help us with that. Thank you, Councilmember Kales. Uh, Councilmember Jonai. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good to see you again, Commissioner. It just feels like deja vu all over again. Uh, same rhetoric. Uh, chasing our tails is basically what we're doing. From scatter sites to um, hotels to the amount of money that we're spending on finding shelter for our homeless and not addressing the real issues, which is keeping New Yorkers in their homes before they become hopeless, stop the bleeding, and let's find permanent housing solutions. Uh, I keep reiterating this uh, time, and get, time and time again. Borough of the Bronx, 2016 fair share report, 41% more uh, supportive housing units than Brooklyn, 13% more than Manhattan, 99% more than Staten Island, and 100% more than Queens. The Borough of the Bronx is continually dumped on, inundated, uh, and we truly want to bear our share of the responsibility, but we don't get the resources that are needed to accommodate these families that truly need more. Um, the number of homeless children in our schools is beyond comprehension, and we don't have the support of services for them, for their families, to help them get back on their feet. From healthcare, education, policing, um, job training, and it's a continuous merry-go-round that we go through. Um, peg cuts, do you, have you been in discussions with this administration where your $50 million in peg cuts are going to be? Uh, we're certainly in discussions with OMB about that $50 million cut, but I want to encourage you, particularly uh, with your former colleagues in Albany, to focus on the $125 million state cut that is coming towards us, which is gonna make it very hard to continue the work that we're doing and the work you want us to do, so I appreciate no, it. Thank you, Commissioner, but I'm worried about your peg cuts of 50 million That's before I worry about the states. This is being handed down to you by your administration, this administration, and I'd like to know if you're partaking in dialogue with this administration on where those cuts are gonna take place, right. and if so, we'd like to know. We're in dialogue about how to implement a $50 million peg cut, but I, with respect, $125 million cut is potentially gonna hit us in a couple of days. That will imperil all of the reforms that we've implemented and the things you would like us to do. So I'm going to urge you to reach out to your former colleagues to try to head that off. I'm then reaching out to you to ask about your 50 million before I ask my colleagues in Albany about the 125 that may be coming out of pipeline and if we're gonna get progressive on the issue, let's talk about a looming recession that's gonna slow the economy down where we're all gonna have a world of trouble ahead of us. But on the $50 million peg cuts that your agency is facing, have you, can you give us any insight on where that will take place? It's, we're in discussions about how to, how to implement it and it'll be part of the executive budget. Uh, we announced that we were going, that that was the amount of money that we're responsible for coming up with savings, and we're working on a number of uh, potential uh, initiatives with OMB, and it'll be part of the executive budget. But I do want to say that if the state cut goes into in effect in the next couple of days when the budget is finalized, that's $125 million plus $50 million. It's $175 million worth of cuts. $93 billion budget. That's about $4 billion more than last year's budget, and yet we're looking at cuts and we're about $125 million. That's besides the point. A recent uh, report came out today in the New York Post how unaffordable New York City is and the uh, rising rents and the cost of living. Uh, for example, New Yorkers get the privilege of paying 42% more than the national average for milk, 47% more than the national average for bread, 55% more for eggs. And when it comes to the luxuries of car ownership, 12.5% more for fuel than the national average. And according to that report, it's because of real estate taxes. In this budget alone, we're looking at a $1.8 billion increase in real estate taxes, which is gonna make rents less, more 
less affordable for New Yorkers. And I can't help but bring up my tree bill. The only way we're going to stop the bleeding and the triage is by slowing down the number of families that are being forced out into the streets and a, the tenant rent increase exemption program will help the most vulnerable of New Yorkers, those earning under $50,000, keeping them in their homes, not allowing them to be subjected to any more rent increases. We need to become proactive and not reactive and if you want to answer that, I'm going to stick around for the second round as well. Thank you, Chair. I, I couldn't agree with you more that prevention is a, a high priority. That's why we've invested so much and been able to reduce evictions in New York City by 37%. Uh, that means 100,000 people have remained in their homes over these last five years because of the joint initiatives of the administration and the council to make uh, tenant lawyers available. Uh, it used to be that uh, one out of 100 uh, tenants in housing court had a lawyer, and now it's uh, one, uh, one out of three. And with the full implementation of universal access, uh, there'll be 100% uh, of low-income tenants will have lawyers. And you can see the, the metrics already of a 37% drop in evictions. So I couldn't agree with you more about the importance of prevention. Uh, Commissioner, Commissioner, I I, oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner, when I say proactive, let's stop the tenants from being taken to housing court for non-payment of rent to begin with and we would be able to save the money that we're providing legal services to. It's about affordability. Right, I agree. That's why we think it's so important to get the kruger Hevesy bill passed, uh, which would give us the ability to pay additional rental assistance to people uh, to help them stay in their homes and avoid evictions. I agree with that. Uh, Commissioner, I just want to follow up on the, on the PEG question. Um, I'm sorry? Of the, the PEG questions. Oh. Um, Actually, well, well, about the state cut, uh, has OMB indicated to uh, you or the agency uh, that they are or are not willing to backfill uh, any state cut that comes down to TANF, if it's 125 or if it's something less? Um, uh, has only, have you had discussions with OMB about this, and have they indicated one way or another whether they are willing to uh, authorize the city to allocate city tax levy? to backfill, uh, because that's, that's, that cuts into direct service for clients. Both OMB and we feel very strongly that the state shouldn't be transferring state obligations to us. And in the remaining days, we're 100% focused on that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I guess we'll talk about that at exec if it goes through. Uh, I, know, I know you've been involved with this. I'm gonna yeah. be in Albany tomorrow, uh, and I would encourage everyone to be very much focused on preventing mm -hmm. this from happening so we don't have to discuss it at exec. I don't want to be here testifying at the executive budget hearing mm -hmm. about the impact of that cut uh, and the services that our clients need. Um, with regard to the city's peg, so just, just for the record, um, we haven't had a, a round of pegs with uh, this administration yet, but I was here for uh, the previous administration that did do pegs. and. My recollection is that we, they laid out pegs in the preliminary budget so that uh, there was an opportunity uh, for the council and the administration, as much as we didn't like those pegs, uh, that we could have a full uh, airing of them uh, and uh, preliminary and executive budget hearings uh, to go through those um, and as a city, uh, council and mayor's office and agencies uh, collectively determine what the appropriate course of action is. If we don't know what the pegs are uh, until exec, uh, it makes it a lot harder for the council and other interested parties, advocates, providers, clients, um, to have a say in the matter. And so um, this is not just directed at this agency or these agencies. This is directed at uh, uh, the administration as a whole um, because uh, this council is not able to do its job. If we don't know, the mayor comes and tells us at the preliminary budget announcement that there's going to be $750 million of pegs, but guess what? We don't know what they are. And that was, you know, many weeks ago that that was presented. Um, so. Frankly, it just kind of seems like a delay tactic 
um, uh, because, uh, you know, it, 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 so, I mean, what's, what's going on here? Uh, what, do, do, do we not, do you not know what your pegs are going to be? You've already gotten the directive from OMB to do that. Do we not know what it's going to be? We have not completed the process of identifying which pegs work. Part of the place uh, that we're in is awaiting to determine what the impact of the state peg is going to be. Uh, but I think the fact that the peg announcement was made was made reflects the fluid dynamic nature of the economic and budget situation. But in terms of our agency, and I appreciate that you're making a general statement, not specifically to our agency, uh, we have a potential state cut of $125 million that we are uh, uh, fighting to prevent. Uh, de depending on the impact of that, uh, we then have to deal with a, a $50 million uh, cut. And so uh, we have a lot of, uh, a lot of work to do to prevent the $125 million cut from happening. Mm -hmm. And then depending on what happens uh, with that, we'll have to face the $50 million cut. Um, how was the percentage determined um, for it to be $50, 50 million uh, from these agencies? Because I, I you know, I, the, the agency that's gonna be testifying after you, ACS is looking at a 7% cut uh, in their CTL. Right. And uh, it, it, that seems obviously wildly disparate, um, and I don't understand why uh, the agency that's tasked with protecting vulnerable children has a 7% cut and other agencies have nowhere near that. Right. I mean, part of the challenge here is that Medicaid in our budget is ex is exempt. That's part of the process. And I think the other part of the process is that we have already, uh, had already imposed limited hiring in parts of our agency previously as part of other efficiencies that we were seeking. So I think for each agency, they're in different places. For our agency, our budget, as I testified a little bit earlier, is not discretionary funding, it's entitlement funding. And uh, we had been implementing uh, uh, staffing, uh, uh, we, we've been implementing controls and filling positions previously, and so I think from a conversation about what to, uh, what to impose for PEG, it took into account the fact that we had already been exercising position control. Okay, actually, that's, uh, I just wanted to follow up with one quick question here. I had heard that there's a, a hiring freeze for eligibility specialists in HRA, is that true? Uh, this is a citywide hiring freeze. Citywide hiring freeze, yes. and that applies then to HRA yep. housing uh, eligibility specialists. Okay. Um, okay, I'm going to turn it over to Councilmember Lander for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Commissioner, and your team. It's it's good to see you, and um, I know that that like me and like all of us, you remain distressed at our inability to make bigger progress on combating homelessness. But I appreciate the way you get up every day and keep working hard to make it happen. And um, kind of in light of Councilmember Kalos's questions, I know we have cited several shelters in our shared community and district in the in recent years, and that we will be citing some more there as well. And uh, that doesn't make anybody happy, but it is the thing we are obligated to do together, and I appreciate your team's work with my office and with our community to do it in the best of possible ways. Um, I have two questions. Um, one about placements into NYCHA, which is a perennial favorite of mine at these hearings, um, and one about safe haven. So on the NYCHA side, and almost every year I ask this question at the hearing, and I look at the numbers this year, and it looks to me like we're on path to place fewer people out of shelter into public housing than we did last year, and last year was fewer than the year before that, and I still don't understand it. Uh, to me, especially given the need to put more resources into NYCHA, the obvious fact that we should develop a program that provides some additional subsidy to take families who are in shelter, help them move into public housing, pay the costs to NYCHA of them having permanent housing, help NYCHA pay its bills, help more families get out of shelter, just seems like a no-brainer. It would not solve our homelessness crisis, but I still don't understand why we're not doing more of it. It just seems so short-sighted. Uh, and then second, on safe havens, 
Um, this may relate to the chair's issue of just like looking in the budget and having U of A's and understanding what's getting funded and not funded. I can't find in the budget how I would know uh, is there a growth in safe haven beds. I think there is, but I don't see it in the budget. So can you tell us what's going on there? I know a lot of work is going in there. Um, it is my perception that even though, as you rightly said, sometimes it takes a long time to build trust and get someone to move in, that the lack of safe haven beds is a real constraint on moving people in when that trust is built and they are ready. So what can you say about what the need is there to be able to meet it? Um, what's in the budget to, to do it better? Sure, Th and thank you for your kind words and for your recent very kind words uh, uh, concerning the work that we're doing. Um, let me talk about safe havens first. So uh, when we started, there were about 600 safe haven beds, and by safe havens, we have both safe havens and something also called stabilization beds. Some of you have been supportive. I know the chair has been in terms of uh, using church beds, which are available to us throughout the day, as opposed to you have to be out uh, at, during the day, so we can use those as stabilization beds. So we've gone from about 600 uh, to we've more than doubled that number, and the uh, budget will allow us to actually triple the number that we started with. We too want to make sure that we have as much safe haven resources or stabilization bed resources available as possible uh, to help bring people in. One of the things that has become clear to us and to our outreach teams is it's not simply having the bed, it's where it's located. It's sort of uh, uh, consistent with our turn of the tide approach to shelter, which is having an organizing principle for the provision of shelter makes a difference in terms of helping people get on their feet and be you know, near schools and jobs and healthcare and houses of worship. So with safe havens, uh, having them as close to possible where people are on the street uh, is, a, is, a, is a newer approach than simply having safe haven beds. Uh, I think we have the experience, and, I'm, and I know you and your staff have had the experience of somebody saying, hey, I'd come in, but only if it's right here. Uh, and so that's what this additional uh, funding is aimed at doing. Uh, I think, uh, as I said earlier, from a functional budgeting point of view, we can show you where it is, but apropos of what I said to the chair, we'll, we'll certainly finance staff to agency staff and OMB staff sit down and see what we can do to make sure that you have the tools to do what you uh, need to do. In terms of NYCHA, uh, you know, we move about 1,500 uh, people out of shelter into NYCHA apartments. There were some prior years where we got uh, different one-time allocations, uh, but our basic uh, number is, is to move 1,500 out. Uh, 1,500 in what period? In a, in a, in a uh, calendar year. 1,500 households, which then obviously become... 1,500 households. Households, right. That's our target for yeah. how many people will move out of shelter into public housing. Right. The total... How many vacancies are there a the year? The total turnover is about 3,300 uh, in NYCHA, so that's... And then on top of it, you have people in other groups uh, and plus the waiting list, so it's 1,500 out of about 3,300. And you're satisfied with that? Uh, you know, you asked me this question when I went from legal aid to become uh, a commissioner. You were really unsatisfied with it back then. No, I, I actually had a different, different take on what I was going to say, and I'll say it again. Um, I was there for 33 years, so, I'm a, so I must be an optimist by nature, right? And then I became the HRA commissioner, and now I'm a commissioner of both HRA and DHS, so I must continue to be an optimist by nature. So I'm optimistic that any housing resource we can get, we can make use of, uh, and that's one of the reasons why we created all these rental assistance programs, uh, and we reinstated the NYCHA priority. It's, it helps us get 109,000 people housed, uh, and every last apartment we can get and find, uh, we can put to use. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Lander. Uh, Councilmember Helen Rosenthal. Thank you so much, Chair. Great to see you, Commissioner. I just want to start my communications uh, staff is reminding me that um, last week in the Daily News, I was misquoted uh, completely about homelessness, and um, I did not say what they said. And instead, <laughs> what I meant to say, or what I did say, was that um, the ongoing levels of homelessness in New York City is tragic. Uh, I think your handling, if the Daily News is watching me now, uh, of the crisis has been 
spectacular. I think you lean in every day and you have a great staff who's working so hard. I certainly see that in my district. So I appreciate all the work that you and your agency is doing around uh, to address the homelessness crisis. I'm asking questions about three different areas. First, about domestic viol uh, shelters and how we're mm -hmm. uh, taking care of survivors of domestic violence. I have a few questions about the human service contracts. And lastly, just a little bit about um, follow-up from the uh, Jasmine Headley uh, situation and implicit bias. So first of all, I see here that um, Hang on. Last year, I think the DV, uh, you took in a certain number of DV cases. I think it was 800 individuals. Um, yeah, it's roughly 800, could be a little bit more, but between your shelters. And I'm wondering what the wait list is like, number one, and number two, um, I'm hearing from survivors and advocates that in order for survivors to process checking in, uh, it's that process is challenging and provides difficulties for them having to leave work and juggle so many different things, whether or not you guys could try to ease that and similarly whether or not um, the funding at the shelters provides uh, funds for child care. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for your comments. It means a lot to our staff. I appreciate uh, your comments. I know they're directed towards me, but I think we as an agency take them as all of us and our frontline staff who come to work every day trying to make a difference in people's lives. So I appreciate your, your comments. Um, there are different pieces. I think that Administrator Benia can do some of this, but let me just try to give a very top line first, which is one of the benefits of having the agencies integrated is that we have got HRA, domestic violence shelters, but we have DHS, which is there. So when you raise the question about a wait list, about 30% of the families in our DHS system, uh, the head of household has a history of domestic violence of some sort. Might not be a, a, at, at the level of the state statute uh, that entitles you to DV shelter, but we have between the two agencies a much broader reach than the number of beds we have in the domestic violence uh, system. And I think with the two administrators here, we're very much focused on, we're not two separate entities, we're very much trying to provide a, a, a range of different services that people want. Some people for not maybe having the beds, you you can catch people in different spaces. Right, and, so, and some people, and uh, you know, this is a, d domestic violence uh, shelter, it's a, it's a, you know, we respect people's choices. There may be someone who's a survivor who cannot remain in the community, but would prefer to, to not be in a domestic violence shelter. Perhaps they would prefer to be in a DHS shelter. Having said that, we made a commitment to add more beds, and I think we have some good information uh, to, to report to you. Great, If and then I'm gonna go on to my next questions. Thank you. Uh, so at the beginning of the administration, we made a commitment to add 300 new emergency beds. We have fulfilled that commitment, but to follow up on what the commissioner has said, part of the work that we do collaboratively with DHS, it's not just that we have staff add PATH, uh, we also make sure that this, the clients that are not going into the DV, DV shelter are getting additional services while they're in DHS. I also want to point out that DV services, f because of state law, is limited to intimate partner violence. So while the commissioner is right that 30% of clients may have a history of DV in the larger sense of the word, for DV shelters, it's it's limited to DV, to uh, intimate partner violence. When you say limited, you mean the funding that they provide. They don't prevent you. If there were all the money in the world, right? So you're talking about a funding prevention. It, it is a funding prevention. Okay. It is Just set by the clear. rate, absolutely. Um, if there were additional funding, we would look at but the model, even the way services are provided, for example, by the, the way state. case management is provided is to, yes, by, uh, it, it is sanctioned by the state. 
Uh, it is to address intimate partner violence. I, I got you. I would just add, it's, 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 sure a, it's a state statute, actually. And if I more minutes, a little bit more. Thank you. It, it's a state statute, as Mr. Benia says, that defines who's entitled to domestic violence shelter. It's one of the reasons why in our Department of Homeless Services shelter system, we have a broader conception so that we can have a, a safety net that we think is commensurate with what uh, the, the need is. Okay, so that's disturbing. I, I appreciate you. Sorry, let me clarify. I understood what you meant. <laughs> <laughs> the state uh, statute, statute it, it's disturbingly uh, too uh, onerous for what most people probably need. So they're requiring people to have a certain level of domestic violence in their life, and then we can fund a program for them. That's disturbing. And it, I think it relates to a lot of the conversations that we've had about the DHS census. If you look at the fact that 30% of the people in our shelter system have, uh, as, as Mr. Urbini said, some involvement with domestic violence, if not meeting the state statutory standard for imminent danger uh, that's imminent partner uh, violence, uh, that's one of our drivers. 11% of the people coming into shelter had an eviction. That's because of, I think, all of the great work we've all done to drive down that number, but 30% are coming in because of, uh, uh, with, a, with a history and of domestic then, violence. Uh, not right now, but if you could get back to me about making the process easier for, for DV survivors, I'd yeah. appreciate that. Interested, as always, in sitting down or, or having a phone conversation about what exactly you're seeing so that we can try and make improvements. Are you getting funding, again, from the state uh, to address the issue of um, um, employee overtime and uh, the fact that if you're high management, you're not paid overtime? So in your contracts, um, the providers are now forced to comply with exempting top managers from getting overtime, and yet their salaries have not increased. Yeah, there hasn't been a, a state rate change. There's not been a, ra a rate change. Right, so have the providers approached you about this problem? We're hearing about it a lot. So if we're talking about DV providers, we've actually, uh, I'm very proud to say that we have worked aggressively to make sure that we have an open line of communication with providers on a number of issues. Uh, happy to sit down with you to see what, what we're missing, uh, but we have not heard this from providers. It's not just DV, it's um, any human service contract, no. And the Legal Aid Society is asking for additional funds for the work that they do in their contracts. Their caseload is high, they're doing a lot of work and they feel they're not being paid at the level commensurate with the work that they're doing. Is that something you're exploring? Which, uh, which contracts in particular? Any contract you have with a legal aid provider. Um. I mean, in terms of the immigration legal services funding, we've made a pretty significant increase from about $3 million to uh, more than $30 million for the field. Right, but I would always ask, is that because of increased demand for services or is the actually, contract richer? Yeah, I, so I was gonna uh, actually come to, come to that as well. And then in terms of a tenant representation, we went from six million to 166 million full implementation. Right. Uh, we always want to hear from our providers about what, what their challenges are. I know that there was testimony just last week uh, from the Legal Aid Society about their request for additional immigration funding. We've just, you know, now heard the testimony. We're going to look at it. I know that there is other testimony about their criminal uh, defense funding. Uh, Okay. Uh, I'm just going to say. Let's move uh, on. I, it's the same question as we discussed last year mm -hmm. um, at this exact same time that the legal service providers are in the same shoes as the human service providers and they're just routinely being underfunded. Lastly, um, I noted in the budget the um, implicit bias uh, mitigation is in the budget for. Uh, 1.3 million growing to 2.9 million. Um, is there any jeopardy those that money will be uh, pegged away? 
I mean, I think I committed to do those things under oath to address a very serious situation. Uh, and just, you know, for the record, for body-worn cameras, it's 300,000 is in our fiscal year 19 budget. It's a one-time expenditure. And then uh, in order to maintain the operation of body-worn cameras for our peace officers, it's $54,000 that's, that's in the, in the um, preliminary budget plan. For implicit bias, it's a million dollars in our FY19 budget, 2.2 mm -hmm. in our FY20 budget, and then a million in the out years. Uh, I come back to what I was saying, I think, in response to uh, Councilmember Jonai's question and the chair's question. We're very concerned about the $125 million cut that is uh, proposed at the state level. That's a 10% reduction in funding for TANF funds that affects uh, uh, benefits that we pay out, affects shelter payments that okay. we have. So and everything's so we're very at risk. Concern, we're very concerned, uh, and that's why we appreciate the council pushing back hard on that, because that uh, would be on top of a $50 okay. million dollar peg that we would that we'll be implementing. Okay. okay, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Council Member Rosenthal. Uh, <laughs> council Member Traeger. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Welcome, Commissioner. How are you? Um, on uh, November 17, uh, 2018, uh, my legislation to provide families with, uh, with free diapers, um, intro 03802018 was enacted. Uh, it is now local law 182 of 2018, and it was supposed to go into effect last week, but the rollout instead has been delayed, and there has been little communication with providers and parents. Uh, as you know, many families in our city struggle to afford diapers, and this is unacceptable because diapers are a basic need. Local Law 182 of 2018 would require the city to make available a supply of diapers and baby wipes sufficient to meet the needs of, of residents and recipients of subsidized child care centers, family justice centers, Department of Education life programs, and city-operated domestic violence shelters and homeless shelters. How are ACS, DHS, DSSS, DSS planning on implementing Local Law 182? Uh, first of all, I thought it was an important piece of legislation. Uh, we uh, have systems in place to do this, but it, I think the intent of the law is to make sure that it, nobody ever changes those systems, and I appreciate it from a client perspective that it, it was an important reform that you enacted. Uh, speaking of our DV shelters and our DHS shelters, uh, we have, uh, have had the funding in place to make sure that diapers are available. Uh, we're focused on, I think, exactly what you're asking me about, about making sure that we've got communication in place so that people know that, that services that I might say to you, yeah, we have it and it's available, just want to be overly cautious to make sure that people are aware of it and we're, we're gonna be putting in place a rollout. We do use the New York uh, State uh, uh, Industries uh, for the Disabled as our supplier of uh, diapers. Under uh, the state finance law, they have a right of first refusal on many goods and so have been using them as a supplier. We think it works well, but we're obviously gonna take a you know, the look that you would like us to take to make sure that the implementation is working. Uh, as I see it, I think our, our focus needs to be in moving forward is making sure the communication is right for the families so that they know that which we've been funding is available to them. But are you aware of any family that has requested uh, diapers for their children uh, have been denied? Uh, not aware of that. If you have information, I'd be, I'd be unhappy to know about it, but let me know about it so that we can address what, what went wrong. Yeah, what I'm hearing directly is that there's v virtually no communication going on with folks about about the enactment of this law. Uh, uh, and so it's maybe not an intentional denial, but there are services being denied one way or, or the other because folks just don't know about it. Okay, but as I said, one of the things that I think you're right on is we will make sure that we are have We'll make sure that there aren't families that aren't aware of that this is available to them. It's something that's been available to them. The law gives an opportunity to reinforce that it must be provided to people because that's what's required by the law. To follow up, uh, DSS says DV shelters through a state set per diem are, are funded to provide diapers and wipe uh, supplies in DV shelters and now must develop a method of providing written notice to parents in the designated city languages about the availability of diapers and baby wipes. 
how much is the state per diem for shelter providers, and is there a dedicated funding line for divers? Um, let me get, I don't know um, the exact amount of money. Uh, our DV system uh, is regulated very closely by the state, and the rates are set by the state. So uh, I'll follow up with you and your staff, or we'll follow up with you and your staff to answer that question. I would appreciate that. I just have some couple of follow-up questions sure. on that matter. Uh, what is the pantry budget for emergency shelters? Is there a separate line for emergency diapers and wipes? How much is that? And do you believe that there's a difference of quantity between the broad requirement for diapers and wipes provided for under Local Law 182 and the allocation of emergency diapers and wipes provided for under the pantry budget? You know, we, we don't think that there's a, a problem presented by the requirements of local law and what we've been funding, but again, I want to come back to your appropriate initial question to me was, let's make sure that people know about it, and there's, that will be a, a further check to make sure that, in fact, there's not a gap between what we're funding and what people need. Right, because I, I plan to visit to ensure that the law is being enacted and followed, Commissioner, I, and I knew you would, and and so I just this is very very important uh, uh, to my office and to folks that, that we care about. Um, and lastly, uh, Chair, thank you so much. Just a very last question. Um, I heard be earlier before uh, Councilman, Councilman Lander asked about uh, the number of NYCHA units that might be available for families uh, in desperate need of housing, and I certainly you know I appreciate that. Uh, now, my question is. You know, I represent quite a bit of NYCHA in my district. Um, to my knowledge, uh, I don't, I'm not aware of uh, certain types of supportive services for residents um, that we see in terms of developments that the city sometimes builds with, with HPD and some service provider. Um, there have been instances in my district where um, folks who came out of the shelter system were, were given a NYCHA apartment, and one instance, almost a week later, there was a shooting involved with that person because that person had an, was battling an addiction, and that addiction and the troubles that come with addiction traveled with that person to that apartment, and the shooting occurred right during graduation time, which traumatized many of children in my community and district and who are going to celebrate it was supposed to be a happy occasion. They had to see a crime scene tape um, in their building and, and, uh, sur uh, on Surf Avenue. My question is, what type of screening is in place to ensure that residents are being provided the services they need and not just simply being handed a key and saying, here's an apartment, but here is the support that you might need traveling with you to that apartment? Um, because these are human beings. They're not, you know, just simply, you know, it's, they're not robots. They're human beings. They might have needs. Um, I understand that the goal was to reduce the folks in the shelter system, and I, and I appreciate that. But we also have to be mindful that some folks might need additional support. And um, so I, I just would like to hear, to hear, hear, hear your thoughts on that. Um, I, thank you, and I, I, what a tragedy you're describing. I really, I, I really appreciate um, how tragic that must have been. I also appreciate your focus on our clients as human beings, which, frankly, I, I, I wish I didn't have to say I appreciate it, but I do appreciate it because sometimes that's lost in a lot of the discussion about the services we provide and the clients we serve, and so I, I commend you for, for that. Our home-based program is our aftercare program. Uh, that's available for all families with children, uh, in particular, that move out of our shelters. And our home-based providers proactively reach out. It's not one of those things where, hey, you can contact this. This is a part of their mission to follow up with families and make sure that issues that might arise in anyone's family uh, is, uh, can be addressed. So we take that program very seriously. We increased funding for it. Uh, during this administration in order to make sure that there's both prevention of homeless services uh, provided through home-based uh, home offices, but also aftercare as well, and the kind of support that's sometimes needed for somebody that's gone through a difficult period of time and needs some additional help. Uh, let me add to that, because when uh, individuals and families are in shelter, we're doing a comprehensive assessment 
and making referrals to community services. So uh, while they're in shelter, they have the ability to make those connections. So that's one support that we also want to make. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilor Traeger. Councilor Gibson. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, Commissioner. You? Thank you and your team for being here. I appreciate all of the hard work you do, and certainly I know that the challenges sometimes seem insurmountable. Um, I am frustrated by some of the challenges that we continue to face when you talk about housing homeless families. Um, you alluded to the housing hearing on Friday, um, of which I co-chaired with Chair Robert Cornegie, and one of the things that I recognize is in the Housing New York plan to preserve and create 300,000 new units of housing through FY 2026. The city is on target and actually has exceeded so far targets of housing preservation, which is great. Um, new construction, we have not met our target, specifically in the category of New Yorkers that are at extremely low income. And so I guess my question is, there is a very ambitious campaign, uh, Housing Our Future, where the advocates and many housing campaign folks want the mayor to commit 30,000 units of housing set aside for formerly homeless families, homeless New Yorkers. And I guess I wanted to understand the partnership that DSS has with HPD as they create all of this new housing. So we're building new housing for every different income level, middle, high income, low income, but extremely low income, we are falling far short. The majority of the families that are living in our shelters are in that particular category. So are there things that we could be doing more of where we can really get through the challenges of addressing the housing needs for the New Yorkers that are at the lowest end of the spectrum? So first of all, thank you for uh, all the important work you're doing in your district and citywide, you've been uh, a, a supporter of what we're trying to do, and I appreciate that. Sometimes I know uh, it's challenging. Uh, you know, from our agency's point of view, we've got a, a very um, complex and broad mission. And I know that HPD is very focused on what they've been charged to do uh, in the city. Uh, for us, they've been helpful, uh, for example, helping us gain access to 421A units. Uh, we've gotten about 600 families uh, uh, moved out of our shelters, 600 households moved out of our shelters into those units. That was something that didn't exist before. That's helping us. Uh, HPD has been helpful to us in our efforts to uh, convert clusters. So. You know, we have a large mission, they have a large mission, and they've been helpful to us. I'm cognizant that there are larger issues involved here, and that you and I see Councilmember Salamanca here as well are very much focused on, on some of these larger uh, questions. Uh, and I know that, that, there was, that there's going to be dialogue following the hearing on Friday uh, with HPD about uh, their plans and, and, and what your concerns are. Right. So they're on target to achieve the numbers by FY 2026. But the reality is, is we need more housing um, to be expedited before 2026. So the frustration that many of us feel, particularly in the Bronx, when you look at all of the sightings of new shelters, they are all saturated in the same communities of color. And no disrespect to any of my colleagues, but certainly I have every right as a representative of District 16 who has housed not only my homeless families, but many other homeless families that are sometimes not even housed in their own Ori original community. And so when you talk about new construction, we have been working extremely hard with developers to understand the need for set-asides for homeless families coming directly from the shelter, raising the threshold from minimum of 10 percent to as high as 30 percent. Councilmember Salamanca will talk about that. But even with all the things that we're still doing, it's honestly not enough. Um, I wanted to ask a question about cluster, which you brought up, sure. because most of the cluster housing, again, saturated in the Bronx, and the city is on the cusp of a new agreement to acquire 17 buildings, 13 of which are in the Bronx. 
valued at $174 million. Now that's $30 million over the city's appraised value. And my concern is we talked about eminent domain when you made the announcement in the Bronx with potentially taking over ownership of these distressed buildings and allowing not-for-profits to run them. But my concern is the $174 million that we're going to spend to acquire these buildings from landlords have numerous violations. We know renovations will need to be done. And on Friday, I asked HPD, does that $174 million include any money to renovate these units? And I was told no. So my concern is, why are we paying $30 million more than the appraised value? And what types of estimates can we get that will determine these buildings and the real work that's going to be required to acquire them over you know, the next few months as we discuss this. Um, th thank you for your uh, focus on this issue. I know that for both you and me, it's been important to try to capture the cluster units uh, and keep them in the affordable housing stock. This Giuliani era program uh, was a program that took units off the market uh, and uh, didn't serve the clients well, didn't serve the community well, and we're, with this transaction, we will have uh, gotten, we would have ended the use of 70% of the units. Uh, we have 30% still to go, and we announced, you're, you're, I appreciate you you're referencing this, we announced last December that we were gonna use a new tool, eminent domain, to try to convert as many units as possible uh, to uh, affordable permanent housing. In these 17 buildings, there are uh, uh, permanent tenants as mm -hmm. well as- Right, uh, they need help. Mm -hmm. They need help. There's 468 units were involved in the cluster program, uh, and um, uh, about 261 units uh, are uh, were permanent tenants. So let me. I, I don't. I don't mean to to bog us down this, but I think it's important to understand what what the eminent domain proceedings are and what the valuation of the properties would be in an eminent domain proceeding. So in an eminent domain proceeding, it takes three years uh, in order to gain uh, city ownership of the building, uh, buildings. And a court determines uh, what the value, the highest and best use of the, of the property would be. And then the landlord's entitled to interest for the amount of time that the case was in court. So let's, using imaginary th money, the landlord, uh, the court determines that the property is worth $100. That means at the end of that three year period, whatever interest the landlord could have gotten by using that money, the court awards that to the landlord. In addition, the court awards attorney's fees to the landlord. Uh, and the owner is always gonna say the building is worth a lot more than what a city appraiser might say. So you have a litigation risk of paying a lot more money than what an appraiser says and then you have a really human issue, which is there's 1,200 children and adults in these 17 buildings now that will be in limbo for three years, whether or not they're gonna get to keep their apartments. And by resolving this out of court, uh, taking into account the litigation risks and what the costs would be from an eminent domain proceeding, uh, that's why this is a, a fair price to pay. In addition, uh, it's important to, and I think HPD might have said this, but I want to say it again for the record here. F the median price of a uh, rent stabilized unit in the Bronx without renovation costs is $220,000. The median uh, uh, price for a rent stabilized unit in Brooklyn is $280,000. Uh, we're, the city's financing uh, a, a, a cost of $237,000. You're right to point out that that doesn't include the cost of upgrading, but there's one difference between what the median price is in the open market and this situation, which is why it was so important to be able to capture these units back. If we simply took, with, with that $220,000 median price for a rent-stabilized apartment in the Bronx, the $280,000 uh, median price for a rent-stabilized unit in Brooklyn, those assume tenants in those units. 
And so the landlord is buy somebody who's buying a building for those per unit costs, subject to having someone in the unit with a rent stabilized lease. Here, if we simply ended the cluster program and took the people out of the units, the landlord would be able to sell in the open market essentially 468 vacant units, which a new purchaser or the existing landlord could take out of rent stabilization through all of the gaps that you and I both know in state law through major capital improvements and everything. So by fin financing this transaction, we preserve the permanent affordability of these units in a very different situation than someone in the marketplace buying the units at these median prices, even though our payment for the unit is about the same. Uh, and as you say, we have the additional cost of renovations, but it's apples to oranges a little bit because the landlord could have sold this building with 460 vacant units, and therefore the purchase price would have been affected by selling a building that's rent stabilized with 468 vacant units. The appraiser was, done, was conducted by uh, a law department appraiser that mm -hmm. is very familiar with how to evaluate the, uh, the uh, risks and challenges of an eminent domain proceeding, taking into account all the factors that I just described. So that's how you get to the, get to the purchase price. It's a purchase price that takes into account eminent domain and risks of litigation versus leaving people in limbo for three years, and it takes into account what the median rate is for rent stabilized units that's tenanted, let alone here where they wouldn't, 468 of them would be vacant. Okay, I thank you for the explanation and appreciate you, Chair. I guess my final thing to say just to wrap it up is, um, during this timeline of working with these 17 landlords, it would be my expectation that the city would stay on top of the landlords, the social service providers of these cluster families, and essentially, I know renovations are necessary, but there are hundreds of violations today in these buildings that have not been addressed, that need to be addressed, and should be addressed before we give landlords more money to purchase these buildings. And so over the next few months, I'm going to be working with you because I imagine many of these 13 buildings I represent, I know I do, um, but I do want to make sure that there is some immediate attention given to the cluster families and the other traditional tenants that have been living in some really challenging conditions, knowing that there will be, you know, light at the end of the tunnel, but we're paying $174 million, and these buildings have tons of violations that need to be addressed. So if you can, that would be really great to stay on top of the social service providers who you know that who they are, as well as the landlords and making sure those violations are addressed ASAP. Right, the, the, the not-for-profits that will be the owners of these buildings and the social services providers are very reputable uh, housing groups selected by HPD, uh, Banana Kelly, Fifth Avenue Committee in Brooklyn, uh, Manny, uh, 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 Ford and Bedford. I mean, these are groups with deep roots that have a strong track record of providing uh, tenants with the kind of services and support and managing buildings in an appropriate way that tenants are entitled to have after the end of this 19-year-old program mm -hmm. that, uh, that we're already made progress in eliminating 70% of it with this transaction. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councilmember Gibson. Councilmember Salamanca. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, uh, Commissioner. Yeah. Uh, first, I want to I wanna thank you and your team. Uh, this last year and a half, our working relationship has been a great one. Um, I know that in, in the past, I've, I have really have been vocal about the amount of homeless shelters that I have in my council district. I still feel that I am overburdened compared to some of my other colleagues. Uh, however, we've been able to work together, identifying the appropriate places where these uh, shelters that are needed, where we can place them, and, and actually working with other types of populations. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm, um, I'm thankful for your work and your team's work to, you know, working with me and getting this addressed. Um, Commissioner, I want to I wanna start first with HRA. Um, I have, I believe, the largest HRA uh, office in the borough of the Bronx. Um, on Barreto Street in the banknote building, mm -hmm. which is directly across the street from a safe haven shelter, which Bronx Works uh, operates. Uh, and and that, that, that particular block is very challenging. It's a very small block. The amount of individuals um, or, or people coming to seek services, it's in a very high volume, uh, at mm -hmm. least uh, uh, over 2,000 individuals a day, if, if I'm not mistaken. Is there a HRA liaison 
in that building that should be working with the local community board to address some of the flow issues that's occurring? Uh, there are people in that building who work with uh, people on uh, Administrator Bonilla's staff uh, that we want to make sure we're being responsive to you. Uh, I think you're raising an important issue about just volume uh, and we'll commit to, to work with you and the community board to try to understand what the, what the issues are. Uh, and you and I have worked through a lot of challenges in our time working together. This is one that we will yeah. commit ourselves to, to working on too. Just, just want to point out, so you know, community boards have, um, have monthly district service cabinet meetings. Okay. It's in the city charter. Every city agency must, per the city charter, mm -hmm. must send a rep uh, to, that, to that meeting. I can connect you with that local board, but I know that there has not been a rep from HRA at these meetings. And I just encourage you to please help identify who's the right person that should be sitting in these meetings. We'll work with you on that. And okay. I, again, I appreciate your partnership on so many issues and your opening comments. Uh, in many respects, it's a model partnership that we have, and I appreciate it. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I, I want to make sure I'm saying this right. The FIPS, the FIPS vouchers, these are the vouchers yep. that yep. families get when they're coming out of yep. the shelters. I'm getting major concerns. Well, I'm, major, I'm getting major uh, calls from constituents where their, their, their vouchers, which are, what is it, averaging $1,200? For a single adult, it's a little bit over $1,200. For a family of three or four, it's about a little over $1,500. But landlords are refusing to take them, um, and we all know that. And their concern is that there's an expiration date to these vouchers. How are you working on addressing this issue? Um, because, yes, they have a voucher, they can't find an apartment. I mean, so how do we really address getting these families with vouchers into permanent housing? I think there's three, th three things that I want to highlight for you. Uh, first, uh, the, we've been able to, through rental assistance and other things, we've been able to get 109,000 people connected to housing. So uh, I think the concerns that individual clients have are are things that we take very seriously, but we're also looking at the overall impact. The uh, voucher time limit that was originally set, uh, we have aligned the city FAPS program, city FAPS program with the state FAPS program. The state FAPS program has the ability uh, with good cause to extend beyond five years. The city programs are lined up in exactly the same way. Uh, we will, uh, I, I, your question causes me to say, you know what, we better redouble our efforts to make sure that's known to landlords. Uh, and uh, maybe we could use as a test case some landlords that maybe have come to your attention and see if we can engage uh, more effectively with them so that they know that we have aligned the city program with the state program. Number two, uh, we have a source of income discrimination unit uh, in which we brought two significant cases against landlords, uh, groups of landlords who are waiting for a decision. We think that will have a beneficial effect uh, on uh, the situation in which clients feel that landlords are not taking uh, the voucher. Uh, and related to that, we have a hotline and we can make sure your office has it uh, where we do get inquiries and our staff intervene and frequently are able to reverse a situation where the landlord says, hey, I don't want to take you because you have a voucher. Yeah. Okay. Um, Commissioner, um, I just have three other questions on DHS. Uh, Mr. Chair, my time's going to expire. I mean, can I just get one minute? It's, it's going to be quick. Qu these, are, these are quick questions. Um, I have a bill, 915, which would require um, the Department of Homeless Services to report to every council member and community boards um, a list or the number of shelters, clusters, executive, a, a cluster um, units, um, supportive housing um, um, units, um, requiring DHS to provide that information on a quarterly basis to community boards and council dish and, 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 um, and the council members and to the council. You know, and the purpose of this bill really is to point out overburdened communities such as mine, Vanessa, and other, uh, other members in the Bronx. And to also point out some, of my, some, some communities that are not doing their fair share because it really exists. I know that there are more communities that have families in the homeless shelters and they don't have those same amount of beds in their districts. And I also hear that there's word in the street that some of my colleagues are trying to put some of their homeless shelters into my district, you know? But so, um, Commissioner, my, my question here is, are you supportive of, of this reporting mechanism, which I think will serve, uh, it, it will help you in, in really 
bringing in shelters to those communities that are not doing their fair share? Right. We certainly, uh, and we've had conversations about it, support the in intent of it. I think there are some issues we've got about uh, uh, some unintended consequences, like with so many things that we'd be happy to sit down with you and try to negotiate it through. But I think both your comment, uh, and we're not going to let that happen, what you're alluding to, um, your comment and Councilmember Gibson's comment really highlights the reason why we're moving forward the turn of the tide plan, which is to make sure that we're able to provide opportunities to be housed in the borough and as close as possible to the community that people lived in so we can eliminate the situation in which someone would say, oh, it's better to have people from Queens, for example, be in the Bronx. Uh, and we want to continue to work with you and Councilmember Gibson and other members as well because that approach is going to end what's going on for 40 years, which is no organizing principle of shelter, families with children placed all over the place, and then certain communities having more shelters than, uh, than is, is appropriate given what the need is. Yeah. And then finally, Commissioner, I have a, 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 a bill which requires any, any developers that's getting city subsidies, no, no matter the amount that they're getting for uh, developing affordable housing, that 15% of those units be set aside for uh, homeless families that are ready for independent living. I understand that the administration is not in favor of this, so I'm not gonna put you on a spot to ask you if you um, like this bill or not. My question here is, in 2018, how many families uh, did DHS place in permanent housing of, uh, of new development? Uh, I'm not sure I've got a good way to do that number. I think the number that HPD testified on Friday was about 2,000, including the 600 and 421A units. Okay. But I want to make sure that I'm not uh, over, I, I want to make sure I'm, I'm comparing apples to oranges, but uh, I think that the data they presented is the data that I'm familiar with. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Councilor Salma. Uh, Commissioner, I think you meant apples to apples, not apples. You want to make sure you're comparing apples to apples, not not, you Thank you sure very much. I've been, I've been at it for two and a half hours, so I apologize if I got my metaphor mixed. Um, okay, we have a second round of questions. Council members, there will be three minutes. We're going to try to keep people um, as close to the clock as possible because we do have, um, I have some additional questions around um, some of the budget-related matters. So, um, Council Member Grudenchik. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I said good morning. I will say good afternoon. Um, fair fares. Be, I'd be lying if I didn't say I was disappointed about the rollout um, this past January. And very quickly, um, can you tell me today how many people are enrolled? We, we had figured a, a possible eligibility of around 800,000 New Yorkers, and I'm told by Council Finance the last number we got was about 6,000. So can you update that today? Um, I, I'll be happy to update you on the, on the number, uh, but I wanted to go back to the premise of what your question was. Uh, the uptake of the program, I don't think was ever projected to be 800,000. Well, I'm I think el that, eligible, I understand. Yeah, but I think that that's actually an important point here. Uh, well, there's a big difference between 6,000 and 800,000. Right, but I think we proceeded with the implementation of this program in a way in which we could be certain that it would work, and I, and I think as our testimony reflects, uh, one of the reasons why uh, the program was originally determined to be at HRA was because we had experience in determining who in our population might be eligible. I appreciate that. Uh, no, if I could just finish, though. And so we very consciously and transparently said, look, the rollout of this is going to be first to a, to a targeted group of uh, HRA clients who have transportation costs relating to employment and that we were gonna build a system that would do what other cities didn't do. Other, the first couple of months of this has been you have to go pick up a card somewhere. Starting next month, you're going to be able to go online, register for the program, and have your card mailed so you don't have to go pick it up. It's one of the reasons why in Seattle, three years in, they've had a 20% take up of the program because we have taken a different approach. We wanna have this program operate the way we're moving all of our benefits programs. I've testified a lot about SNAP, creating an online approach, and we're moving, we're doing that as well in cash. So fair fares in implementing it, we wanted it to be a system in which you didn't have to come in someplace 
and we agreed that we would start with known populations of eligibles. So cash assistance uh, recipients who are employed with, with transportation costs, SNAP recipients employed with transportation costs. We're moving to the next group of known people, people within NYCHA, people within CUNY veterans that, have, that are below 100% of poverty. And then we're moving to have a system in which anybody can apply through a portal. I think you would agree that we should build the right technology. There's, there's to no make question this work. we want to do this correctly. Um, I am concerned, though, that our number and your number seems to be fairly wide apart. The last question, because I don't have much time, we had budgeted the city, uh, we agreed uh, $106 million, and we are now almost halfway between uh, the, the first of the year and the end of the fiscal year. And do you have an estimate on how much money we'll actually spend and how much will not be spent, more importantly? I, I think the, the commitment was to budget that amount of money and, and amounts that would, were not expended would be able to be used in the following year. I think we're going to have to wait until we do the rollout next month to have a sense of what the expenditures would be uh, uh, with respect to being able to register online and being able to get your card mailed to you. So the answer is you can't give me an answer? Is that what you're telling me? No, I think you're talking about, you're talking about we created a brand new benefits program. I, I understand that. And, and if I could finish, okay. we had always said the real impact will be able to be felt when you can deliver something to somebody where they don't have to go someplace else to get it. And they, all they have to do is go online and get it mailed to them. I then we'll have a better that. sense of what the uptake is okay. going to really I appreciate it. I look forward to getting an updated answer at the executive budget hearing. Uh, Thank that you, would, Commissioner. That will be a good time because okay. we'll know more then. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Grudendrick. Uh, Commissioner, I just had a follow-up about that. So uh, in effect right now, um, since uh, the only people that are currently uh, uh, being communicated with or being invited to enroll are those on cash assistance that are working and those that are on SNAP benefits and working. It, um, it's cash assistance and we began some SNAP recently. Uh, the plan always was to expand to SNAP in April. So um, in effect, uh, only those that are working uh, have access to fair fares. And so there's like a work requirement um, no, for fair fares if you want to, if you want, Fair fares now, you, there's a work requirement. No, there's a concern about the impact on public benefits by providing uh, an additional cash payment. Uh, we need to work through that to expand eligibility beyond HRA clients who are working. Okay. What's the solution there? I think the solution is to uh, let us roll out the program the way we've announced that it would be rolled out, which is next month people will be able to register online. Then we're moving to CUNY and NYCHA and uh, VETS in the fall. We just did a joint announcement with this, uh, uh, with the council. And then uh, in January, we'll have the ability of uh, the entire population to be able to apply. Will there be By a work requirement for if, if people, if the population that are veterans, NYCHA and uh, CUNY? We're, we're hopeful that we'll be able to work out the uh, public assistance impact uh, relating to that. Right, if you don't want someone to is get a benefit. A, is, it, is, is fair fares seen as a cash benefit? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, okay. Um, so, and, and that's, and that's uh, can you share with us exactly how that will be worked out then? Um, I think it would be best to let us work this through with the state. Okay. Um, okay, but in effect right now you have to be working in order to receive fair fares. For a sea change program that we've just been implementing for a really short period of time, we're phasing it in as we announced. Uh, I think you'd be wrong to conclude from this hearing that we're imposing a working crime requirement. What we are doing is in a very careful way rolling out a major program that's never been tested before in New York City and has had challenges in other cities in terms of the take up. Okay, uh, Councilmember Adams. Thanks. Thank you again, Mr. Chair. Uh, first of all, a shout out to our former uh, uh, council member, Annabelle Palmer. Um, <laughs> Commissioner, I, I, I really uh, want to follow up on something. This is just for my own personal edification. Um, I've been following the CBS story uh, on the SOTA program, um, the um, special one-time assistance program, and I would really like an update 
uh, on what is happening to those families that were placed in deplorable living con uh, conditions uh, in homes outside of state, outside of New York. Uh, in particular, uh, East Orange, New Jersey, a landlord was paid $40,000 uh, for a family to be placed in deplorable living conditions. And it, that story has just been so disturbing to me. Um, I really would like to know, uh, number one, why were these homes not properly inspected or vetted um, to realize these horrible conditions? We're talking vermin, mold, no heat, broken fixtures uh, where babies uh, were placed. And where does the money, where does the funding come from outside of, the, you know, within the budget? Which pot does that $40,000 for this horrible slumlord to be paid uh, to place families or this particular family or families? Uh, so I guess I've just got a number of questions, but I really would like an update sure. on, you know, on what's happening right now. I understand that DHS has not been in court with that particular landlord at all. I understand that. Uh, but please give us an update on how this happened. Sure. Uh, let me give you the context of the program overall and then what we're doing to address the kinds of issues that you're raising. And again, as always, uh, you know, you and I have worked together on many issues and I appreciate the spirit in which you're asking uh, that question. So uh, clients in our shelter system uh, come to us with many different kinds of uh, opportunities and challenges taking advantage of those opportunities. Uh, we have clients who are working and have uh, income sources that would enable them to pay the rent but need a sort of a helping hand to, to get started. And they're not gonna be eligible for any of our public assistance-based rental assistance programs. There isn't enough Section 8 out there for them. And so we created a program in September of 2017 to enable clients who have a source of income, have the ability to pay rent, are employed, uh, have, uh, uh, sources of other sources of income uh, or we're going to be obtaining employment to enable them to pay rent and you know our clients are uh, like many New Yorkers they want the ability to choose where they're gonna live uh, since September 2017 about 3,500 uh, households have participated in this program about 70 have returned to the shelter system in that period of time. Uh, more than a third of the families have relocated to apartments in New York City, and uh, about 10% in uh, New York State, and the rest out of the, uh, out of the city. Uh, uh, but this is a program that sort of has its roots in something that Ed Koch uh, developed in the 1980s called Project Reconnect. I think, as you may remember, I was a critic of many things that Ed Koch did. This is actually something I didn't criticize him about because the ability to give a family a helping hand to relocate, uh, uh, I think, is part of what we're there to do, to meet clients where they are and when they make a choice that they want to relocate to see what we can do to support them to do so, of course, there's a right to travel uh, established by the Supreme Court that gives people the right to travel. Uh, when we stood up this program, we gave the ability of families to move in with a promise to fix. Uh, family really wanted to move, they moved in with a promise to fix if there were issues that arose. Uh, that resulted in a situation in which both families in the city was taken, were taken advantage of by one or more unscrupulous people uh, in northern New Jersey. Uh, we have refer referred the matter to law enforcement uh, and we're assisting in uh, the follow-up there. Uh, the fact that the particular individual or individuals are in court, that's gonna take its course, but we're uh, providing the assistance that we do for an appropriate investigation of, of these individuals. Uh, we also changed the program to be aligned with our regular rental assistance programs. When we streamlined all of our rental assistance programs last October, 
we took a look at uh, what the processes were for reviewing all apartments, whether they were through the old LINK program or SEPS or the old FEPS program uh, or uh, SODA. And we created a, uh, a, a more intensive review process for apartments before people could move into them in New York City and in the metropolitan area if someone was going to move out through the SOTA program. And part of the streamlining was to align the city programs with the old state FEPS program. Some of you know that program came out of the Jiggets lawsuit. FEPS uh, was, was the name the state had and we wanted to have our inspection processes be aligned with the state processes and we added to the state processes. And so SOTA was improved by adding this additional apartment review uh, in the uh, in the, the surrounding counties, surround, uh, metropolitan area, and we eliminated the ability to uh, move in with a promise to fix. Uh, we also uh, took steps to uh, prevent someone from claiming that they were the owner of property when they weren't the owner of, of property. So we think the changes that we've put in place are really aimed at preventing the type of conduct that took advantage of the families and, and took advantage of the city. And as I said, we're working with law enforcement and providing support to, to address the problem of the particular individuals. And then as to the families that have been reported, and I appreciate the reporting that CBS has done on this, uh, that revealed this, that in terms of those families, we've reached out to them, uh, and each one of them has a different need in terms of connecting them to other uh, housing alternatives. All right, I guess my, my final statement on this would be in, in watching the continuance of the reporting, it's been very disheartening for me to constantly hear the families saying that there really has been no help uh, at, this, at this stage in the process from DHS. So to hear you state that DHS has been helping these families is a little bit um, contrasting to what the families are saying in these reports. Uh, it, it is extremely disturbing and has been disturbing to watch th that series, that particular series. And quite frankly, I was startled uh, by that, uh, to see little children running around in a place that we would not deem to put a human being in. So I'm just very disheartened by the fact that this space or these spaces were not properly inspected. And the fact that $40,000 could be given to a slumlord, no more, no less, for his, for his benefit. And no one took the time to inspect this particular premise. I know there are others, but this particular one that I have in mind, the one that's been in, in focus, has been particularly disturbing. Look, I, my heart goes out to these families. They were taken advantage of and we were taken advantage of. And I think that the changes that we're, we've made are aimed at preventing this from occurring and the working with law enforcement is aimed at holding uh, one or more parties uh, uh, who are responsible accountable. Uh, I know, by the way, uh, you know, having spent a lot of time working in law enforcement matters before I came to the, came to these, uh, my, my positions, uh, that sometimes people want immediate action, but I think it's most important to build the appropriate uh, case and then take action. Thank you, Councilmember Adams. Uh, I just had to follow up on that, Commissioner. So um, do we have uh, uh, a clear uh, accounting of where people are being relocated through the SOTA program? So you said a third in the city, another 10% in New York State, and then the remainder, which would be, you know, uh, about 50, half. 57% are out of state. Do we, do we know which states and counties and municipalities those people are being relocated to? We do. I want to caution the inquiry, though, here, and we'll be happy to sit down with you and give you a fuller briefing. You might recall uh, that uh, a particular locality in New York State a little over a year ago attempted to argue that uh, people didn't have a right to travel and were demanding that New York City, quote, take back people that had made a choice to relocate. Mm -hmm. So in all of this discussion, I want to make sure that our clients don't end up being demonized. They've made a sure. choice uh, to exercise the right to travel. We've given them help to do so. The fact that 3,500 households have participated in this program, only 70 have returned, mm -hmm. I think is indicative of success, although I want to 
uh, uh, reiterate what I said to Councilmember Adams, which is if even one family is in the circumstances that she and I uh, have been discussing, that indicated that we needed to make some changes, and we did make changes. Okay, I get it. I'm just saying that, uh, so even just the counties, we don't, so I, I spoke to the gentleman who is responsible for housing inspections in East Orange, New Jersey, last week. And uh, he said, A, he has no idea how many families uh, were moved from New York City to East Orange, but he said that he, that particular apartment, he didn't, it wasn't inspected, and that's under his jurisdiction. So, and he said that there's nobody at DHS that he can talk. He hasn't been able to get in contact with anybody at DHS or HRA or DSS, and so there's there's just no communication with the local jurisdiction and those responsible for ensuring safe and uh, and decent housing and, and and habitability in these apartments. So that's his responsibility. And he said there's you know he didn't even know that anyone was doing this, and so it's not just. I mean, there's a there's a clear benefit in coordination with the authorities in, a, in, a, in another jurisdiction uh, to ensure that there's safe and habitable housing. So we're applying the same standards uh, that we use for our rental assistance programs in New York City. Again, I want to... But that means that, I'm sorry, just because who's responsible then for going and doing the inspection? If we're relocating or somebody decides that they want to move to Virginia, does that mean that we're going to travel to Virginia to inspect an apartment? In, in the metropolitan area, we do travel uh, to inspect apartments in the metropolitan air, area. Again, I want to... So anywhere I, in New if, Jersey? If I, if I anywhere could, in Connecticut? If I could just finish, okay. Council Member? Yeah. Uh, in the metropolitan area... Uh, either our staff or not-for-profits do conduct inspections uh, applying the same standard that we do for our rental assistance relocations in New York City. But again, I, I want to just remind us all that our clients come to us and say, I want to relocate to someplace. And we treat our clients as independent people making decisions that they want to relocate we also verify that they have the wherewithal to pay the rent on an ongoing basis through documentation and through phone contacts. And this is, I'm sorry, my, my question is about, about the conditions of the apartment and who's responsible for making sure that, those, that the apartment is habitable. That's it. That's the only uh, thing, I, that's, the, that's, that's the, our whole, and I think I speak for Councilmember Adams too, that our entire line of inquiry here is just about the habitability of the apartments no, and who's I, responsible for it. I, I hear so who's I don't know who's responsible for the who just who, is there a contracted agency that does this or is it is it New York City DOB inspectors or is it staff so from DHS? I don't know who's responsible. So when we give somebody uh, when the city has given somebody an individual public assistance rent allowance to live in New York City, not not FAPS, not SOTA, we right. give someone their $400 state rental allowance. Right. That is a benefit that they're entitled to get, and we don't tell them you can't spend your shelter allowance in this apartment, you can spend it in that apartment. That's been the... But the, but the difference, there's a difference. In New York City, there's a sister agency to HR, or to DHS, DSS, the Department of Buildings, that is responsible for ensuring the Department of Buildings and HPD for responsible for ensuring the habitability of apartments in New York City, right. any apartment. But but and, and we but when we go to a separate jurisdiction, there we have to ensure that there's some level of accountability for at least the safety of these apartments. Other I, I just I don't you, you're not suggesting though that if a client applies for public assistance and part of their grant is a $400 rent allowance, that we should tell the client that they can't use that rent allowance in their apartment, and that the Department of Buildings and the Department of HPD should have something to say about that? I mean, we're giving people grants to make well, decisions about, if I could that, just finish. Well, I'm sorry, we're sorry, giving people grants. I don't want to demonize our clients and have, have it be that they can't make independent sorry, choices. That's a mischaracterization. We do, in fact, we do, in fact, if, we, if somebody gets a FEPS, voucher? Do we not inspect the, the apartment? For a FEPS voucher, we do do that, uh, but it's the same standard that we use for soda within the five counties. 
But if somebody wants to move out of New York City, yeah. uh, we want to give them the wherewithal to do that, which is okay, what we're doing. Right. Okay. But we, with a FEPS voucher, we uh, require that the apartment be inspected because we are providing city resources to that landlord to house the family and we have the expectation that, that the apartment will be habitable. That standard ought to apply to those moving out of state through the SOTA program. Right. Considering, just, just also, I mean, just, just to be clear, the number of people moving out through SOTA is, 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 is a very large number when you look through the various uh, programs that are rehousing people out of shelter. It's not an insignificant number of people especially since it's only really been in existence for a couple of years now. And so I just, I just am not sure that I'm getting from this testimony or the answers to my questions that there is an accountability mechanism for the habitability of apartments that is the same mechanism that we are using for the other move-outs, the other, the other mechanisms for move-outs. So City FEPS and FEPS and Section 8 and TBRA and NYCHA, obviously. So all those have a certain mechanism for accountability to ensure the habitability of an apartment. And I just wanted, I just, who's we're, responsible? We're, Actually, just, that's we, the question. Who's responsible we, for the habitability? Right. We think there are mechanisms to address the problem that arose in Northern Jersey. We think that was obviously a deplorable situation. And we're happy to sit down with you and give you a fuller briefing Who does the on the program. That's all I want to ask. But again, are you, I, I think you're not saying this. If somebody wants to move out of New York City, not to the metropolitan area, are you saying we shouldn't give them support to help them do that? Okay. I'm asking the question, who is, res who is doing the inspections? Right. To move out of New York City, out of the, out of the metropolitan area, our clients are exercising independent choice to decide they want to move. So who's doing the inspections? Commissioner, I'm sorry, I can't move past this point without an answer. Who's doing the inspections? For people who are not moving within New York City or the five counties, we rely upon our clients to make independent choices about where they want to live and that they're moving into apartments that are appropriate for them. In Northern Jersey, our clients and we were taken advantage of by a group of bad actors, or one or more bad actors. Commissioner, that answer is insufficient. Council member, we're dealing in a world in which there's no regional planning, in which uh, our ability to get the kruger Hevesy bill, which would give our clients the ability to move, move around the state, uh, is hanging in the balance. Uh, we're dealing in a world in which clients come to us and they want to live in New York City or they want to move out of New York City, and we're trying to give them a helping hand to do so. We had a horrible situation that happened with a, with a number of families in Northern Jersey. I don't think that you want to throw out a program that's been successful because we got taken advantage of when we've taken uh, steps to try to address the problem. Neither I nor Council Member Adams suggested eliminating the program. I don't know enough about the program to suggest eliminating it, frankly. I'd be happy to, happy to give but, you a full briefing on it. But I, well, I think we could start by talking about who is who is doing the inspections. I, I don't, but I don't. I I'm sorry. Somebody. Is, so nobody. You don't is, like is the answer. Nobody. Yeah, I, you don't like my answer, but our clients. You didn't answer. Uh, who, didn't, who is doing the inspections? I, I did answer the question, Council Member. So when you rent an apartment, you look at the apartment and you determine whether you want to rent it. I think our clients have the same ability that you do. I don't think our clients have less ability than you do. 
So the family in East Orange identified the apartment themselves? Uh, that isn't what I've said. You asked me a question. I already answered the, the, the metropolitan area. You asked me about Virginia. You asked me about places outside of the five. Oh, I, I, and you've informed me that, I guess, it's, it's just the metropolitan area. And that's helpful. But I just don't know who is doing, who, I mean, uh, I, who, who's identifying the apartments then? I mean, is it, the, you, the family you, in East Orange I, identified the I, apartment I, themselves? I, t don't, don't put words into my mouth, council member. In the five counties, in the, in the metropolitan area, we have uh, city staff and not-for-profit workers that are using the same apartment review standard that we use for New York City relocations. Previously, we allowed people to move in with a promise to fix. The clients and we got taken advantage of by a group of bad actors in Northern Jersey. We stopped that, and now we have a different approach in the, five, in the metropolitan area. You were asking me before about what happens outside of the metropolitan area, and I said to you, our clients make choices there about wanting to rent an apartment, just like you might. In the interest. metropolitan area, then, who is responsible for inspecting that. the apartment? City staff and not, or not-for-profit staff trained to use the same exact standard. But that what we city use. staff? What agency? DHS. DHS staff? Yeah, the same staff. We treat moves in the five in the metropolitan area the same as we treat moves with... And what not-for-profit staff? If it is the uh, if, if it's the provider that the families in the shelter system uh, stay in their shelter, we trained all of those providers to be able to make FEPS inspections in New York City. They can they apply the same standard to inspecting for a soda apartment in the five in the metropolitan area. Okay, thank you. And I'm I'm sorry if we got yeah. tied up, but I was trying to give you that answer, and perhaps we were talking through each other. We know each other well. I'm sorry if we got tied up with that. Got it. Okay, Councilmember Jonai. Thank you, Chair. Commissioner, it's not easy. Uh, the responsibility that you've taken over, it's overwhelming. I want to go back on two things, in particular in the borough of the Bronx, echoing my colleagues. Of the 467 shelters citywide, the buildings, the Bronx has 166 percent, 166 buildings. That's roughly 30% of the total shelter buildings of New York City. Bronx sites are approximately 17% of the total population of the city, but yet we have 30% of the city's shelters. I'm concerned about the 90 shelter plan and how many more are gonna work their way into the borough of the Bronx. Uh, we already know that we have more scatter sites than any other borough and this is a continuation. And the reason I want to harp on, and please answer that question, I want to make sure I have enough time to answer, uh, ask my second part of the question. The reason I'm so concerned about your peg cuts, and I don't want to be diverted to Albany, is because the borough of the Bronx, we see the strain on food pantries and soup kitchens. 30% of Bronx sites are SNAP recipients. Of the public assistant grants of the entire city, roughly 40% of Bronx sites, which is almost a little over 9% of the total population of the borough of the Bronx, are recipients of the public assistant grants. On Medicaid, nearly 30% of Bronx sites are recipients. Any cut will be felt by Bronx sites more than any other borough. So here we have an unhealth, the least healthiest borough, and I want to say I'm Bronx proud. I love the borough of the Bronx. We've come a long way. We've got a long ways to go. But what is being done by this administration is not helping the Bronx. It's actually putting a larger burden on the Bronx. We have the least healthiest, the most obese, the most asthma, the highest rate of unemployment, um, the least skilled, least educated. By allowing the borough to be inundated by shelters which come with decent families but needs are much higher and not giving us the resources, 
is unfair, unjust, and immoral. So if you can answer the question about the inundation and then the $50 million peg cut, and please don't divert to Albany because every dollar will be felt more by Bronxites than anyone else. So, and when I say, talk to me about the 50 million, when have you met with this administration to talk about the pay cuts since we don't know where they're going to be? How many times have you met with them? Who have you met with? And who on your staff, if not you, has met with this administration to determine where the cuts will be? It's a fair question. It's a fair question. But the answer to your question is going to be unsatisfying to you. We're yep. still looking at how we're going to implement them, and uh, we're continuing to review it. I'm personally involved in it, and uh, we will be able to tell you uh, where we're going to be implementing the $50 million in reductions uh, once we're able to uh, uh, complete the process. It's an ongoing process. When is the executive budget due? Uh, it's due in May. In May. So in two months. And, and April, May. And April, April. May. So a month and a half, right? We should have an executive budget, 45 days from now or less. I, I, I think you're right. And we don't know where the cuts are going to be. Where do you think they should be? I'm going to ask, where do you feel the pet cut should be? I don't think that it's very helpful when we're facing a $125 million cut from the state in the next couple of days to mm -hmm. go through where you, where you or I think we should be implementing $50 million worth of city cuts. This is like Abbott and Costello, who's on first and what's on second. But I'm worried about your $50 million. Before I worry about the state's 125 possible, and the borough of the Bronx is going to feel the brunt of it. Council and I illustrated using your own numbers and reports, and I can't get an answer. Where would you, you're given the power, you're negotiating, you're going to point out to this administration, where do you feel the cuts should come from? Council member, we're still reviewing with OMB where Thank we're you. going to make So in 30 cuts. days, you'll have an answer for us, and it'll be a big surprise to all of us where those cuts are, and then we'll go through a whole second round of complaining. Y you understand my point, and I believe it's with passion and conviction because it's the right thing to do. The borough of the Bronx is at a true disadvantage. We talk about the tale of two cities, this is the tale of two boroughs. And the borough of the Bronx has always gotten the short end of it and will continue to get the short end of it. And I encourage all my colleagues to stand up and fight for this borough against this department, this agency, and this administration. Thank you, Councilmember Joe Nike. Uh, Councilmember Gibson, followed by Councilmember King. Thank you, Chair, and thank you again, Commissioner. And while uh, this week, we know uh, there's a lot that's happening in Albany, and so I appreciate the um, impending visit that you and your staff are taking to Albany. I think we need to be very, very concerned about TANF cuts to this city. Uh, last year, we saw a number of unfunded mandates that we got from Albany, and so to me, I'm remaining optimistic, but obviously we have to prepare for what will happen in the final enacted state budget. Um, and so I wanted to ask two quick questions uh, based on numbers that we got from the PMMR as it relates to school-aged children in our shelters, um, the work that you're doing with DOE uh, on the number of students that are in temporary housing that are in many of our public schools, and how are we doing in terms of placements for families with children in regards to keeping them in their home communities. Um, and then my second question, also PMMR related, are the adult family shelter entrance. I've noticed since FY17, FY18, and FY19, the shelter stay has been increasing slightly uh, from 414 to 438, and now we're at 446. So I wanted to understand from your perspective what some of the driving factors are in increasing the length of stay. Uh, I know the city is actively in litigation with landlords who are refusing vouchers. We know income um, discrimination is real, and we hear from a lot of our constituents that they have a voucher, right, but they're not able to find an apartment where landlords are accepting the program. So can you give us an update on where we are and some of the driving factors that is related to the increased shelter stay? So let me deal with the school question first, if I may. Mm -hmm. Sure. So 
Um, I mean, in essence, the Turn of the Tide plan is to give families with children the opportunity to be sheltered as close as possible to their community so that they can, uh, their children continue to attend school in their uh, community. Uh, with the opening of additional shelters, we now have at any point in time about 75% of our families with children are in the uh, borough of the youngest child school. Uh, that's a significant improvement of where we were. The MMR and PMMR report on where their first placement was. Uh, we provided information in this year's PMMR that actually a better place to focus on is not the first night where we placed you, but where you are ongoing. Uh, but as we get more shelters open as part of the Turning Tide Plan, we'll be able to improve upon that. But we're now at about 75%, uh, which I know you are very focused on, as are we, in delivering on a promise to keeping children in the schools that they were in and not having to be bussed and travel around. Number two, uh, in terms of uh, source of income discrimination, thank you for, for mentioning the two cases that we brought. Uh, we have two approaches to source of income discrimination, which does affect uh, uh, you know, clients that have vouchers. And the two cases we brought are against several landlords and brokers. We think that the determination in those uh, cases will have an impact uh, on other uh, individuals, and we're hopeful that we'll have favorable decisions. In the meantime, we do take inquiries, and our source of income staff do intervene, and we're able to turn no's into yeses. And again, we would encourage you and your staff and clients to call our hotline and so that we can intervene and, and help people. Thank you, Councilmember Gibson. Councilmember King? Thank you, Chair Levin. And Commissioner, it's good to see you as always. Good to see you, too. Um, I'll be brief, and I'm just just be as concise as I can with my questions, as opposed to our answers as well. Um, I hear loud and clear my colleague, Council Member Joni, and his concerns in regards of budget cuts and how it has an impact on the, on the Boogie Down Bronx. So I would ask you this. We go through this budget session ourselves, where we try to allocate funding to different groups, and we look at what we have in our youth pod, our senior pod now, and so forth. And what we end up doing, we look at some of our groups who are getting large amount of monies, and then when we have to try to downscale and cut it, we look at those who can't afford the cuts. So what we're saying to you as to, from the Bronx, wherever you deem that you need to make any reduction in cuts, I would ask you to look at the Bronx who is overwhelmed right now, and if these cuts will definitely hurt those of us who are the lowest, then maybe we don't look at that direction at all. Maybe you look at someplace else to figure out how to win, because if you touch the Bronx, the Bronx can and will fall apart. So that's my first ask of you when you go back to do your assessments to figure out where you're going to look to make cuts. The second thing I would like to ask of you, and if you have and if you have not, have you ever thought about being a part of uh, joining us in an advocacy? Because some of the things I'm confused about when it comes to the budget, when they talk about reducing or cutting, cutting costs, that we're still spending new money. So would you be willing to in your conversations with the part of your administration that you're part of in the mayor's office. Say, hey, listen, you're asking us to cut 50 million, 60 million, but we just spent 112 million on a new program. If we can't afford to spend money on new on, on programs they have, how do we invest money in new programs? I'm asking, is it possible that you can be an advocate to help us on that and as well as along with the advocates? So I'm, I'm taking from your two questions the following takeaway. Mm -hmm. uh, one, you want to make sure that we're very focused on trying to minimize harm to people. Uh, and you're pointing out the Bronx in particular, given the, the numbers of people that need our help. Uh, you have my commitment that we're going to try to minimize harm to people, and we'll certainly take into account uh, you know, where w w the, the, the needs of our clients across the city, but I understand what the needs are in the Bronx. In terms of new programs versus old programs, sometimes new programs are better than the old programs. So I, I would, I would want to make sure that we all have the flexibility to say, you know, if that program has been around for a while, it's actually not working as well, could it be changed, and still leave room for a new program which might be better than an old program. But at the end of the day, the fact we've got a peg, and I know that Councilmember Joan and I didn't, didn't want me to keep mentioning the fact we have a state cut out there, this is part of the, the challenge of the economy uh, and the economic factors that we're dealing with. But I, I appreciate your two requests of me, and uh, we'll keep focusing on these things together. And I, and I appreciate that, because if there's an old program that's not working, then that has to be clearly explained to all, us here on the committee so we can 
work in sync with you to say, you gave us some metrics you were using for a program that's been ineffective, but we want to do this new program. So if we have to downside it, then we can all be on board. And then my final question would be to you, do you have any programs or are you working on any programs or, and if you are, what would be that cost of that program that allows you to work with families to engage in self-promoting behavior that never ever brings them into your system? I think we have uh, a number of programs designed to do that. One of them you and I were at, uh, the home-based program, which is designed to keep people from coming into our, our system and to connect people to employment uh, as well. I think your point's very well taken, that we gotta always be focused on essentially prevention. Uh, uh, and we will keep being focused on prevention. Uh, and I appreciate your perspective on that. Thank you, Mr. Chia, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember King. And we'll be seeing you momentarily, co-chairing the second part of this hearing. Um, Commissioner, I just have a, a few more questions here sure. um, that I think are important to get to. Um, <clears throat> the first is there are a number of issues in, um, as we were going through and preparing for this uh, hearing, of uh, issues within the MMR uh, where there's not sufficient information, um, uh, issues around shelter facility counts and capacity, um, issues around uh, safe havens. Um, I don't want to go through all of them right now, uh, but can we follow up and have a discussion around indicators that are presented in the MMR? Because there are several that are actually either not, uh, you know, they're, they're seen as not available in the MMR or they're, they're not actually categories in the MMR themselves. And, and, but these are pieces of information that we think are important. Uh, of course. Um, with regard to aftercare, why does aftercare not have, it, it, why was that not included as part of the model budget process and instead is being provided through home base and um, uh, in addition, why uh, why do hotels not provide aftercare services or have social workers on site? So in answer to your first question, I think we're focused on making aftercare services available to people in the communities that they're relocating to. Uh, the current world uh, still involves people in shelter uh, potentially relocating to different communities. And so we want the ability of clients when they locate, relocate to a community to be able to deal with a community-based organization that right there, as opposed to still relating to the shelter that they were previously in. And that is, and that is something that everybody's then set up with. So somebody moves out of shelter with a voucher and they then, once they move into the new apartment, have a case with a, with a local not-for-profit so that's the, funded for aftercare services? The home-based providers are, part of their mission is to follow up with the families that are, re, or, or that are relocated in their service area. And so this is a, a topic of conversation that we have with our home-based providers about their follow-up. I mean, you might want to reach out to Henry Street Settlement House, which uh, through the council's initiative, the funding that we provide, mm -hmm does aftercare services for people that move out of Henry Street, wherever they may go. They could go to the Bronx, but they still have a case management aftercare uh, with Henry Street, and uh, they seem to have a lot of success with that. Right, I think Henry Street runs, uh, runs terrific programs overall. Uh, we'll certainly look at their aftercare program, but again, I think that it is an important principle to have services available in the communities to which people are relocating. But having said that, but I all 109,000 people that have moved out of shelter have an aftercare case? Uh, all of the people that have moved out of shelter have an outreach to them from somebody who was in a home-based program, offering them assistance, making sure that the family knows that they are available. That doesn't mean that the family is required to follow up with them. It just means that the family now knows that there's some place that they can get help and there's somebody there who can intervene and help them if they should need it. 
how long does a case typically last as an aftercare case? It depends on whether or not the family wants to avail themselves of those services. For example, uh, landlord mediation is one of the services that's provided. That could arise when there's a need for landlord mediation, or it may never arise. So it really depends on what the individual's family's issue is. So what's the budget for aftercare? It's part of the overall service delivery model. I think we added 20 million. It's 18 million as part of the overall budget. Right. Um, it's, part, it's part of the overall home base budget, I'm sorry. Okay, I mean, I'm, I think that that's, uh, I mean, I imagine that home base staff have enough to do with trying to prevent people from going into the shelter system in the first place. That's normally what people traditionally have thought of as the, the role of home base for the last 14 years that home base has been in existence. Right, but, um, and so I just, I'm wondering whether that's the best service delivery model, but that's something we can talk about in the right, future. But just again, for context, the total home base budget is 59 million, and 18 mm -hmm. million of that is allocated for aftercare. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, and about social workers in hotels? Uh, you know, uh, we, we, you and I talked about this recently, mm -hmm. uh, and, and certainly, interested in pursuing our conversations about your interest in it. Uh, it's been our focus to get out of hotels, but you know, as the budget process proceeds, I'm happy to have further conversations with you about it. I mean, how many, there are 90 hotels? How many? 88, there are 88 hotels, and, but that includes hotels for single adults as well as right. for families. But uh, mostly for families. families, like 70 of the 90 are for families. Um, there's 18 single adult hotels. And so mostly for families. So, so, I mean, how many are we closing a year? I mean, how many did we close this past year? Just closed one uh, last month in uh, Councilmember Kozlovitz's district for families with children. How many are we closing a year? We how many just, we so we, I just told uh, Councilmember Adams we're closing two in her district. But as I said, I want to. How many did we close in the past year? This is the second year of the Turn of the Tide program. It's just now allowing us the ability to start to look at these kind of closures. How many uh, hotels have we closed to date? I, I will give you that out. number. I just named three of them that we talked about in the right, very recent period of time. Right, but if there's 88 to go, then we, that's going to take a long time. Uh, and uh, there are children that are spending an average of 400 days of their lives in a hotel without room to run around, and room to be a kid, and room to do their homework, and room, uh, and, and a kitchen, no kitchen, no stove, no washing machine, no, uh, you know, just the, no bookshelves, um, all the things that my daughter gets to experience Children that are living in hotels don't, and they, they sit in a, they're in a room that is the size of a shoebox, and they don't get to eat hot meals. They're, 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 they're uh, heated up, you know, microwavable meals, um, and they're not getting nutrition, and there's no social workers for them, and there's nobody to help them, and so, the very, and there's 88 of these left. And if we're closing, you know, one a month, it's gonna be like another, that's like another six years or seven years before we close all of these things. And, and that's, that's long past, both of us are probably gonna be in these positions and we don't, we don't have social workers for these kids. It's just, it, we have to. We, it, is, it is like the least that we could do as a city is provide something for these children. So, as I said to you when we met just a couple of days ago, happy to talk through with you uh, this issue. There are a number of things in your comments I think are, I just have to correct for the, for the record. Uh, we are not closing hotels over the life of the plan at the pace that we have been up to this point. We prioritize getting out of clusters first, which is the reason why we're 70% of the way there now. Uh, and I know you have been supportive in your district, but the quicker we can get families with children shelters up and running around the city, 
uh, will be able to deliver on the clusters as well as the hotel closures. Uh, there are services as part of the service delivery that we've got in hotels. Uh, and we will continue to work with you and look at the issue you're raising uh, with respect to, respect to social workers. But just to be clear, every, every tier two has a social worker. Every, we, through the Thrive program, we have a one to 25 ratio of social workers in order to uh, help stabilize the families with children in that system. But not in hotels. Uh, we don't currently have them in hotels. Okay. We should, okay. Um, Okay, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Councilmember Rosenthal, and there, I, I'll, I'll leave my questions at that. We, I do have a, a number of other questions that I didn't get to, so we're going to have to follow up uh, in Happy writing. That. Is that okay? Happy to do that. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate the second round of questions. I want to ask again about um, some DV, domestic vi sure. violence funding. Uh, a new need was added to HRA's budget in the preliminary plan in November, 4.5 million for um, domestic and gender-based violence prevention. Um, has that money been spent in fiscal year 19, and do you know what that's for? Right, that, that is money that is for the um, NDV, th that we simply are the uh, conduit agency for those dollars. So th that's for, we, we provide the budget for the domestic, city's domestic violence office um, in terms of the operation of that program. That's distinct from what uh, Administrator Benny and I have been talking about, which is we actually provide direct services ourselves, but we are the funding mechanism for the citywide office for domestic violence. So is that like staff? Because it's ongoing. So it's again, a baseline number. So again, is that staff? Is it contracts? We're going to have to get back to you on that. It's, I believe it's for contracts. I believe it's for contracts for that office. The former mayor's office to combat domestic no, violence. No, I'm very familiar with yeah. it. Why wouldn't it be in the mayor? I don't understand because why that, it's there. And because it's that's part of what we talked about before in terms of economies of scale. So rather than have separate personnel offices and separate contracting processes and all that, we're we are the... Fiscal agent yeah. for contracts. Yeah. 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 Okay, if you and, could... And for operations. For their op we're, the, we're the fiscal, we're the provider of the financing for that office through our budget. Okay, if you could confirm that, I, it would be helpful to know. Sure. Um, I think I see what you're saying. Um, okay, I wanted to ask about HASA. Um, there was an increase in the average number of days between the application submission and housing benefits issued by nearly two days. Um, if you look at the first four months of fiscal year 19 to fiscal year 18, mm -hmm. and um, the actual annual averages for all years reported on the um, Mayor's Management Report have also been increasing, um, notably above the target of 15.5 days. Um, I'm wondering why the housing application processing time is increasing and whether or not you have the headcount to meet those needs. And then I, mean, I have one last question. Yeah, we, d done. We, did, we did add additional staff. Some of it, obviously, the overall operations relate to the complexity of finding apartments in the, in the city, but in terms of processing time, we did add additional staffing. Uh, and part of it was, was catching up with the increased numbers of cases we have because of the expansion beyond uh, the original uh, uh, clients having to have aids before we would serve them. But we had additional staffing to catch up with the processing done. Okay, I, th I think it's worth sort of looking at that a sure. little bit because it sounds like you're playing catch up um, with staffing because your number of days keep increasing. Right, also our number of clients coming to us is increasing too. Right, so are you, I mean, there's, so it sounds like you're not getting staffed at the level you need because these are people that are just waiting for their benefits. No, I think we have, we, we got the level of staff to address the challenge, and but we're going to monitor it very closely. Uh, but I do understand the spirit of your question. Okay. I do understand it. Because it's only increasing. I hear you. You're behaving. Um, okay, I'm, I'm going to call it a day. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Rosenthal. Commissioner, Administrators, Deputy Commissioner, 
thank you very much, Deputy Commissioners. Thank you very much for your, uh, for your time uh, and for answering our questions. And we look forward uh, to continuing the conversation on these budget-related matters between now and the executive budget so that when we have our executive budget hearing in May, uh, all the questions that we ask will have answers. Thank you very much. Thanks. And thank you for your support on fighting the $125 million cut we're facing. Yes, sir. Thank you. Folks, we still are in session, so if you could please exit quietly. If you are leaving, please exit quietly. Private conversations, please take outside into the rotunda. We will be continuing with the juvenile justice momentarily. Once again, if you are here to testify and have not filled out a witness slip, please do so now at the Sergeant at Arms table. So once again, we ask everyone that is not remaining for the juvenile justice portion to please exit quietly. Thank you. Once again, those of you who are exiting, please exit quietly. We are about to switch over to juvenile justice. Public portion for both hearings will be around 3 o'clock. If you have signed up to testify, that would be around 3 o'clock for both hearings, for general welfare and juvenile justice. Once again, we ask everyone to please exit quietly if you are leaving. Everyone else, we ask to please find seats, silence your cell phones. If you are here to testify, please fill out a witness slip. Thank you.
for your cooperation. All right, we are going to ask everyone to please find seats at this time. We are going to resume in a moment. So once again, if you go, please find seats. Please silence all electronic devices at this time. Please put all electronic devices on silent. Any private conversations, please take outside of the chambers throughout the hearing. Thank you.
Good afternoon, good afternoon. I'm Councilmember Andy King, I'm Chair of the Committee of Juvenile Justice. I want to thank you, Chair Levin, for your spirited conversation with Commissioner Banks earlier and all who were here to testify and listen to our conversation. But before I give my opening um, remarks, um, I did in experience a, I want to say a playful banter, but in a banter that was a little annoying from Commissioner Banks, who was testifying earlier, and I'm just saying to us, I know we have, we all have our relationships and how we want to answer questions to help the system so we can improve the systems. But I want us to always be truthful and honest, concise, succinct, and if we don't have the answers, which we're trying to ascertain today, the answers to our budgetary concerns when it comes to this JJ system, if we don't have an answer, I'm just saying, I would just ask y'all to respect us and say, we just don't have the answer and then we can move forward, not dance around. I watched a 15 minute exchange and all he had to just give an answer and he refused to give an answer until he finally found himself. But I don't wanna waste your time. I don't want the committee's time to be wasted with that kind of ugly dance. So as, as I say that, let's jump into today's conversation. Again, thank you Chair Levin for this morning's spirited conversation um, with ACS and Department of Homeless Services. Um, the city spends approximately 236 million of that budget. Well, let me back up. I just want to say the testimony we heard this morning discussed uh, how ACS spends uh, on its proposed 2.6 billion budget for fiscal year 20 and 19. Uh, the city spends approximately 236 million of that budget annually on juvenile justice services managed by ACS Division of Youth and Family Justice or DYFJ. These services include alternative detention, non-limited and secure detention placements and juvenile justice support. The total budget amount increased about 40 million in the past year. The key issue for me is the progress of the city's ongoing raise the age implementation. And I say the city because the state has excluded the city from the financial support it provided to every other New York County. As we will discuss, the city is currently funding 90% of the total cost of raise the age or about 131 million in fiscal 2020. The state has a responsibility to support the program and should pay its fair share. I hope to really see this in the state's final budget. I'm interested also in hearing more about the staffing transition and the joint operation at the Horizon Juvenile Facility. We want to see how the youth development specialists in the facility as soon as possible. Quite simply, can ACS tell us, tell this committee today when all correction officers will be removed from Horizon? Another concern across DYFJ is the availability of quality programming with rigorous metrics for evaluating success. This committee has previously requested information from ACS on these performing metrics, but as of today, we have not received those answers. I'm hoping to receive that information soon and I will continue partnership for some of the city's most vulnerable youth. Finally, we need more transparency and accuracy when it comes to DYFJ's budget. The city made, it serious, made a serious commitment in last year's executive budget to raise the age, and there's over 170 million in capital commitments for their facilities. However, ACS capital commitment rate declined to just 8% of fiscal 2018. How much facility work has been completed, how much money has been spent, and what else needs to be done are just a few of the answers we want to get the answers to, to today. In addition, I'd like to know if the population coming into ACS system is bigger or smaller than anticipated. What can we expect when a 17-year-old adolescent comes into the system on October 1st, marking the second and final phase of the changes in the Raise the Age law? We need clarity on the population numbers in order to align our budget to what it really needs, especially if the mayor is asking for ACS to produce a substantial peg of 68 million. I note it with concern that ACS removed Horizon from the population from its monthly flash indicators, and I would like to hear why that has happened. Finally, there is a question of juvenile justice contracts, which total 100 million, but, the remain, hidden, but, but remain hidden within its general contracting category. I'd like to hear from you, Commissioner, and your team, um, and we will continue to work with you to see if we can pull these contracts out for greater transparency. These matters are critical concerns for our communities in general, but particularly our young people and families involved in the justice system. It is essential that ACS 
and the council partner together for a fair future. I look forward to today's conversation. But before I introduce the ACS Commissioner and Deputy Commissioner for DYFJ, DYFJ, I'd like to thank the committee for their work in preparing today's hearing. Daniel Crew, Finance Analyst Donhaney Sampora, Unit Head, Council Josh Kingsley, and Policy Analyst William Holland. I will now ask the council to swear in the panel. Um, before we do that, I'm going to defer to my colleague, Chair Levin, to make a statement. Um, thank you. Thank you, Chair King. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Councilmember Steve Levin, Chair of the Committee on General Welfare here at the Council, and I'm glad to be joined by my committee colleague as well, Chair Andy King, and members of the Committee on Juvenile Justice. Um, I want to acknowledge Councilmember Barry Credencic and Councilmember Robert Holden, uh, who are with us right now. Um, welcome once again to the fiscal 2020 preliminary budget hearing for the Committee on General Welfare. This afternoon, as Councilmember King, Chair King said, we will be hearing testimony from the Administration for Children's Services, otherwise known as ACS, on its proposed budget for fiscal 2020, general agency operations within its proposed $2.67 billion budget, and performance indicators for children's services within the fiscal 19 preliminary, mayor <coughs> preliminary mayor's management report. Uh, there are, I, I just one thing I would, before I get into the rest of my uh, statement, I just want to uh, follow up on what uh, Chair King said. We, uh, across uh, budget areas in, covered by the General Welfare Committee, are seeing drastic state cuts and shifts of responsibility to the city uh, for funding of, uh, of essential programming from the state, whether that's in ACS or in homeless services. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's shocking in preparing for this hearing how much of the burden the city takes and how much of that over time has shifted to the city from the state. And so we call on our state colleagues um, to, to be a partner in providing these services for New Yorkers in need and not, and not entirely shift all of the responsibility and all of the funding uh, over to the city um, because we are unable to do all of it on our own. We need our state partners. There are over 1.8 million children in New York City, and a quarter of them live in poverty. In fact, a stunning 12,000 families with children return to a homeless shelter every night. We may live in a wealthy city, but the honest truth is that many of our neighbors and families are struggling day to day just to get by. This is why ACS's mission is so important. With the transfer of Early Learn to the Department of Education, ACS renews its focus on child welfare and family well-being. Today, we will continue a conversation about whether ACS's critical mission is aligned to its budget. Are there enough resources in terms of staffing, contracts, training, and capital projects to ensure ACS meets its mission? Are the investments that we have made the right ones? What more should we be doing? I was disappointed that there were no new needs in ACS's fiscal 2020 preliminary budget. <coughs> uh, additionally, I was very disappointed that OMB has outlined a very high peg target of $68 million in savings to be included by the executive budget. ACS's peg is the city's second largest in real numbers as a share of, of an agency's funds, behind only DOE, which is very concerning. ACS also faces state budget risks again this year, with $13 million threatened for PIN's preventive diversion services. Last year, the state pushed over $130 million of costs onto the city, and the year prior cut $62 million from the city's foster care block grant. Um, this is very concerning. This, this, uh, this issue of the PEG target is something that I, I have, um, I'm, I'm, I'm really flummoxed about. Um, uh, the agencies that testified this morning, Department of Homeless Services and HRA, have a, a less than a 1% peg, um, and I understand that a lot of their uh, uh, budget is, is entitlement and not discretionary spending, but there's, uh, there's no excuse for the administration uh, to be putting such a high burden on ACS, uh, which is uh, caring for the most vulnerable uh, people in our entire city, the most vulnerable people in our entire city 
to depend on ACS and to, to stick them with a 7% peg is absolutely unacceptable and I will continue to fight against that. From the federal administration to the state government uh, and now with this administration's peg, I'm alarmed by what I see as a pervasive culture of cuts to children's services, a culture of cuts to children's services. Already, we know that low provider salaries and high workloads are straining our system. We know that youth in homeless shelters and foster care need our help. And we have heard that backlogs at the family court are preventing timely resolutions to critical questions of custody and guardianship. Today, I look forward to hearing an update on the transfer of early learn uh, services to DOE and the future of the 66,000 strong voucher system that will remain at ACS. I'm particularly interested to hear what ACS and DOE are doing to address the persistent pay gap for our daycare teachers and staff, some of whom earn as much as 60% less than similarly qualified and experienced teachers at DOE. But I also want to discuss what we can achieve together to reverse this culture of cuts and move from reactive to proactive budgeting for the child welfare system as a whole. For example, I strongly believe in the work that ACS has done to launch the pilot family enrichment centers, and I want to thank Deputy Commissioner Lorelei Vargas for all of her work on that. Um, but I want to see more additional support in the preliminary budget for these community assets. I would also like to discuss the Fair Futures campaign for, which, uh, for, for comprehensive foster care supports and hear what the city is doing to fund the foster care task force's recommendations. This morning, uh, there were uh, hundreds of people outside rallying for the Fair Futures campaign, which would provide uh, uh, mentorship and coaches for every youth that ages out of foster care between the ages of 21 and 26. Now, going back to the foster care task force's recommendations, this includes a $7 million allocation that was agreed upon last year but was not implemented as part of the fiscal 2019 budget adoption deal between the mayor and the speaker. Let's work together to provide the kinship navigators, improved family visiting time, and workforce employment support, support that was promised by the mayor to the speaker last year. As the father of one and soon to be two children, and the chair of the committee uh, for the sixth year, I feel I have an important role to play in ensuring that the city has proper oversight over the budget and policy making decisions at ACS. In partnership with you, Commissioner Hansel, and uh, your entire staff, deputy commissioners and, and entire staff, and this administration, I hope that we can work together towards proactive budgeting that ensures that New York City's children stay safe, happy, and healthy. Uh, I want to thank my colleague, uh, Chair Andy King of the Juvenile Justice Committee, uh, for all of his hard work in advocating uh, for New York City's children. I'd also like to thank the committee staff for their incredible work in preparing for today's hearing. Um, it's really just a remarkable amount of work that finance staff does uh, to prepare. Daniel Krupp, the finance analyst for the committee, Dohini Sampura, unit head, Regina Pareto Ryan, our deputy finance director. Of course, our finance director, Latanya McKinney, who I didn't uh, acknowledge earlier. Council of Minta Kilowan, policy analyst, Tanya Cyrus and Crystal Pond, as well as my chief of staff, Jonathan Boucher, and legislative director, Elizabeth Adams. And now I'll turn it back over to Chair King. Uh, and at this point, I believe we were joined by Helen. I don't know if we've got her on the record, but thank you. We've been joined by Councilwoman Helen Rosenthal this afternoon. And uh, now we would turn it over to Council to Minister the Oath of Truth. Uh, please raise your right hand. Uh, do you firmly tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to answer honestly to council member questions? I do. Yeah. Please state your name for your record before speaking. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Chair King, Chair Levin, members of the Juvenile Justice and General Welfare Committees. I am David Hansel, Commissioner of the New York City Administration for Children's Services. Uh, with me at the table today are, starting on my far left, Felipe Franco, who is Deputy Commissioner of our Division of Youth and Family Justice, Dr. Jacqueline Martin, who is Deputy Commissioner of our Division of Prevention Services, Julie Farber, who is Deputy Commissioner of our Division of Family Permanency Services, and Jose Mercado, who is our Chief Finance Officer. We very much appreciate the opportunity to discuss the ACS Fiscal Year 2020 Preliminary Budget 
and the many ways that we've been working to protect and promote the safety and well-being of New York City's children, youth, and families. There are, and I completely agree with both of you, there are few missions that are more important than that of children's services, and I am deeply honored to have led the agency in this mission for just over two years now. Throughout my tenure, I've taken every opportunity to share with the council, with our many stakeholders, and with the families and the communities that we serve, the work we're doing, our successes and our challenges, and the steps we are taking to build the strongest possible child and family servicing agency. Our work is critically important, and I believe that all New Yorkers have the right to understand what we are doing, how we do it, and why we do it the way we do. So in that spirit, I'd like to take this opportunity to share with you the ways in which we are strengthening child safety, capitalizing on data and technology, and working to build better support systems for our children's families, our city's families and communities, which I truly believe puts New York City at the forefront of child welfare and juvenile justice work across the country. We've charted and we are pursuing a course that is strengthening all aspects of our work and enhancing our ability to keep children safe and support families. While we continually strive to improve our work, I'm proud of the following accomplishments in particular. We have reinforced our child protective process, the front end of our system for keeping children safe. Most significantly, we've reduced caseloads for our child protective specialists, provided more advanced tools and technology to support their work, enhanced training and skill development, and tightened our quality assurance and oversight mechanisms. We have decreased the number of New York City children in foster care to the lowest level in decades. At the end of calendar year 2018, there were approximately 8,200 children in our foster care system, representing a continued decline over the past two years in the face of foster care increases nationally. And through implementation of our foster care strategic blueprint and the recommendations of the Interagency Foster Care Task Force, we are improving services and outcomes for young people in foster care. And we are keeping children safely at home with their parents through our prevention programs. On any given day, we're serving nearly 25,000 children and their families in one of our community-based prevention programs. Our evidence-based prevention programs continue to draw national attention as the new federal Family First law pushes child well programs nationally in the direction which New York City began to move years ago. We've also launched a new preventive initiative to serve families for whom we might previously have sought court-ordered supervision to ensure child safety. I'd like to describe these accomplishments in greater detail and then we'll turn to juvenile justice as well. ACS remains committed to maintaining one of the lowest CPS caseloads in the country and we put in place measures to help drive those caseloads down. Over the last two years, we've hired over 1,100 new CPS. With more frontline staff on board, we've been able to reduce the average investigative caseload to 10.1 cases per caseworker during the first four months of fiscal year 2019, well below the nationally recognized standard of 12 and lower than almost every other jurisdiction in New York State. We've also added supports to increase staff retention and reduce staff turnover, such as extension of training time and revision of the curriculum, enhanced supervision and coaching in field offices, and wellness and staff appreciation programs. Our child protective staff are out every day throughout the five boroughs, visiting homes, schools, doctor's offices, shelters, and other locations to investigate allegations and interview witnesses. As part of this work, they must take note of interviews with parents, teachers, doctors, and others. They must track active cases and access a family's prior child welfare history. All of our frontline child protective staff now have portable tablets that allow workers to conduct clearances, obtain case history, and access other critical information in real time while out in the field. The tablets also enable CPS to enter their case notes from locations such as courthouses or waiting rooms rather than having to return from the field to their desks for that purpose. We've also launched new software called the Safe Measures Dashboard, which gives caseworkers, supervisors, and other staff a greater ability to manage their caseloads and prioritize their work through a streamlined overview of case details. Safe Measures provides a calendar of tasks and deadlines in their cases, tracks casework contacts, prioritizes workloads, and allows supervisors to monitor caseworkers' workload and progress. This is a major step towards automating what have previously been manual and burdensome processes, and we'll be making this valuable tool available to our provider agencies as well over the coming months. 
Getting to homes quickly for an initial visit is key to securing children's safety. So ACS has implemented a multifaceted transportation approach that includes access to Zipcar local motion technology that enables child protection staff to quickly reserve city vehicles online at any time before traveling to a home visit and dramatically reducing CPS response times in the field. Thanks to, I'm sorry, the, the job of our frontline staff is among the most difficult in the city and it's imperative that they receive the specialized training they need to do their complex work. This year ACS will begin construction on two new training sites, one in Queens and one in Harlem, which will offer simulated on-the-job training to frontline child welfare and youth justice staff. ACS's first ever simulation centers will allow staff to train in mock apartments, a mock courtroom, a mock detention center, and mock interview rooms using actors and retired New York City family court judges to create a training environment that simulates the work in the field. Our Division of Child Protection is tasked with the enormous responsibility of reducing risk and ensuring safety and well-being for children and families throughout the city. So it's crucial that we monitor the quality of our work and identify the areas where we need to improve. One of the first reforms I made as ACS Commissioner was to revamp our child stat model to strengthen the agency's focus on performance accountability around child protection. Since the relaunch of child stat in May 2017, we've held more than 100 review sessions, resulting in scores of recommendations for zone-based and system-wide improvement. As issues have been flagged in child stat, We've identified and implemented reforms that have enhanced our investigative work, have increased the efficiency of key administrative processes and business functions, have reduced, reduced delays in initiating services for families, and have streamlined required casework documentation. And thanks to focused child stat attention and other enhancements, our CPS units have significantly improved the quality and timely submission of required safety assessments and have instituted solutions to enhance supervisory and managerial oversight within CPS units. In our prevention area, we contract with community-based organizations to provide prevention services to promote family stability and prevent maltreatment. We work with our provider partners to steadily increase the availability of evidence-based preventive programs that are shown to reduce rates of maltreatment and improve child and family well-being. And that has positioned ACS at the forefront nationally in providing evidence-based prevention programs to support families. We've strengthened both our support and our oversight of contracted providers to make sure that families receive high quality services and that safety risks are flagged and addressed quickly. Our continuum of prevention services provides about 20,000 families and more than 44,000 children a year with the support and the services that they need to address challenges and has allowed ACS to safely reduce the number of children in foster care year after year. For families with very high service needs, particularly those under court-ordered supervision or at risk of court intervention, we added 960 new prevention services slots in late 2018, including evidence-based clinical models. With this as our foundation, we are launching a new vision for prevention work in New York City through an upcoming request for proposals. The Prevention Services RFP will be released later this year with new contracts to begin on July 1st, 2020. In anticipation of this procurement, we released a concept paper for public comment to solicit feedbacks from providers and from the community at large. Our new vision for prevention services in New York City focuses more heavily on evidence-based models relying on what we know works and better allocating service models across the city in a way that aligns with and advances the continued reform and innovation in the city's child welfare system. This will also prepare ACS and our providers well for the implementation of the Federal Family First Prevention Services Act starting in September 2021. The comment period for the concept paper started on February 8th and it ends today. So I encourage anyone interested in commenting to visit our website and submit your feedback immediately. This is a very exciting moment for child welfare prevention services in New York City, and we look forward to incorporating your collective voices as we bring the next generation of prevention services to life. Our deep commitment to supporting and strengthening families has allowed the city to reduce the number of children in foster care to a historic low. There were nearly 50,000 
New York City children in foster care 25 years ago, 17,000 a decade ago, just over 9,000 two years ago when I started as commissioner, and by the end of last year, we'd reduced the number of children in care to about 8,200. The decline in our foster care population has continued even as the number of children in foster care in other states and cities nationwide has increased since 2012. We believe that children should only be placed in foster care when it is absolutely necessary for their safety and then for the shortest amount of time possible. Protecting children's safety while in foster care and after they reunify with their families is a top priority for us and we've launched major new programs to enhance safety, including a $6 million initiative that we launched last year targeted to keeping children safe when they transition home to their families from foster care. And we've also launched new investments in family time and visitation. ACS has invested in a campaign to increase the recruitment of quality foster parents and increase the use of kinship homes for foster care that's produced significant results. I'll talk about those in more detail in a minute. While maltreatment in foster care is rare, any maltreatment in foster care is concerning and we monitor it very closely. In addition to the new initiatives I've just mentioned, we're taking steps to raise safety standards across the board, including conducting a close review of cases of maltreatment and a thorough review of provider programs. In the longer term, we are also rebidding our entire foster care system and we'll use that process to ensure that providers are protecting the safety of children. As you know, we, we contract with private nonprofit organizations to provide foster care services for children who are not safely able to remain at home. And during the next two years, we will re-procure our contracts for delivering family-based foster care and residential foster care services. We see this too as an opportunity for ACS to build on the success successes of our existing services for children and families and to design a shared framework across foster care and prevention services as well as to implement new strategies to improve safety, permanency, and well-being outcomes for New York City children and families. We very much appreciate the City Council's shared commitment to improving those outcomes for youth and families in foster care. And I would like to acknowledge Chair Levin, in particular for his role in shaping the work of the New York City Interagency Foster Care Task Force. I also want to thank the City Council for doubling its support of transition age youth programming from 550,000 to 1.1 million in the current year budget. This funding has been allocated to eight agencies to provide education, employment, and supportive services for older youth in foster care. We just released an annual update on the task force's work and it shows that several of the recommendations have already been completed and many more are well underway. As a few examples, uh, in March of last year, we announced a goal to increase the proportion of children placed with kin with family members or close friends upon entry to foster care to reach 46% by the end of fiscal year 2020 and we're well on our way to achieving that. Um, the proportion of children in foster care who were placed with kin rose from 32.5% at the end of December uh, 2017 to 38.5% by the end of last year. And the increase in kin placements is supported by several initiatives, including the implementation of kinship specialists within our Division of Child Protection, also by a public-private partnership among ACS, foundations, and national experts to help foster care providers improve their kinship practice and the launch of a kinship pilot with two provider agencies to implement innovative kinship strategies. We've also expanded our inventory of non-relative foster homes and in fiscal year 2018, we increased the number of new non-relative foster homes recruited by 32% and that reversed a six year decline in the number of new homes that we've been able to recruit. To advance another recommendation from the task force, ACS has implemented two new tools with foster care agencies to help improve visitation practice. And we're partnering with the parent advocacy organization, RISE, to provide training and technical assistance to foster care agency staff. We've also launched a pilot with two providers to implement strategies to improve the quality of family time. Rooted in our core mission is the belief that every young person in ACS's care should receive the guidance and support they need for success in adulthood. Over the last two years, we've established and expanded a new Office of Employment and Workforce Development Initiatives to expand career readiness, internship, and employment opportunities for older youth in foster care. Six of our agencies have been implementing the Young Adult Work Opportunities for Rewarding Careers, or YA Work Model, with intensive training and support from the Workplace Center at Columbia University. 
Earlier this month, we announced that we're expanding our workforce program with Columbia, adding five more foster care providers, each of which has been trained in the YA work model. Last April, we partnered with New Yorkers for Children and Youth Villages to launch the YV Life Set program in New York City with the goals of improving education, employment, and housing op op outcomes, and helping youth successfully transition to adulthood. More than 200 current and former foster and juvenile youth uh, involved youth have enrolled in the Young Adult Internship Program Plus, YAIP Plus, which has been developed by DYCD in partnership with us at ACS. And more than half of the participating youth completed their internships, many of them hired into permanent jobs, and an additional 30% have continued to advance on their educational goals. Moving on to the very important area of juvenile justice, last October, we launched one of the most groundbreaking juvenile justice reforms in New York State's history, Raise the Age. Before that new law, New York was one of just two states in the country that still, still treated 16 and 17 year old youth as adults in the criminal justice system. Today, 16 and 17 year olds are no longer detained on Rikers Island, and if ordered by a court, they are now held in ACS facilities where they receive education, age appropriate therapeutic and recreational services, and health and mental health care. Newly arrested 16 year olds are now treated as juveniles, having their cases heard either in the family court or in the new youth part of criminal court. And if they're detained, it's either in Crossroads Juvenile Detention Center or one of our non-secure detention facilities where we provide the services they need to get their lives back on track. If adjudicated to placement by the family court, they're placed in small, close to home residential facilities. Our close to home initiative has transformed New York City's approach to juvenile justice over the past six years, and it's become a national and international model. Last month, the Columbia Justice Lab issued a report noting that close to home can and should serve as a roadmap for other jurisdictions to emulate. In the years following close to home implementation, we witnessed juvenile crime, arrests, detention, and placements plummet in the city. From 2008 to 2017, the number of juvenile arrests decreased 70%, from 13,564 to 4,080. Overall admissions to juvenile detention decreased significantly year over year, dropping 64% from fiscal year 20, 27, when nearly 6,000 youth were detained, to only 1,754 in fiscal year 2018. And likewise, the number of New York City youth in juvenile delinquent and juvenile offender placement also decreased almost 90% from 2009 to 2018. We've proactively expanded our array of interventions throughout our juvenile justice continuum to better serve the unique needs of the older youth who are now and prospectively will be in ACS's care under Raise the Age. At Crossroads Juvenile Center, we provide a robust menu of therapeutic, recreational, and vocational services and programming for our young people. And we work with our partners at the Department of Education to provide uninterrupted educational services for every young person. When young people are placed in close to home residential care, a provider is assigned to each individual youth, and those providers now remain with that youth throughout the duration of that young person's placement, including their time on aftercare. This enables providers to develop deeper assessments of youth and family needs and allows providers to create more streamlined service plans based upon those individualized assessments. As you know, ACS partners with the Department of Correction as the state law requires to supervise the youth who have transferred from Rikers Island to Horizon, as well as newly arrested 17 year olds for whom the law does not take effect until October 1st, 2019. While the initial transition had some challenges, the facility is now stable and secure, and youth are attending school, receiving health and mental health services, and participating in a wide array of recreational, vocational, and arts programming. You may also recall that ACS launched an aggressive hiring plan last summer to hire some 700 youth development specialists over two years to work in our secure detention facilities. Thanks in part to outreach and recruitment by the council, we've hired over 250 YDS to date. We are still recruiting and we encourage anyone who's interested and meets the qualifications to apply. 
While we are obligated to investigate every report of maltreatment that we receive through New York State, we are also committed to redressing historical patterns of racial disproportionality in child welfare involvement through a focus on equity in our work and through efforts to strengthen communities that have faced generational patterns of marginalization and disenfranchisement. Our Division of Child and Family Wellbeing aims to engage families before they ever reach the child welfare system by focusing on the factors that contribute to well-being, including health, education, employment, and culture. A large part of this important work is carried out through community and family engagement, through public awareness campaigns, and through subsidized early childhood education, as well as the promotion of equity strategies throughout ACS's work. As we previously discussed with the committees, ACS's Family Enrichment Centers represent an innovative new model for providing comprehensive, community-focused support to families. We're proud to have launched three pilot FECs in 2018 in neighborhoods with high rates of child welfare system involvement. The first center opened last February in our Hunts Point Longwood neighborhood, and it's called Our Place. Shortly thereafter, the CRIB program opened in East New York and then Circle of Dreams in Highbridge opened the doors to the community. Today, these three family enrichment centers are helping communities build connections among residents and offering supports for families who have identified a need to prevent those families from ever coming into contact with the child welfare system. Our community partnership program is an ACS-funded community-based initiative that partners with local communities to support families and engage them with ACS and other city agencies. Through coordinated service referrals, through community-led programs, and through community awareness efforts, the CPPs serve as ambassadors to the community, as ad advocates for families, and help to ensure that the work we do at ACS is equitable and culturally competent. Over the last year, Child and Family Wellbeing has worked to redesign and relaunch those community partnership programs to, build, to better serve families and communities throughout the city. The work of the reconfigured CPPs, which began in January, is rooted in three foundational frameworks. Collective impact, a two-generation approach, and an equity framework. And it gives local organizations the space to network with each other, to share critical information and resources, uh, and provides resources that help families support their children. In the fall of 2017, we launched a citywide safe medication campaign to provide families with tools to help ensure that medications and potentially dangerous household items are stored out of children's reach. As part of the campaign, we partnered with the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to develop informational palm cards and promotional posters to raise awareness of the dangers of unsafe medication storage. And our Child Protective Frontline staff distributes medication lock boxes and bags to families engaged with ACS as needed to help keep medication out of children's reach. And we've also supplied lock boxes to our provider partners to distribute to other families in need. Tragically, a significant proportion of child fatalities in New York City, about 50 a year, are attributed to unsafe sleep practices. To help prevent sleep-related injuries, ACS is partnering with New York City Health and Hospitals to put safe sleep information directly into the hands of new parents. Earlier this month, we announced that parents who give birth in any of Health and Hospitals' 11 delivering hospitals are now receiving a toolkit that includes a onesie, with safe, um, a onesie with safe sleep instructions, a sleep sack or wearable blanket, crib netting to protect from household pests, as well as educational materials about best practices for infant safe sleep, including our own informational video entitled Breath of Life, The How and Why of Safe Sleep, which is also available on our website. Early education provides a solid foundation for healthy social, emotional, and cognitive development for our children and, and helps position them for future academic and social success. You certainly know that New York City has made major investments in high quality, free, and affordable early care and education programs over the last decade, and especially in the last few years. In order to make Early Learn part of the city's continuum of education programs, it's due to transfer to the Department of Education specifically its Division of Early Childhood Education, this summer. As part of the ongoing Early Learn transition, DOE recently released RFPs 
for contracted early childhood education and for early Head Start and Head Start services. And a DOE RFP for family child care is due to be released soon. As that contracted system transfers to DOE, ACS will continue to administer the city's child welfare, the child care voucher system. We'll continue our efforts to improve both the quality and the availability of care in the system, which serves nearly 66,000 children under the age of 12. And we're committed to making child care available to some of the most vulnerable families in New York City, including those who are involved in our child welfare system. We are, as I mentioned earlier, confronting the historically disproportionate impact that the child welfare and juvenile justice systems have had on communities of color. And we are in the process of taking important steps to address equity issues in our work. As part of the agency's work under Local Law 174, we've conducted gender, racial, income, and sexual orientation equity assessments of both our child welfare and our juvenile justice continuums. And we're now working to create and implement an equity action plan to address disparities identified through that assessment. We look forward to sharing our progress in implementing our equity action plan later this year. In 2017, we launched our Office of Equity Strategies within the Division of Child and Family Wellbeing. And our longstanding Racial Equity and Cultural Competence Committee works to promote racial equity throughout the child welfare, juvenile justice, and early care and education systems. Also, all of our child protective staff now learn about implicit bias as part of the core training that they take when they begin their jobs. And ACS recently launched a new e-learning course called Understanding and Undoing Implicit Bias, which is now mandatory for all ACS staff to complete by June. And all direct service staff and supervisors will be required to take a full day instructor-led course on the same topic. We know that there is more to be done, and we are fully committed to identifying and addressing inequities throughout our systems. With implicit bias training, affirming policies, and specific actions to ensure that our services are culturally appropriate, we're working towards correcting the systemic issues that contribute to disproportionality. So as I hope I've explained today, we have strengthened our ability to meet the needs of New York City families, to protect New York City children, and to support our staff, and we're constantly identifying more ways to improve. While we meet the challenges of today, we have also committed to a long-term vision for transforming child welfare to serve our cities, families, and communities, and we are leading an effort to implement that vision nationally. In doing this, we're focusing on what I think are the five key areas of the effort. First, we're using evidence as our North Star. We're not making policy decisions based on hunches, or on what we've always done, but on what we know works and achieves demonstrable results. And then we measure progress in order to constantly improve. Second, in keeping children and youth safe, we are not solely focused on just preventing repeat maltreatment. We are working with a primary prevention lens to reduce maltreatment and juvenile justice involvement working with and within communities. Third, we're looking to create an entire ecosystem of services dedicated to these goals rather than a single agency struggling to achieve it in isolation. And this includes our other government agency partners at all levels. It includes nonprofit providers and the private sector. Fourth, we're looking to create a learning organization, not one vested in the status quo, but one in which the response to making mistakes, mistakes which are inevitable in any large complex system, is to learn from them to make the organization stronger and reduce the risk of future harm. And fifth and finally, we're working to be part of the effort to heal one of the greatest ills in our society, inequities based on race, poverty, gender, sexual identity, among other characteristics. We want to be and to be seen as part of the solution to these longstanding risks in our society. I believe we're in a stronger place today than we were two years ago to meet the critical challenges that our workplace is upon us, but we must be relentless in continuing our forward mechanism. So now let me turn to how the budget is supporting all of the programmatic initiatives I just mentioned. ACS's proposed FY 2020 preliminary budget plan provides for operating expenses of $2.67 billion, of which about $896 million is city tax levy. The budget reflects the transfer of Early Learn NYC to the Department of Education beginning in FY 2020 and is offset by the addition of city funds to continue to support Raise the Age implementation. In the preliminary plan, 
ACS has also received funding in support of the collective bargaining agreements for the majority of our workforce. Like all agencies across the city, we've been asked to identify efficiencies in our budget. We've been able to do so by claiming additional funding under the Title IV-E program, producing a one-time city tax levy, levy savings of $27.7 million in fiscal year 19, and this will have no impact on services for children and families. And as with all city agencies, and as uh, Chair Levin, you referred to, we have received a PEG target. Ours is $68 million over two years. ACS is working with OMB and the Mayor's Office on proposals to address this target. Our intention is to identify savings without reducing essential services or the number of critical frontline staff necessary to keep children safe. As we work to advance the programs and practices that have positioned New York City as a national model for child welfare and juvenile justice reform and to lay the groundwork for the 21st century system that we envision, we are deeply concerned, as we know you are, that the newly proposed state budget cuts, along with historical state budget cuts, threaten to undermine this work. The executive budget released in January at the state level would cut programs that help some of the city's most vulnerable young people, specifically cutting $13 million in state funds to an ACS program that helps families avoid declaring a troubled youth a person in need of supervision or PINs. Last year, 5,000 families received assistance to this program. The state's proposed budget includes a plan to reform PINs in a manner that is very, very troubling to us, both in terms of youth safety and financial impact. The budget proposes both to eliminate our ability to place a PINs youth in foster care if he or she cannot remain safely at home unless a court determines that a youth is se sexually exploited. And it would also eliminate state reimbursement for PINs diversion services. This would impact the safety of those youth who need to be in foster care and it would result in a $13 million state cut to our diversion program. This proposed cut comes in the context of even deeper cuts to child welfare and juvenile justice over the last several years. We are calling on the state to restore the $62 million in support for New York City's foster children that was cut two years ago, and to avoid a budget action this year that would once again decrease state funding for child welfare protection and preventive services by 3%, a loss of about $20 million for New York City's children and families. And of course, we need the state to fully restore close to home funding that was eliminated last year and to enable New York City to be eligible for 100% state reimbursement for raise the age expenses like all other counties in New York State. We also have concerns at the federal level. Title IV-E of the Social Security Act is a federal entitlement and our main federal funding source that funds part of our foster care and adoption services as well as kinship guardianship services and components of our preventive and protective work. We currently have a 4E waiver which allows the city to use 4E resources to support an innovative, flexible funding model for family foster care and evidence-based and evidence-informed interventions designed to improve outcomes for children and families. Our waiver program, which we call Strong Families NYC, has enabled us to lower foster care agency casework and supervisory ratios and caseloads, has allowed us to implement a universal trauma screening in family foster care, and has allowed us to scale up evidence-based models across our systems. A preliminary evaluation shows that the waiver has led to shorter foster care lengths of stay, to lower foster care reentry rates for babies, and to improvements in placement stability. However, under current federal law, all Title IV E waivers nationally expire in September of this year. We are working with other states and localities to advance federal legislation to extend the waivers. The elimination of the waiver authority would undercut our ability to maintain the investments that have produced these positive outcomes. I was in Washington last week to meet with members of Congress and their staff about federal funding for New York City's child welfare work, and in Albany the week before, to meet with legislators to discuss the impact that recent and proposed budget cuts would have on children and families in New York City. I know you all share our concerns and our desire that the state and federal governments fulfill their obligations to New York City's children and families, and we greatly appreciate the Council's support and advocacy in these state and federal efforts. So in conclusion, I thank you for the opportunity to discuss ACS's fiscal year 2020 preliminary budget. 
We are excited about the innovative and groundbreaking work that we're poised to do across all of our programs, fueled by the commitment and professionalism of our ACS staff and our provider partners. Uncertainties created by state and federal governments threaten to hamper these efforts, and we stand with the mayor and the city council in fighting against any potential detrimental effects on our families. I thank the council for your leadership and your steadfast support and look forward to our continued partnership and we are happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Commissioner. I appreciate your testimony in this magazine. A <laughs> um, lot of information. Um, but before I go forward, we've been joined by Councilwoman Barron and Councilmember <coughs> Mark Joe and I from the Bronx. Um, I'm glad to see there's been some improvements. Um, especially since the time I was a caseworker where we were dealing with 25 and 30 case caseloads and people walking around 50 caseloads, which was pretty much impossible to service, service a family with any dedication to resolve any issues. Um, reducing them to an average of 10 says there has been progress that's been made. And how much further do we have to go? Well, it continue to depend on the conversations that we have and how many young people do not go into the system but are offered opportunities that allow them to be productive. And I say all that because um, I was going over we council, we sat down and gone over some of the issues and the questions that we wanted to present today when it came to budget, but even just the system itself. And we've had conversations about the terms that we use that either motivate a child or put a child in a, a mindset that I'm gonna be a failure from the start. So when I look at the juvenile justice money that's being spent over 131 million, um, I want to get an idea what is that money actually going to continue to do for our children in the JJ system, especially raise the age. How are the programs that we've asked about before, how financially are they fruitful to make sure recidivism doesn't happen within our youth? Um, and I also want to know, just to start off, what, how are we being engaged to advocate, uh, whether it's towards the governor or within the system itself, um, message of prevention that doesn't even bring a child into the system, i.e. alternative to incarceration is the term is telling a 14-year-old when you sit with them that their path is in incarceration or path to detention as opposed to how do we have a program for you to be a successful entrepreneur. The thinking of when a child is going through something at 14 to 15, how do we change that, have a new dialogue with them so they think more of themselves so they never think about misbehaving so they come back into a system because no matter how much money we throw at a system, if we don't change the mindsets of the individuals that we're trying to serve, they are doomed to repeat the same behavior. Mm -hmm. So that's where I want to start today's conversation. If you can answer those first three questions and then I want to open it up to my colleagues for, for the rest of this conversation. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair King. So yeah, you raised a number of important issues there. Let me just say a couple things and I'll turn it over to Deputy Commissioner Franco to, uh, to elaborate. So um, first you raised the question of how do we know the programs are working? Um, and that's, that's very important. As I talked about my testimony, um, we are extremely outcome focused and I am a real believer that we have to constantly evaluate and if we de decide we need to make improvements or changes, we need to do that. Um, nothing is perfect. And our responsibility, especially as a steward of public funds and as responsibility for some uh, of the most vulnerable young people in our city, we have a responsibility to make sure we are doing the best we possibly can by them. With regard, so with regard to that, I'll say, uh, first of all, what we do know, if we look at the system as a whole, and I talked about this a little bit in my testimony, um, we can see that we are achieving positive results uh, at sort of the macro level in terms of our entire juvenile justice system. We are seeing juvenile arrests decrease year after year, juvenile admissions to detention decrease year after year, uh, juvenile admissions to our close to home program uh, are going down, um, and recidivism is going down. So big picture, we are keeping more young people out of the juvenile justice system. But we also have to look below that, look at our individual programs and make sure they're working. Some of these are programs that we operate directly within ACS. Some of them are programs we operate uh, jointly with our city partners like uh, DYCD and Department of Education. Um, and so uh, let me turn it over to Deputy Commissioner Franco to talk a little bit about how we monitor our providers to make sure that they are delivering quality services to young people. Thank you, Commissioner. And thank you, Council Member King, for opening the question regarding where we use our resources. And, and I think you heard loud and clear from the Commissioner in his testimony that, for example, placements in close to home has gone down by 90%. I think it's important for us to contextualize 
that back before 2012, there were more than 460 New York City young people in the custody of OCFS at a cost of $285,000 per year. The fact that actually we have now less than 100 young people in New York City on the custody of ACS, close to their families and close to home, is a testament of what the city has done so well. And following up on your question in regard how we make sure that young people are getting the services that they need. First of all, as the commissioner said, our North Star is doing what works. Close to home is based in what is called evidence-based policies. We know that having young people and their families close to each other allow us to work with the young person and the family as part of our therapeutic approach to the work. Um, in addition to that, all of the close to home providers actually have to be evidence-based or evidence-based informed. And I think you and I have this conversation before. If you were to go to any one of the close to home providers, they're either following national standards on their ITM, the Missouri Youth Services Institute, Sanctuary, and other programs that actually have shown to work elsewhere. Um, more important than anything, it's not just what we expect, it's what we inspect. So Close to, home ha Close to Home has a very, very robust system of oversight and monitoring. We actually are in the Close to Home, my team, every month. We actually are in those Close, close to Home sites at night and on weekends just to make sure that they're not just abiding by the best standards, but actually we check that those standards are being implemented consistently. Thank you. Um, we may bounce around going from close to home and raised age because they kind of correlate with one another. One has an impact on the other. So since you were talking about close to home, I know in fiscal year 2018, there was 1,754 admissions. And at that point, there was you were spending $1,688 per person that was in your system. I'd like to know what does that number look like for fiscal year 19 going into 20, and what are we getting for whatever that number is? So your question is the number of admissions for 2018? The cost per person. Now, in 2018, that number was 1688. So in fiscal year 19, per person that's in placement with you, mm -hmm. whether raised the age or close to home, what is that number? And what does that actually get that individual for that number? Yeah, I mean, our contract when close to home, and then Jose, I'm hoping that he can actually chime in, are actually preset per diem rates. So actually, provider get the provider gets paid as part of the contracting and RFP process a rate per day per youth. So that's actually that's standard. That should be the same it was this year to the last year, um, if that's the answer that you want. So I mean, there's a well, per diem rate. Back up, let me back a little bit. So now if you have a child, and you say to hold a child in placement, it costs you $2,000. I'm just throwing out a number. Y'all know what the number mm -hmm. is. Give us that number. What, uh, what is that, that one person getting? Does that include meals, housing? Oh, does, good point. does that good include point. union yeah. costs? What are we getting? Because $131 million is a lot of money. Yeah. So if you tell me there's only 80 people in placement, that's a lot of money. So I would like to get an idea, what are we getting for that money? Okay, I mean, I th I th I'm gonna open up with the programmatic elements, which I know really well. I mean, we're taking care of young people 24 seven. That includes fully, as you said, waking up in the morning, making sure they're taken care uh, at a very low ratio, because actually we achieve public safety by a lot of supervision from our staff to the young person. Uh, immediate includes education, you know, within the Department of Education, includes all the healthcare and medical needs of that young person. And more importantly, includes, as I mentioned before, a very thoughtful way of thinking about changing that person's way of looking at life and developing new skills that would ensure us that they actually, when they go back to the community, they don't come back. There's actually a significant amount of work that happens with the family in close to home, you know, being in the community. We don't make decisions on behalf of young people without including their parents or guardians. And through a very well-known and uh, proven practice of family team conferencing, we ensure that every decision when things are going well or when things are not going well are actually done by bringing the whole team together consistently. Right, so uh, what I'd like to do is get back to you with, uh, make sure we're giving you accurate information about both the per capita cost of um, close to home program and also the breakdown of the budget. What I'm being told now is that uh, the per diem cost for a young person in our limited secure placement program is $756 per day, and in our non-secure placement program is $478 per day. Okay. 
Thank you. But we'll, we'll confirm uh, those numbers, and we can also get you the overall breakdown of the close-to-home budget. I, I, I'd appreciate if we, if we can, because mm -hmm. if we're going to advocate and tell the governor and the state you impose this law on us and we're doing the best we can, then we got to be part, we got to be partners, and New York can't stand alone by itself. While you're partners with other counties, other 61 uh, counties that are whatever that numbers across the state, and we are out to fend for ourselves, it's only fair um, that we that we do it the right way. Um, just another question before I turn it over. Um, there's been a number of conversations when we f when we first implemented with the unions that have been involved. And the new youth worker that was supposed to come out of there and the correction officer was still in there. I know you have a plan that you were looking to phase out and get these youth specialists in there um, by January of next year. Um, but right now, your goal was 700. You say you have 250. January's coming around really fast. <laughs> I'd like to know what is your plan actually to meet that goal, and do you really think you are going to meet that goal? Sure. Yes, well, um, as you know, uh, the state law required that uh, the facility that was serving Rikers youth and 17-year-olds who were not still under close to home, under um, RCA, excuse me, um, had to be cooperated by the Department of Correction and ACS. And so because Horizon is a facility that's serving those young people, Department of Correction has been staffing that facility together with ACS, providing programming support and case management, as you know, uh, Chair King. Um, our plan has been, and, and we are on track, we believe, to achieving this, that we will begin to transition some youth development specialists into Horizon next month. And they will be working side by side with uh, uh, Department of Corrections correction officers for some period of time. And then uh, our goal and our expectation is that we will be able to take over um, full management of Horizon by early next year. We hope by January, February of next year. Um, we have hired thus far about 250 um, YDS. In fact, uh, just today, uh, I spoke at the orientation of a new class of 50 new youth development specialists, which was great. Um, and we are moving along well in that process. Um, and we believe we are on track to hiring the full complement of 700 by the end of the year that will be necessary in order for us to fully staff Crossroads, fully staff Horizon, as well as some other functions like uh, transport and, and the court system. So um, we, are, we believe we are on track to the commitments that we've made. Do you, are there any financial challenges to meeting those goals, or you you got you were good? No, we have gotten very good support from uh, the mayor's office and OMB for uh, the funding that we've needed for our YDS uh, hiring program. How is the relationship now with um, corrections officers, 371? How have they been part of this conversation up to now? We have been working very closely with them. In fact, we've already started discussions with the unions about the transition of YDS. Uh, into Horizon next month. Uh, we coordinate very closely with, with both of the unions. Um, and, uh, I, I, and certainly our, our working relationship, I'll let uh, Deputy Commissioner Franco speak to this in more detail, but um, our working relationship, cert certainly at the agency level between us and corrections leadership has been very good. Um, and I believe on the ground that uh, the work of the correction officers uh, in relationship to our program counselors and case managers at Horizon has also been very good. But the Deputy Commissioner can speak to this in more yeah, detail. Thank you, Commissioner, for reminded, reminding everyone that actually we have been actually working shoulder to shoulder with the Department of Corrections since day one, actually before October 1st. We have a significant footprint of case managers and program counselors. Actually, the number of program counselors recently actually expanded to make sure that actually we were supporting the Department of Corrections and engaging young people in activities, and that's actually going really well. So there's actually in every one of the living units at Horizons, there's actually a footprint of ACS staff as we speak, and that will grow, as the Commissioner said, when we start bringing in the YDSs. Okay, um, thank you. I'm a, one more question, then I'm going to open up to the committee to share questions. Now, you heard early on in my opening statement in regards to the flash indicators and that ACS removed horizons off of that list, even though DOC reports that there was an average daily population of 16, 17 years in their custody from October, December, and 28th of about 80. Can you confirm that? But why did y'all take them off that list anyway, horizons off the list? Please. Yeah, no, I, I think we want to make clear that actually the reporting of Horizons is the obligation of the Department of Corrections, so they actually are reporting those statistics under their reports. But actually, my understanding is in the most recent quarterly report, we actually took the information from the Department of Corrections and made it available in that report. So even though the Department of Corrections has their own set of metrics, 
we're actually now taking that information, which is a little different than the way we do it, and making it available in our, sig our report. Okay, and I think w once we get clarity, we do, then we can actually get a break that goes back to the earlier question. How much are we spending per person who is under your care? Mm -hmm. um, because if they're not on your report, we can't even judge it in a budget report. So thank you for that. Thank you for that answer, and we look forward to getting more information later on. Um, right now, I want to open it up um, to my colleagues on the committee. First up is from Queens, Mary Gredinger. Thank you, uh, Chair King. Uh, born in the Bronx, though, full disclosure. I just want to make that clear. Um, Commissioner, um, I just want to ask you a question. I'm delighted to see that uh, the city has hired 1,100 new uh, Child Protective Services employees over the last two years, um, and that um, the caseload is down to just over 10 uh, per caseworker, which is really uh, quite something. My question uh, to you is, uh, how are you doing? I know that you, you talked about retention and training, and how are you doing? I, I know we've had discussions about this at previous hearings and privately uh, about how difficult this job is to go in and to be with families that might be in some sort of turmoil, especially with children involved. Can you talk about the retention rate a little more? Yeah, absolutely. Um, obviously, the you know, the, the average caseload of our child welfare investigators is a function of how many staff we have and how many reports we have to investigate. Um, and the number of staff we have is a function of how many we hire and how many uh, retain and, and, and stay for, uh, for longer periods of time in, in the job. And uh, it was uh, a great concern of mine when I started two years ago uh, that I felt we were losing too many uh, child protective specialists too early um, in their, in their uh, term of service. Uh, and that was, uh, bad from a number, number of perspectives, obviously. It was not good that staff were not staying. It was not good that we were retaining staff with the experience to do the work. Um, and uh, I was concerned that it, it would have an impact on the quality of the work. So we launched a number of initiatives to try to address uh, the attrition rate. Um, and many of the things I talked about in my testimony, the uh, improved technology, uh, better transportation options, the new uh, tablets and, and software that are now available to all the child protective specialists, um, uh, a number of staff appreciation things that we have done, improving, looking at wellness in the workplace. We've done quite a number of things. Um, and I'm happy to say that we are seeing the impact we hoped we would see on, on staff retention. Um, we are seeing uh, fewer staff leave in that critical first year when we used to lo lose a lot. We still lose more than I would like, and we're not where I'd like us to be. But we are moving the in the right direction. We are losing fewer uh, child protective specialists in their first year of service. We are losing fewer up to the second year and losing fewer up to the third year. We monitor it by essentially entry cohort. So we look at the staff that started in, say, 2016 and how many are still on board in 2017, 2018, and now going into 2019. Um, and what we are seeing is that at each of sort of the key benchmarks, one year, two years, three years in, we are seeing uh, fewer child protective specialists leaving. So we are moving in the right direction. I think uh, the things we're doing are having a positive impact. Um, but we have certainly have more to do, and, and, and also fundamentally, of course, just having lower caseloads make a big difference, right? It makes right. the job more doable, and, uh, and I think that, and I hear a lot, actually, from our frontline staff that that really is affecting um, the, their feeling about the quality of work they can do and their level of satisfaction with the job. Okay. Um, just one more question, uh, Mr. Chairs. Um, I saw that. Okay, that was answered. I'm sorry. Um, okay, I got my answers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council Member. Um, we also have been joined from Queens, Council Member Adrian Adams. Um, next up for questioning would be Council Member Brown from the Big Island of Brooklyn. <laughs> island. It's, a, it's an island. It's a part of Long Island. The Battle of Long Island was fought in Brooklyn. <laughs> Yes, so he's absolutely correct. Thank you to the chairs and thank you to the panel for coming. Uh, in your testimony, you talk about, you make reference to the historical patterns of racial disproportionality, uh, particularly in child care, child welfare involvement. What has your agency done in terms of its staffing to likewise address that historical pattern, those historical patterns. Mm -hmm. If I were to look at your organizational chart, what would I see in terms of the ethnicity of the persons 
at the highest levels? Um, that's something, uh, council member, that's very important to us. Uh, and it's important that we uh, have representat good representation of the populations and the communities we serve at all levels in the organization. And that's something that we strive to accomplish. Um, and I think, uh, I think generally we're doing well in that area. But again, that's an area where I don't think we can ever be satisfied that we're, we, we're where we need to be. So when we look at our recruitment at any level in the organization, from frontline up to senior management, um, one of the things that we take into consideration is the diversity and making sure that we are representative of the communities that we're serving. Could I get an organizational chart and uh, the numbers that are associated with each of those levels? Certainly. Very good. Can you describe for me briefly the distinction between um, foster care support and foster care services? Uh, yeah, I will ask uh, Deputy Commissioner Farber to do that. I will say, uh, you know, our, our goal initially, I'd say at a high level, our goal initially obviously is to keep children out of foster care wherever possible. Um, and um, that's why we're happy to see that the, the number of children in foster care in New York City has continued to okay. decline. But when children are in foster care, um, our goal is, first of all, to make sure that they're getting all the services that they need, and then also that they can return to their families or achieve a permanent family uh, situation as quickly as possible. And so, so what's the difference between the services, which is at 569, uh, and the support, which is at 51? Million. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, our chief finance officer, Mr. Mercado. To I mean, they're two distinct categories. Yes. So I wanted to know what's different. From a budget perspective, I, I appreciate your question. Yeah, hi. Um, the support services include family, like uh, our uh, policy, um, excuse me, I'm a little nervous. <laughs> first That's time. okay. Welcome. Policy. This is your first time? Yes. Oh, Speak, we'll, you'll be back again. Uh, <laughs> thank, thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, our foster care support actually is our support staff, staff specifically our lawyers, our, pro, our policy okay. program, budget people, audit okay. people, things of that nature. Okay, I'm on the clock, so thank you for that. Can you briefly tell me about your adoption services program? What, how do we try to encourage parents to adopt children? Thank you, Jackie. I'm Julie Farber, Deputy Commissioner for Family Permanency Services. So, I mean, our, our first goal typically um, is for children to be able to be reunified with their families. And then when that's not possible, we look at alternative options for permanency. And we look at both kinship guardianship, because there is now a, you know, a kin gap option um, uh, where you can become a permanent guardian and, and receive financial support and all of that. Um, and then there's also the option of adoption. And so all of those options are presented to foster parents and to, and to parents um, and to families. Um, and so what would be the attraction for a person who has a foster child to uh, be incentivized to go all the way through to adoption? Well, I think um, you know a, a primary incentive of most of our foster parents is is wanting to care for a child, whether it's a you know a relative um, and and it's they're caring for another family member, um, or even if it's a non-relative that they're they're looking to provide a loving home for a child in need. Um, and then in addition, uh, we are fortunately able to provide um, financial and other service supports um, for families, because these are children who have experienced trauma and, and have you know, special needs and so forth. And so there are financial subsidies that come with either an adoption or a kinship guardianship, which we call KinGap. Okay, and finally, uh, can you talk about the relationship that your department has with CUNY in terms of ensuring that there are slots for children who are in foster care to be able to go to the CUNY, into the CUNY system? What is that current number? How do we make sure that all children in foster care and their families know about it? And how can we increase that number? Um, thank you for asking that question. Um, that's something uh, that we've been doing uh, a lot of work on um, in great partnership um, with CUNY. So there are several hundred kids in foster care who are in college, either in CUNY or elsewhere, um, you know, elsewhere around the state. Some of them are out of state, um, which is great. With CUNY, we have a particular uh, and very special partnership that we call the dorm program or the Fostering College Success Initiative. And right now there's about 120 young people in that program and they are residing in dorms on campus 
and getting special supports, including tutoring and social support and um, just sort of a sense of community um, that is built around them through a partnership with CUNY and, uh, and the New York Foundling. Those students also um, are benefiting from a mentorship program that we have in partnership with Goldman Sachs, um, in which Goldman Sachs employees are providing mentoring to the young people. And how many, what are your plans to expand this program? What numbers are you looking to increase over the time? So the program started, um, had just about 40 young people in its first year at Queens College. Um, I think it grew to 93 uh, youth in the next year. Uh, and then currently um, the program is at about 122 youth. So do you have a number that you're annually looking to increase the program? So we're in the process of sort of analyzing that now. And most importantly, thank you, Mr. Chair, how are we making sure that children and their families know about this program? Because I've spoken to families and they don't know that it exists. We know they perhaps can't all get in at this point. Of course, when, when we're successful and we get CUNY to be back as tuition free, it won't be an issue. But until we reach that point, how are we making sure that families know about this option to um, apply. Well, just to clarify, for the kids in foster care, that tuition is covered. Correct. Um, so and once we get tuition free, it'll be open to everybody, so it won't be an issue. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, but but so, so there's a tremendous amount of outreach that happens um, to our foster care agencies. We have monthly meetings with the education specialists at all of the foster care agencies where they are informed about not only the CUNY dorm program, but the men many, many other um, education initiatives that we have. We also um, have created a foster parent guide to education that has a, a lot of information for foster parents. We also um, provide information directly to youth. We, we try and use, there's many different venues um, uh, through which we try to share this information um, so that young people are aware and, and so that their case planners are aware. Great, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And before um, we go to Holden, I just want to add, you, you mentioned in regards to what information is being shared with young people in the system to know they can go to college. You know, there are, you might talk about earlier about certain terms and advertisements that we use. You know, there's been a conversation I've been having for the last three years, we passed in the City Council about what the Constitution stated with the three-fifth clause compromise. We had established a system of inequities from the male white counterparts who created the system to the black slave in the system. Today, we still have those same inequities based on the system that created a rule and conversations and agendas move like that. So when you have the conversation all we're talking about from school to prison pipeline, we should be advocating if you have a foster care program to college, we should know about that freely, just like the advertising and marketing of from schools to prison pipeline conversations that people have across. As a chair, I get a number of conversations about the juvenile foster care system is a pipeline to the juvenile system, which is a pipeline to the adult jail system. So this is the mentality of what I talked about alternative to detentions and incarceration. ACS, we count on you to have a paradigm shift in your conversation when it comes to our children to tell them how great they are. And it doesn't start when they're 14. It starts when that child is three and four and five. So as you partner up or how you partner with the Department of Education that there's better messaging with the kid or the child early on so they never even come into your system, then we don't even have these stressful conversations why you haven't taken care of communities of color. Because when I hear black males make a 5% teens, make a 5% of New York City system, but they make up over 43% of the juvenile justice system, something is wrong. Because not every black child out here is messing it up. So it's the little things that this unbalanced system utilizes to make sure that there's somebody who has to go into this system. We're asking you for your help today to have a paradigm shift in all of your conversation and all of your marketing to make sure that that young black child, a young black boy, has a chance, an equal chance to their white counterparts in the city of New York. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, I hear you and I agree. And, um, and that's actually, that's why we have um, built our Division of Child and Family Wellbeing on the foundation of our early childhood program. Because you're absolutely right, we have to start from very young children and make sure they're getting positive messaging, not negative messaging. And so we really see it as a continuum from early care and education through uh, you know, teenage programs to adulthood. And we are trying to incorporate 
what we call a primary preventive approach, meaning goal is to avoid child welfare involvement or juvenile justice involvement by working with young people and their families as early as possible from the perspective of building their capacity to uh, have strong families support their children and uh, have their children be successful and minimize the possibility of ultimately being involved in the child welfare system, being involved in the ju juvenile justice system. It is a paradigm shift. You're absolutely right. Um, it's something that we have committed ourselves to, but we really need to continuously look at everything we do as an agency, and for, frankly, everything we do as a city to make sure we're aligned with that perspective. I think that's absolutely right. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, it's amazing how you turned around the agency. Um, just reading this, it, it's uh, truly remarkable. I want to congratulate you. Um, well, thank you. We, we have a long way to go, but we're I know, in the right I know. Direction. But listen, uh, there's some very innovative um, measures you've taken so far with the tablets and the um, the Safe Measures dashboard. I want to just ask a question about that software. That's in real time, so when you you um, input the information, a supervisor can see it immediately. Yes, actually, the information is pulled from the state system. The state has a system called Connections, which is uh, the state child welfare system of record that we are required to use. Safe Measures pulls data from the state system and then presents it, but it presents it, you're right, simultaneously from every level from the caseworker to theoretically up to me. Mm -hmm. um, so at whatever level in the organization, staff, supervisors, managers, directors, and so on, can see in, in real time the uh, so, so would that software trigger an alert? Let's say something is uh, like a red flag, and you would see it, or yes, yeah. or, or the super. Yeah, I, I, you know, I'd be having a lot of red flags if I were seeing them. But All certainly, right. yes, the supervisors and managers can see them, and if they need to, then do some work with their line staff. They that empowers them to do that. That's great. Uh, and these enhanced training sites, um, did they exist before you opening up two, or you did open them? They the simulation sites. We've never had them uh, at ACS. We of uh, course have done training. Uh, but it's been classroom training. We have done mock interviews, we've done mock court proceedings, but we've never actually had a facility that truly replicates what it's like to walk into a family's home, to walk into a courtroom. And now with the simulation sites, we will have those. Yeah, and that's so valuable, we were talking about in criminal justice too, to have that, that atmosphere of, of a real working you know, location. Uh, so and, I, yes, I like and, that. Just and it will uh, include detention centers as well. So we'll yeah, just, just another question, I'm trying to, Beat the clock here. Um, what's the average stay in the in the foster system, foster care? Do we because you've been getting it down, but do we have an average? So um, most children return home to their families, right. um, and and for those that don't, um, the majority are um, adopted or or go home to kinship guardianship. Fortunately, the numbers of kids who age out has been coming down and down and down. We've had, I think, and my colleague Andrew White will correct me, but I think it's somewhere around a 38% reduction in the numbers of kids in care who have been in care for two years or more over the last four or five years. That's great, that's great. Um, Six years, Andrew tells me. Okay, great. Uh, we, we had some trouble at Horizons and Crossroads initially. Um, I know about Horizons. I don't know much about Crossroads. We're going, we're going to visit, I think, in, in, in April. Um, what was done at Crossroads to improve the situation and, and tell me how it's improved? Is it just hiring a specialist or? Uh, well, no, there are a number of things and I'll let Deputy Commissioner Franco speak to the details, but the challenge, you know, the challenges Horizon I think you're more familiar with and there was a lot more public right. discussion about. Right. Um, the challenges at Crossroads had to do with the fact that because we had dedicated Horizon to the Rikers youth and the 17-year-old youth, that meant that we had to manage all of the other populations in the juvenile justice system within one other secure detention facility, Crossroads. So we had multiple groups of kids with, of different statuses, um, and of course the population was larger than it had been prior to the implementation of Raise the Age. So both the population and the range of populations we were managing created challenges, but there's a lot that we've done to address that, and I'll let De Deputy Bishop Franco to speak to that. Yeah, and I think you mentioned both facilities. Um, Horizons, which you're familiar, and you went to visit with some of your colleagues. Um, things are actually getting much better. I think actually the Department of Correction has reported uh, like more than a 50% reduction in the use of force. Crossroads, we had our challenges too. I mean, we were suddenly moving every young person from every neighborhood in New York City into a smaller facility. And on top of that, Raised the Age created a new category called, called adolescent offenders, who actually had to be managed just on their own, separate from juvenile delinquents and juvenile offenders. So imagine suddenly having 
the most challenging 16-year-olds in New York City, all of them having to live within the same living unit. So it was rocky at the beginning. Uh, our trends are actually getting much better. The number of incidents continues to go down. And as we implement some of our therapeutic approaches to help young people learn how to regulate their emotions and behavior, as we get YDSs that are amazingly good at connecting to young people, though we're turning the curve and things are getting much better. Things will get even better when on October 1st, 2019, the system is a juvenile justice system and we can recalibrate and move ki kids easier in 2020 between the two facilities. All right, just um, one question, Commissioner. Um, there's, in CPS, there's been, a, uh, I think, a high turnover rate in the, um, in the supervisors um, because they don't get overtime is that, and some of their subordinates might get more with overtime? Um, Supervisors do get overtime. They do managers, get over the managers. We have our hierarchy is um, child protective specialist, supervisor level one, supervisor level two, and then child protective managers. Um, the, manager, the manager, because they're okay. managerial, uh, do not. Um, we actually have not had, I, I would say, I don't think significant uh, turnover. Actually, we've had more stability at the more senior levels. The issue of managers not getting overtime is an issue, I think, for managers no, across no, it's, the board. It's, I, I understand that, but we um, have the notes that are, it says differently, but then we'll, we'll check on that. Okay, uh, we, well, we yeah. can confirm that. We can yeah, discuss that right. with you okay. at the staff level, but I, I, don't, I don't believe that's a significant issue. For okay, us. thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Holden. We'll turn it over to Chair Levin right now. Thank you very much, Chair King. Um, Commissioner, thank you very much for your testimony. So I, I have a, a few questions that I'd, I'd like to uh, go through. Um, uh, first off, I, I think just as a, a general question here, um, we are seeing this large peg uh, coming from OMB. Um, I mean, did they consult with ACS um, before arriving at a, a number of 7%, which, and, and how did they arrive at that number? Because as I said in my, in my opening statement, um, HRA and, and, and DHS have like a, you know, 1% or less than 1% peg, and, um, you know, this, this puts a huge, huge burden on ACS. Yeah. No, I very much appreciate your concern, uh, Chair Levin. Um, no, o OMB did not consult with us or, to my knowledge, other city agencies mm -hmm. in establishing the amounts of the pegs. We are working with, o with OMB on determining how we're going to meet the peg, um, and we're in active uh, discussions with them right now. And uh, the goal is, and I think actually um, the OMB director spoke to this a couple weeks ago when she testified, um, ACS, like some of the other human services agencies, have access to a number of state and federal revenue streams. And so um, our hope is, as much as we're able to do that, to utilize that revenue to meet the PEG target so that we don't have to um, have an impact on, on programming. And certainly there's a commitment that there will not be an impact on our frontline, you know, uh, sort of core safety responsibilities. But that's um, not, um, that's not uh, state and federal dollars currently going towards programming? No. Uh, we, have, we have some revenues that we've been able to actually, as we've already done, to meet our savings target. Uh, it's basically unexpended state or federal revenues that we can put towards meeting these, these targets. Okay. Um, okay. I, I'm, I'm very concerned. But you have not been able, you have, have you identified what your pegs are going to be or? Not, not specifically yet. We're still working with OMB on that. Okay. And I said this to um, Commissioner Banks as well. You know, there's an there's a institutional issue here, uh, not directed just at ACS or, or DSS, but um, at the administration as a whole. In the past, uh, when we had PEGs under the Bloomberg administration, um, my recollection is that we, uh, those PEGs were put forward in the preliminary budget so that we were able to discuss it at the preliminary budget, work through the issues uh, throughout the budget process. Um, for uh, the administration to announce that they were going to do pegs at the preliminary budget, uh, $750 million, 12% of that's coming from ACS, and then and then wait and, and then and then uh, wait until the executive budget to put those forward puts uh, the public, the council, advocates, clients, recipients of services, um, kind of on their heels a little bit when these pegs come forward uh, because there's going to be less time to react to them. So that's just a, something if you could take that back to OMB, that would be very helpful because um, uh, there's a lot of frustration on our end 
Um, uh, and I can tell you, you know, the speaker is particularly incensed about the peg to ACS being so disproportionately high. Okay, I appreciate that. And, and I, I am certainly, too. I will certainly take it back to OMB. Okay. Um, uh, there was a, a question about um, last year's uh, 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 budget agreement for FY19. As you can see, um, uh, we were informed, and this is, you know, the speaker, our finance director, and our chief of staff um, from the mayor that there would be about eight million, seven point eight million dollars. Uh, to implement foster care recommendations. That's 3.3 .3 for kinship navigators, 2.8 for family visiting uh, services, and 1.7 for workplace empl workforce employment uh, to support foster care agencies preparing youth for the workforce. These were all, we were very excited. Uh, the speaker came back. To, I'm on the budget negotiating team. It was like at the last minute, he says, they agreed to $7.8 million for some of the foster task force recommendations. And obviously, to date, um, you know, less than a million of that has been spent. And I just, you know, a little frustrated with that and um, uh, was wondering what the story is there. Yeah. Um, well, I, I know we've had some discussions at the staff level about this. Mm -hmm. um, it appears there was some miscommunication. All, uh, what, all we know is we at ACS were never informed uh, by OMB after budget adoption that we were expected to self-fund at that, at that level. Um, if we had been, I have to say, I'm not sure how we would have done it because we would have had to take money from other uh, mm -hmm. programmatic initiatives. But anyway, we, we weren't. Um, what we were uh, told was that we um, had the authority if we wanted to initiate uh, pilot programs, which is what we did at, at the budget level that we were able to identify um, funding to do. And so we launched them in the two areas, as you know, of kinship and family visitation, uh, and then also in the, in the area of transition age use, but the, that's where the council had put additional money into the budget. So, so as far we, as I'm, oh, go ahead. Sorry, so I, I'll say is we, we did what we, uh, basically ba what, what was communicated to us uh, after the budget was adopted. So as, as far as I'm concerned, uh, uh, OMB owes ACS about $7 million for FY19. <laughs> So um, I'm going to have to take that up at the OMB hearing uh, and in further discussions with the mayor's office. But And I'll obviously report this back to the speaker. But if you could also communicate that to OMB as well, that we're quite irate about this um, because uh, it wasn't just uh, one person. It was numerous people in that meeting that uh, had that takeaway that there would obviously it was rather specific. So um, it, would be, it would be helpful. Thanks. Okay, we'll do that. Um, um, you know, in terms of new needs, you know, the, uh, looking back at the last 11 plans, um, there, there have only been, so this is prior to your tenure, obviously, um, that um, there have been uh, only three new needs put forward during those 11 plans, and they were usually in response to, you know, an incident that had come up during the preceding months. Um, and so, so we would... We would like to we would like to see kind of new needs put for I mean obviously it's a tough it's a difficult budget uh, environment right now to do that but um, but I think it's important that we are putting the resources out there for new needs um, uh, and obviously that this might you know might be a private discussion between ACS and OMB but. Um, we would love to see ACS really push for new needs, such as fair futures or other new needs um, that uh, that we think can, can benefit the the children that are um, that have involvement with ACS. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, and uh, I, I've only been in this role for a couple of years, but I did I have worked for the city and other agencies and other positions, so I have watched the process. Um, and I think in a typical year, this is in some ways not a typical, at least not typical of recent years, um, I, think, I think new needs tend to show up more in the executive budget than the preliminary budget, and that's been the case for, for ACS. Um, this is a particularly, as you acknowledged, uh, Chair Levin, this is a particularly difficult budget year, um, so I don't know what, uh, what will be possible, but we uh, were certainly in discussions with OMB about uh, a number of areas um, and... Um, uh, you know, they, decisions all get made and, and reflected in the executive budget. Have you uh, and your team identified potential new needs? We've raised a number of, of issue areas with OMB. Uh, you know, some of them obviously 
depend on what happens with the state and federal funding issues we talked about. Yeah. Um, the state issues will know, well, assuming there's an on-time state budget, we'll know in a week uh, what the outcome of that is. The federal 4 issue is, is more complicated because we may not know until as late as September, basically after the city budget is closed. Yeah. Uh, and that's going uh, to be tricky because uh, you know, we'll have to sort of think about how we deal with that. But, um, but yes, we are in discussion with OMB about a number of different areas. Um, a couple more questions here. Um, uh, there have been reports recently about physical fighting and overcrowding inside the Children's Center, the Nic Nicholas Capetta Children's Center in Manhattan, which serves as the official foster care intake center for ACS. Um, employees have said that they are particularly concerned about a dangerous mix of young children and babies with special needs living alongside uh, teens and in some cases even adults. Um, what what's the status right now? I mean, obviously there was a um, a decision that was that was released by uh, uh, a, a judge uh, in family court um, that um, that held the agency in contempt, I believe, mm -hmm. um, and uh, raised a number of issues. I think we're going to be having a hearing next month uh, to examine these further. But can you can you tell us what's going on right now at the Children's Center and what's happened over the last uh, several weeks? Um, and uh, is there, I mean, is there an additional, um, is there an additional budgetary need here um, that we should be looking at? Mm -hmm. um, no, I appreciate you raising that. It is an area that has been uh, a major focus for, for all of us and, and particularly for me um, in recent weeks and months. Um, the Children's Center uh, is actually our only directly operated ACS facility um, for young people who, um, when they are removed from a home because they are uh, at risk of, of serious harm um, and we don't have an immediate foster care placement for them, the Children's Center is the facility um, that, uh, that we use as a temporary residence. Most young people are there for a very short period of time, usually less than 72 hours. Um, but in, in, recent, uh, in recent months and uh, years, a couple of years, um, we've had an increased population of older teenagers, and actually some even in their early 20s, um, who uh, have come into the Children's Center, have complex needs, are difficult to place in a foster home, um, and therefore they have tended to stay at the Children's Center for a longer period of time. And that has resulted, as you said, in the overall census, the overall number of children or, or, or young people at the Children's Center uh, going up. Um, and then uh, you alluded to the incident that I know got a lot of, uh, of media coverage in the last couple weeks, and while I can't talk to the details of that, and they're confidential, but I can say uh, it was very concerning, and we have done uh, an intensive review of that situation, that child situation, uh, and uh, frankly all of the time that, that young person spent at the Children's Center, and we are developing recommendations for changes in policy and protocol to make sure that that never happens again. Um, uh we are very focused on two things, really. One is making sure that every child at the Children's Center is getting the appropriate level of, of care, both medical care and all other support services that they need. Um, and second, to make sure that uh, children and, and staff at the Children's Center are safe. And so in the last few weeks, we've done a number of things uh, from both of those perspectives. Um, our agency medical director, Dr. Angel Mendoza, has done um, a review of every other special needs uh, young person there to make sure they're receiving appropriate care. I'm happy to say um, that that report that analysis suggested that they were. Um, we have brought, from a safety and security perspective, we brought additional uh, of, of our ACS special officers into the Children's Center to provide additional security within the facility. Um, we also have enhanced partnership with NYPD uh, to ensure safety in the surrounding uh, community and, and the external environment. Um, we have brought uh, additional senior level leadership from ACS into the facility. Our Deputy Commissioner uh, Wynette Saunders is now uh, working very closely with Deputy Commissioner Farber and her team, uh, specifically around um, security, safety, and programming issues at the Children's Center. Um, we are very shortly, in just a matter of days actually, we are bringing on board a new uh, Assistant Commissioner for Residential Care at the Children's Center who will be overseeing all of the residential services there. Uh, and someone who has extensive experience in, in residential uh, care programs. Um, we are very close to hiring an outside consultant to come in and give us sort of an outside set of eyes to look at the, at the Children's Center and give us some additional recommendations. 
Um, and then to address the specific issue that you mentioned of sort of not just the high number, but also the, the age groups and, and, and range of, of young people there, we are looking at potential alternative facilities where we might be able to um, move some of the young people to Children's Center to reduce the census and, and do a better job of, of managing different populations in different places. Um, we also, you know, many, many of the young people who are there have needs that really should be addressed by other service systems. Um, some of them have severe mental health or behavioral needs and really ought to be served in programs operated by the State Office of Mental Health. There are some young people there and actually uh, throughout our foster care system who have developmental disabilities, uh, who at the age of 21 um, are supposed to be the responsibility of the State Office of People with Developmental Disabilities. We've historically had a difficult time, frankly, getting those state agencies to take responsibility for young people that really should be served in their systems and not ours. Um, but more recently, and actually with OPWD, we've been in litigation with them for a number of years about that exact issue. Um, with regard to the Office of Mental Health, we actually are now in, engaged in an intensive process with them and with the state Office of Children and Family Services to design uh, some new service systems for young people with uh, serious and complicated mental health and behavioral health issues. Um, and we're hoping that too will provide some additional resources. So there are many things that we're doing to address this. It is a very important priority um, and making sure that the young people that are there, our staff that are there are safe, and that the young people are receiving the best quality of care is uh, absolutely critical to us. And so what specifically has changed like in the last, in the last week or two? Is it the um, additional leadership support, mm -hmm. um, additional uh, special officers for security purposes. Um, you may have some additional I items as well. Sure, um, there's some changes, and, and Deputy Commissioner Saunders maybe could, could speak to some of these, um, but there's also some changes being made around the actual security protocols um, as well. Um, and then uh, kind of from a, from a, 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 a step, taking a step further back and looking at the kind of longer trajectory of the Children's Center, um, there's, over time, the census has increased um, from a few years ago. And so what, what is different about, um, what's different about the overall picture that would lead to an increase in the census of the Children's Center when, you know, the number of uh, youth in foster care continues to decline, uh, the number of preventive services continues to go up, um, uh, 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 you know, particularly uh, evidence-based uh, preventive slots continues to increase, um, our investment continues to increase in preventive services. Um, why, why is the census continue to go up at the Children's Center? Well, um, so like the commissioner mentioned, um, the primary issue that has emerged over the last number of years is a little bit of a shift in the population where there is a, a group of teens um, who are over the age of 14 and who present with issues um, and serious mental health issues, developmental delays, and so forth, whose needs really should be met in either the OMH or OPWDD systems. And, and so the commissioner listed out a number of the strategies that we're working on to move those young people out of the Children's Center, because most of the kids leave the Children's Center within a few days. But, but what, uh, there wasn't that population with serious mental health needs several years ago, or is that, I mean, I, I'm, is that not a, a population that uh, you know would be would would be somewhat persistent based on the, just the kind of nature of mental mental health issues? So it's become a more significant population, um, which is why we're actively working with OCFS, OMH, and DOHMH actually on looking at new models um, for serving this group of young people. There are two other things I guess I would add. One is while the overall population of young people in foster care has dropped, as we've talked about, um, that's also led to a shift in the composition. Um, and so we, are, we have seen a shift uh, in the direction of, of the older youth with more complex needs. So right, and that, that, would, that would maybe shift the, the proportion, but I wouldn't think that that would shift the, the, the kind of base number of, of youth in, at the Children's Center. And, you know, I, I could, you know, it makes sense that it would be a, 
higher proportion, but um, and that would that would have an impact on, on obviously on, on service and programming, um, and you know service delivery. But but I, I just still don't understand why. Right. What you know nothing in the greater population. I, I don't know why there would be more people between the ages of 14 and 21 now that have a serious mental health need than there would have been four or five years ago. Right. Well, it's, it's a function of how many young people we have that have those needs and, and what facilities we have to accommodate them. Mm -hmm. And we, we talked about the issues of the state systems uh, that we believe should be taking responsibility. The other thing uh, that we've experienced, and this really has been just in the last uh, year or two, is we have lost some of our residential care providers. Right. Um, you know, we've been very successful in New York City in reducing the proportion of our foster care population that's in residential care. It's only about 9% today, which is much lower than the rest of the state, much lower than the nation. Yeah. Um, but uh, a couple of our residential providers, as I think you probably know, over the yeah. last year, year and a half, uh, for various reasons, have pulled out of the, that, um, uh, that component of the system. So we've lost right. some of the resources that we had that would otherwise have been appropriate for these young people. Okay, I mean, that's something that, like, really we should be uh, examining whether we have the capacity and the, the appropriate type of facilities, appropriate type of programming, a type of appropriate type of support services um, to, to reissue those contracts, um, you know, as quickly as possible to, you know, to, to bring on capacity. We, we very much agree, um, and we, you know, as we, as part of our um, re-upping of the, the foster care uh, program as a whole will be looking at this, but that's a couple years away, and mm -hmm. this is a more urgent need, obviously, right. so we're also looking at things we can do in the short term right. uh, to both strengthen the residential care providers that we have and see if there are ways that we can expand that part of the system. Right. I mean, it, you know, residential programs uh, present their own challenges. Nobody's saying that it's a, a perfect solution, I think, but um, but in the instance where it's, it's exceedingly difficult to find a foster family, um, uh, you know, it's 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 more appropriate than having an extended uh, stay at the children's center, which is you know not equipped to um, to work with young people with with serious mental health needs. I don't believe. Yeah, no, we completely agree. The, the other thing I would mention is, as we've had success bringing down the numbers of kids in foster care, and as Dr. Martin's portfolio you know has grown so much larger. It stands to reason, and we actually have the data to show it, that you, the, the kids who are coming into foster care tend to be kids with a higher group of needs, right? Yeah. Because we're meeting the lower risk and lower issue families in, in Dr. Martin's system um, and, in, and in Lorelei's area. Right, right. There's one other thing I, I should mention, which we're doing, which we are very hopeful will have an impact uh, on this program. Um, as you may know, we actually have two tiers of family foster care. We have regular family foster care and then we have therapeutic foster care, right. which is intended for, for young people with more severe needs, more serious needs. Um, we very recently, within the last couple of months, have taken a number of slots from providers that were underutilized, that were not fulfilling filling their capacity of regular family foster care, and we have reallocated those slots as therapeutic family foster care slots to providers that have been doing a good job of, of utilizing the program. And so we're hoping that that in the short term will help us build up an inventory of foster care beds that will be appropriate for some of the young people that we hope to move out of the Children's Center. Okay, thank you, thanks. I'll turn it over to Councilmember Adams for questions. Thank you, Chairs. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for your testimony thus far. Uh, I represent District 28 in Southeast Queens where since 2015 we have had a close to home facility uh, with the help of sheltering arms and I just like to discuss that just for a couple of minutes. So when close to home was first presented to us we were under the impression and Deputy Commissioner you've, you've been with us for a while so thank you for being here you know where I'm going with this. Um, when it was presented to us, it was presented as uh, an initiative that truly would be close to home. What we found that that wasn't necessarily the case uh, with my uh, South Ozone Park community who definitely did oppose the close to home facility coming into the community. This is a community of residents, homeowners, and it did not fit uh, the scheme and the character of the community. 
So what we've experienced over the past year or so have been two incidents of uh, AWOL uh, with youth escaping the facility. Uh, the first one was in April 2018. The second one was in December 2018, where we realized that after consecutive meetings um, with uh, your team and others, the facility itself does not really have a capacity or a high level of detainees in this particular facility. And Deputy Commissioner, if you can help me out and just let me know how many youth right now are in the close to home facility in uh, South Ozone Park? I don't have the number in front of me, but I know that actually we haven't gone above 12 ever. So, I mean, um, kind of testament to what the commissioner and I mentioned before, you know, uh, close to home actually being reduced by 90% in terms of placements since they opened in 2012. Mm -hmm. So, we've never gone uh, over 12 in South Ozone Park. And at both incidents where we've had youth go a well, I dare say no more than four or five if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. were residents in that facility at any given time. Now, I am hard pressed to, to con continue to justify the existence of this close to home uh, to my community that opposed it vehemently since 2015. Uh, and if you can help me today to justify the existence of this particular facility existing and continuing to maintain a contract with sheltering arms in this community where we have had a two-year-old terrorized because a youth jumped the fence in April, where in December a youth pulled the, the, fire, uh, the fire alarm and was able to escape very simply uh, with minimal effort from people that were supposed to be watching out for his safety and for the safety of my district. So again, if you can let me know how I can possibly justify the continued existence of this particular facility in South Ozone Park, uh, I would greatly welcome your assistance. So, um, I mean, close to home was premised under the concept that young people should be close to their families. And actually, the law requires that young people should be in, in New York City or within 40 miles of New York City. And we, you know, we meet the standards and actually do above that. Uh, in terms of our uh, understanding of where young people are placed, we look at their special needs first, and then we look to proximity to home. So at any one moment, uh, the majority of young people in Ocean Park are actually young people that are, their families reside in Queens. But as you and I have discussed in the past, there may be young people from Brooklyn or other boroughs in that facility in Queens uh, within the limited secure facility. I think to the context of why do we need the facility is because, again, we only have two limited secure facilities for young males, one in Queens, one in Brooklyn. Um, we need that capacity, particularly in preparation for the young people who are coming into us now. Um, the other factor I think is important to mention, I think we open up in the testimony talking about how proud we are that close to home placement have gone down by 90%. One of the things that actually I'm particularly proud of is that actually since 2012, particularly after 2012, 2013, under the new, new administration, AWOLs have gone down by 87%. The likelihood of a young pe person to go AWOL from close to home is lower than have ever, ever been. And as you and I have talked about, it's unacceptable that actually that, that actually happened twice in your district. And the provider and us, we have been as responsive as we can. Both young people were apprehended within a matter of days. And we actually have been particularly tough. And uh, on, those, on that provider, even though it's a very good and responsive provider, to make sure that that doesn't happen again. I mean, I know all the neighbors of Olson Park by name right now, and you and I have consistently meet with them. Uh, I know their feelings about the facility. Uh, we work on a daily basis to make sure that we can turn that around. Yeah, I mean, I think you have been particularly good at demanding from us to, to provide public safety, but at the same time, you always remind us the importance of serving these young people well. And I think even the neighbors and the residents of the community have actually turned around their conversation to us now about not just make sure you are not here, but make sure you do it well if you are in my neighborhood. Yeah, and certainly, Deputy Commissioner, I certainly appreciate all of the efforts 
um, that you've made uh, over, you know, over these years to always answer our questions. My problem still is that there have been substantial questions, um, and the community has been right, unfortunately, um, which I would have preferred that not to be the case, but um, the community has been right with this particular facility. And, uh, you know, and, and the subsequent actions that have gone on uh, with this particular facility. I'm not still convinced that this is good, uh, that this is a good situation. Understanding that our youth and their priorities are at the top of everyone's list, hands down, but not convinced that this was the appropriate placement, number one, for this facility. And number two, that we need a facility of this size and capacity when there has yet to be uh, uh, that capacity limit met or come close to there. So I'll just end it there and thank you. Thank you. Um, Council Member Joni. Thank you, Chairs. Um, I just want to point out that it's wonderful to see more money is now going toward preventive services than protective services. That means we're proactive, mm -hmm. and that's spending money wisely and investing to prevent the most uh, vulnerable from being hurt or taken advantage of. Thank you. Eight out of the 10 community districts that rank highest in the overall risk are in the borough of the Bronx, which leads to my next question and the only question that I have. We have a $4 billion increase in this budget from last year, but yet your agency, your department, is being forced to take a 7.6% cut. It's the highest by percentage of all of the agencies and departments, and only ranks second in dollar amount to DOE. When this percentage came out of the thin air, you were never consulted? No. The decisions about uh, agency peg targets were made by OMB, without, certainly without consultation with us, and as I understand it, without consultation with other agency commissioners. And you indicated in the last few weeks you've spoken with OMB? We're in discussions with OMB about how to meet the peg target, yes. And uh, as I had said earlier, um, our goal is to... Um, as much as we're able to use revenue streams that we have at ACS to avoid impact on programs as much as we can do that. So can you share with us what you anticipate, whether you anticipate cuts to be in what programs or where I, in your... I can't yet. We're in discussions with OMB about that, and no decisions have been made at this point. How many discussions have you had with OMB? A number. <laughs> and. And any of those discussions, no programs have come up as a potential for cutting? Uh, there have been discussions about different programs, but there haven't been any decisions reached. Right. Well, that's why I'm interested in those discussions, uh, because the concern is if eight out of the ten uh, highest overall risks are in the borough of the Bronx, any cuts are going to impact Bronx sites by proportion over any other borough in the city. And this is a tremendous concern in the earlier hearings that we had. I pointed this out as well, mm -hmm. uh, that the borough of the Bronx has many needs, and we often refer to the tale of two cities, but we never talk about the tale of two boroughs, and that's the borough of the Bronx and the rest of the city when it comes to services and investments. But we are first in many other areas, from obesity and health concern and unemployment and the dumping grounds for the rest of the city when it comes proportion to support of housing and shelters. We're 17 percent of the population. We have 30 percent of the city's shelters. We're 17 percent of the population, and we have 41 percent more than Brooklyn, 99 percent more than Staten Island, 100 percent more than Queens, and 13 percent more than Manhattan in support of housing. Any cuts are felt by the borough of the Bronx hardest. So I would hope that whatever cuts you do agree to or in your discussions, keep the borough of the Bronx in mind. We just simply need more and can't afford any cuts. 
Thank you. I hear you, and I will certainly uh, communicate that back to OMB as we talk with them. Thank you, um, Councilman Joni. Um, I do just have a couple before we go um, to Holton has another question, and I believe Chair Levin might have another question to follow up. And I do want to follow up first on what Chair Levin mentioned about the pegs, the 68 million. And as Councilman Joni alluded to, oh guards, how did that number come about? You were never in the room. My question to you would be first is that when we ask the question, each day, how much is it costing you per youth that's in your system, and which programs are effective? If we can really identify how much, what that dollar amount looks like, then we can tell what agencies are really doing, what we've asked them to do, what contract they have, and then that might help us with a peg if, if they're ineffective. But if they are, if all your programs are effective and you really just cannot afford to cut anything, are you willing to advocate for your agency to say, it doesn't make sense? It's not our fault that, just, that the city system is having an issue financially. We're doing our job because we've always said here, the most vulnerable in our city are our youth and our seniors. That's one piece of the budget should never be cut. I've listened to the city add new money to the budget. If you don't have new money to add, you can't add it. So why add money and tell somebody who, who needs their money to maintain what they mean to cut? So I'm saying to you, are you prepared to advocate when you're in those rooms about, hey, listen, we can't afford to cut anything. And if you have a way to cut people because people are doing it wrong, then we can support that because you can sit up and say, this program is not working, that program is not working, we're not getting the most out of it, we can cut here. But if you need everything, are you ready, is your team ready, prepared, and tell your people on the other side of this building, we just, we just can't cut 7%. Absolutely. Chair, Chair King, I would not have taken this job if I didn't believe that the work that ACS does is as important, if not more important, than the work that any other city agency does. And I advocate on behalf of our programs and our budget every single day, and I will continue to. Good, good to hear that. I do have another question. <clears throat> I have not heard from my sister here. Um, <laughs> she's been a silent soldier here. But I do want to ask the question in regards to when it comes to children who have mental health uh, or other challenges that we say that they have. And I want to, I wanted to give us an accurate account of what's real because as Chair Levin said, you just didn't recognize all of a sudden that five years ago we didn't have a mental health issue with our children. Now all of a sudden, now that this one population is going down, I just want to make sure no one is labeling kids when they're not really meeting that code and saying we're going to put them over here so we can continue to fund that system because we just don't have enough children who are who are, it's almost like getting arrested for not jumping the turns down and staying, you know, five nights in jail as opposed to locking up the person who really just robbed somebody or hit somebody over the head. A question, can you give me a real answer on that? My name is Jacqueline Martin. I'm the Deputy Commissioner for the Division of Prevention Services at ACS. Um, thank you so much for your question, uh, Chair King. Uh, I have been working in prevention services for 30 years now. I started my career with runaway youth and also I worked in the South Bronx for many years. So I can say uh, definitively that we as a child welfare system, we have struggled with getting mental health services for children and families and communities. It didn't just begin. Um, what I am very proud of uh, today is that we have the opportunity at ACS to try to address those needs. And so we have been aggressively doing that uh, with, uh, you know, designing and innovating services and bringing programs to communities that we think will meet those needs. For example, we had the opportunity in 2017 to partner with Montefiore Hospital and to bring group attachment based, um, you know, in, in intervention to families receiving prevention services with very young children, zero to three year olds. And so our commitment is to continue to do that because the services are needed in communities of color where we see long wait lists for mental health services, uh, the challenges that families face, unable to actually get uh, proper evaluations to be done so that we know exactly what the needs are. So I think, uh, you know, the commissioner would agree that we are going to continue that commitment so that the children and families that we see in prevention services will have those services that they need. I, I thank you for that answer, and I just want to get more clarity on, um, you mentioned Montefiore, you mentioned communities of color, 
Um, I do know that um, a Caucasian child can experience the same issues at 15 that a 15 year old or a nine year old or a nine year old. Mm -hmm. And the reason I, I share, and I'm just gonna give a quick story, was when it talks about the tales of two city of how this system has worked to say that young brothers and sisters of colors are less than, and we've created systems to trip them up. I tell the story of being in a middle school and a principal standing in the hallway as I'm there visiting, a young dark-skinned brother about in middle school, had to be no more than about 12, comes out of the staircase, the bell had rung, so he was late. She berated this young brother who was about your complexion. Then all of a sudden, a little light-skinned Latino kid walked out and she cuddled him and said, what are you doing, you're lost. You see, what I'm, you see where I'm going? See how they look at the child differently. So when we talk about our system, I wanna make sure that our system doesn't do the same thing. Because when we come to, I listen to the numbers, I look at the numbers, it's like every child who's of color is part of your system and then everyone else is getting it right. So how are we telling that nine year old that they are super great if everything we tell them is that they need help? I've been in ACS system, I've watched some things that I didn't really like. So I'm asking us, how do we change it on our end and how do our numbers reflect because everybody got issues. If you're a nine, no matter make a difference what color, your nine year olds do stupid things all the time. No matter where you are, where you live in New York. But when we come in this room like this, our data seems to be skewed to a certain set of people in the city of New York. And I, yeah, I have, a I have a problem with that. Mm -hmm. So I'm asking you to help me be real in the whole conversation to say, hey, are we servicing all of, people have problem with right um, um, close to home program because you've taken kids from different neighborhoods and you put them in a community because they look like a community. They have no connection to it, and we have, but because they look like the community, you said we're gonna put them in a close to old program. And then when they run amok, the neighborhood that they're running has to deal with it. So I'm, the problem that I'm having is that you're gonna tell me that nobody in Lower Manhattan has an issue, nobody in Upper Manhattan has an issue, nobody in parts of Park Slope has an issue, they just only Eden Wall and Best I got issues. That's what I wanna get, I wanna, I wanna start, start having real conversation to help us all abroad so the system appears to be fair and neutral because right now it doesn't seem to be that way. Somebody please respond. I'll say something, and actually, Dr. Martin should respond as well because she has been a real leader in addressing this issue at ACS. Um, so as I talked about in my testimony, uh, Chair King, um, child welfare and juvenile justice have a history of racial disproportionality that reflects both um, uh, disproportionate involvement by race and disproportionate involvement by geography, as you're saying. Um, and there's some parts of that that we don't have control over at ACS. We are required, in the child welfare side, as you know, we're required to investigate every report that we get. We don't determine who reports which families, which kids. Um, and on the juvenile justice side, any child that a family court judge sends to us in the raise the age or in close to home, we're required to serve that young person. So that we can't control. But we do think that there are things that we can do to address the underlying issue of racial disproportionality and geographic disproportionality that you're referring to. And primarily there are two things. One is we can try to intervene in a positive way in those communities before kids get involved in the juvenile justice system or the child welfare system. And then we can make sure that we as an organization, when we're working with families, are not reinforcing those patterns. And so those are the two things that we're focused on. So the work that we're doing in our Division of Child and Family Wellbeing through our family enrichment centers, through our community partnership programs, our other activities are focused directly on how can we intervene in those communities to help the families in those communities get the services that they need to support their kids and help their kids grow up in a way so that they don't ever end up in the child welfare system or the juvenile justice system. And the work we're doing around uh, implicit bias and the equity assessments that we're doing um, similarly are focused on how we within ACS can hold ourselves accountable for making sure that we are dealing with every single family that comes through our doors in the same way regardless of race, regardless of geography, regardless of other factors that shouldn't have any impact on, on our interaction with them. Those are not easy goals to achieve. Those are, as, you, as you're pointing out, these are deep-seated problems in our society. Um, and we know that there are some parts of it that we can only respond to, but there's some parts of it that we think we can proactively intervene with, and that's what we're trying to do. So um, my qu next question goes to your 21st century new bill system, which you just talked about, the inequity said you're looking to challenge. Um, my first question is that 
um, how much do you, how much does a system like that you think cost? And as you create a system like that, what responsibilities will you, will this system have in holding other systems accountable for their, for their discriminatory practices that puts a more burden on your system? That's, those are both very good questions. Um, on, the I mean, I, on the first one, I can't attach a price tag to it. And actually, I think I would say it's less about more resources, it's more about how we use the resources that we have. Are we using them in positive ways? Um, so I think the first thing we have to do is make sure that all of our programs and all of the ways we're using our resources currently are aligned with this perspective and this way of doing things. Um, on the other, uh, that's a very good question. Um, you know, we are one of, I don't remember exactly how many city agencies, but we are one of the city agencies under local law 174 that was required to do an equity assessment. Um, we are working, and actually there is a, uh, I'm not sure if it's exactly a task force, but there's a group of those agencies that is overseeing that process with the mayor's office of operations. And um, part of the reason for that structure is to make sure that we're not each individually um, moving in this direction, but that we all, as a, an entire city government, that we are moving in this direction. So I think, th I think that's very important. I think if it doesn't happen across the board, it won't be effective. And my final question before I turn it back over to, uh, turn it over to Holden who has a follow-up question. Um, first, I wanna thank you for your answers. Um, as we continue to talk more about the budget and we wrap up with budget, um, I hope in your conversation of this 21st century, that you will have the ability and the guts to call another commissioner out if they're doing something wrong that's imposing and have an impact on your system. That's the only way we get it right. We can sit up here and say, but when y'all sitting in the room trying to figure out the next plan for the next this, you gotta call them out if you see something they're doing that's really just discriminatory, just not right, that's having an impact on how you gotta spend more money or get more, you're more stressed out, or you, your staff is more overworked while they're creating a the scenario for you. Mm -hmm. Hope that can happen. Mm -hmm. And second thing, I wanna move into capital money that you've been spending for the facilities, whether it's a rise across roads, close on whatever. That, those millions of dollars that, you've, that you have, that you've been building these facilities, want to know if that gym is ready at Horizons, um, and then also if all the money that you have, you spend it all, is all your facilities ready, and if not, do you need more money, or do you have anything left over? What's your status? Mm -hmm. Well, we need more money from the state, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. um, we, have, uh, we have spent a significant amount of capital money, um, and I think you have those numbers, but if not, we can certainly get them to you. Um, you know, we, uh, the two facilities, the two detention facilities, Crossroads and Horizon, um, are about 25 years old, and um, so they required quite a bit of renovation work ju uh, just on, on really basic systems. Um, and so that work had to be done before October because we had to make sure that they were safe for the increased population of young people that we're gonna put there. Um, with regard to the recreational facilities, we've been working not just the, just the gym, but of course the outdoor space, yeah, which is also yeah. a big concern. Um, I'm happy to say, actually, we understand that just today, the construction work on the, the outdoor basketball court has started. Okay. Um, and the Department of Design and Construction is overseeing that, and I know they're working as quickly as they can. Um, and then also, we'll be working on the, um, the other sort of grassy area in the interior courtyard, so th th those will both be available for young people. There is some outdoor space now, but we want both the basketball court and the grassy area to be available as soon as possible. So yes, we are working on those. Okay, thank you. I'd like to turn it over to Councilman Holden for a follow-up. Thank you, Chair King. I just have a couple of questions on the mental health area. Um, we've heard from some providers that uh, they have trouble keeping, uh, hiring and keeping uh, mental health professionals. Are you, are you seeing that uh, with your providers? Well, most of our providers are in our prevention system that, that Dr. Martin oversees, um, and uh, it, in, it in includes um, programs. We don't call them mental health programs per se, but they provide mental health services. Um, and we did have, um, and I think we talked about this actually from the first times I, I appeared before you, uh, we did have uh, uh, providers telling us they were having difficulty um, retaining uh, workers. Um, and so we w worked with the council uh, to achieve some additional investments in enabling the providers to raise salaries, uh, to make other kinds of investments to address the attrition that they were seeing in, their, uh, in the uh, workers that were supporting these prevention programs. Um, and we are seeing benefits from that. We are seeing providers uh, that are better able to maintain their contracted capacity of service, which was more challenging a couple of years ago. So I think we've made progress in that area. Um, 
but you know the issue of um, sort of trained and licensed mental health providers and clinicians is a problem in New York City. It's probably a problem across the country. Uh, there is a limited supply of them. And so I think you are putting your finger on something that uh, is yeah, a challenge they're, all of them. they're saying, that the provider is saying the, the area that they have the most trouble with is mental health. And that's the area that we have to actually invest in. And that's the area that Thrive NYC is investing in. Do you, uh, do you work with them? Or are they, you seeing a benefit from that program? We, we are uh, one of the partner agencies. Uh, we, have, we have several Thrive programs at ACS um, in our preventive services, in our foster care uh, agency, our foster care programs. Um, and so- So, so let me stop you there. You've seen there's an, there's an increase in funding in that area or, or, or new programs that come about uh, from in the mental health area from Thrive? Yeah. From Th Thrive specific, well, so we have a total of four programs at ACS that are part of the Thrive portfolio. Only one of them is actually funded through Thrive, and that is a program we call Trauma Smart, and it works within our early care and education system. So there, yes, in that, in that program, we did get an infusion of funding several years ago to basically do uh, trauma-informed training for staff in our early care and education So it's system. just for training. It was not directly helping individuals. It's well, for training of staff. It is for training of staff, but the goal is to help children, and actually we have outcome data that shows that it has succeeded in doing that. Um, the other three Thrive programs are considered part of the Thrive portfolio, but they're actually not funded through Thrive. They're funded either through other federal or state funding sources. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Holden. Um, just following up on that, so two areas that struck me as potentially um, opportunities for Thrive resources um, is first the Children's Center, uh, mm -hmm. obviously, and also the family enrichment centers, um, uh, you know, making sure that uh, children and families that are, you know, availing themselves of that really great resource in the community as a primary preventive model, um, you know, have access to, to mental health resources, I think would be a fantastic opportunity um, in the kind of continuum of services that are available to them. Yeah. So both good points, uh, Chair Levin. In, in terms of the Children's Center, we, we have a very close working relationship with the Bellevue Adolescent uh, Psychiatry Program, and they do provide mental health services, both within the facility or for young people who need to uh, actually go to Bellevue at Bellevue. Um, and we're in constant dialogue with them about mm -hmm. the, the quantity and the quality of services there. So um, they have been a fantastic partner and a fantastic provider. In so the there are no additional resources for mental health services at Children's Center that you see right now? In um, like the commissioner said, so we have an on-site team from Bellevue. Um, they mm -hmm. literally work, you know, full-time at the Children's Center. Um, and then in addition, we send kids, you know, as necessary um, mm -hmm. to the CPEP as well. Um, but we are in conversations, um, as the commissioner mentioned, with OMH and DOHMH, as well as OCFS, about opportunities for kids at the Children's Center, as well as kids in other foster care placements, whether it's residential or other foster homes, around increased mental health resources. Mm -hmm. So the Children's Center is in the mix of that conversation. Okay. And with regard to the, the family enrichment centers, as you know, uh, Chairman, uh, the family enrichment center model is a, is a um, community-generated model. So we began the process by working with families in the community to identify their needs and then to develop services that would address them. Um, I was just asking Deputy Commissioner Margus, and of the three, thus far, none of those three communities have identified mental health services as a priority that they want the Family Enrichment Centers to address. But if they did, mm. we, would, uh, we would respond to that. Okay, um, okay I'm gonna jump around a little bit because there's some topic areas I wanna get to before, uh, before we go. Um, uh, over time uh, at ACS, is, has come up as an issue, um, particularly because overtime is not, uh, is not a budgeted line item uh, in PS. So uh, we'll go through a adopted budget, November plan, January plan, um, uh, you know, executive budget, and then after uh, the end of the fiscal year, uh, we see the overtime costs, and at ACS it's gone up, as you can see, uh, very significantly over the last, you know, just the last uh, four. It's a very nice 
neat uh, trajectory, <laughs> as you can see, um, and it's going in one direction. Um, and, you know, I understand that, A, the work needs to get done, and we want people to be doing the work, um, uh, you know, effectively, um, and that the costs associated with increased headcount include ever escalating fringe costs, and that is expensive in and of itself. But um, at least with the increased headcount, we're you know adhering to our you know negotiated budget, or at least a budget put forward during a, during the November or January plans. So, um, can you speak a little bit to this you know rapidly increasing um, uh, uh, overtime? You know, 254 percent over budgeted amount on on uh, on personnel. Yeah, this is something we're taking a very close look at. Um, the two major areas where we have seen um, uh, significant overtime increases in the last two years have been our child protective specialists and youth development specialists. Mm -hmm. um, and there are different reasons for those two. We we've actually talked about them uh, this afternoon. On the child protective specialist side. Um, until fairly recently, um, we still had caseloads that were significantly higher than they are today. And when the caseloads are higher, that means obviously more work involved and more overtime that goes into that. Um, on the youth development specialist side, we are still in the hiring ramp up period. We have 250 out of the 700. Um, so that means we're you know, still currently managing with less than our ideal complement of YDS. And so that means the YDS we have are working more overtime. Both of those should be largely resolved, right? Our, our, at least now, our, our child protective specialist caseloads uh, are significantly lower, which should mean we should be able to control our overtime. And by the end of this year, we expect to have hired up to our full complement of youth development specialists. And so there too, there should be less need uh, for those YDS to work overtime. So as we address those issues in those two, you know, core frontline areas, we expect to be able to really get uh, more of a handle on it and be able to monitor, monitor our overtime costs um, in a, a better way than we've been able to for the last couple of years where we've been dealing with you know, particular concerns. So our FY19, we should, we should be less than 254% over uh, our budgeted amount? I would certainly hope so. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, moving over for a second here. So uh, recently, uh, I had the opportunity with, with uh, you and uh, your team to visit a CPS uh, office and meet with CPS uh, uh, staff and uh, supervisors and managers, and it was a really uh, great experience. Uh, I had a lot of takeaways from it. I won't go into all of them right now. One of them, by the way, was that at 5.30 when I left, almost the end, <laughs> every CPS was still working, right. um, and so I'm assuming that they were working overtime. Um, uh, I mean, like, literally, like, the whole office was still there. I said, when do you guys leave? <laughs> said, well, you know, we, we work late. We might, you know, go exercise and then come back. I was like, okay, you know, that's a lot of hours. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a lot of work, and obviously the work they do is incredibly serious and um, uh, difficult. Um, but spoke to, the, spoke to the overtime issue, I believe. Um, the other is that um, one th thing that was recommended as I was talking to them, as you recall, I'm sure, um, around implicit bias was that uh, they go through an Im implicit bias training uh, by ACS, and so they're um, uh, doing everything that they can um, to recognize the disparate impact of the child welfare system on children of color. And um, that is, that's a, that's a, a tremendous undertaking. Mm -hmm. What they recommended was that mandated reporters also do some type of implicit bias training. Now that is a very wide swath of New Yorkers. There are many, many uh, mandated reporters uh, throughout our society and our city um, but if the cases, if they're being called, you know, if, 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 uh, if, if CPS is, if a case is called in, a CPS has, has no choice but to go knock on that door. And 
Um, this is something to kind of just think about, and I don't know, I mean, obviously would, there would be some, some budget implications to this. H have we looked at this issue of, of, of mandated, of just the bias of mandated reporters? Because that, that, is, the, that is the genesis of, of the disparate impact that we're seeing mm -hmm. on children of color in New York City, which is very real. And the C I mean, to hear the CPS uh, uh, worker speak up to it uh, so passionately and eloquently was, um, you know, a real eye opener for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I remember that conversation very well when you were there. Um, I, I think it's a very interesting question. Um, the mandated reporter system is overseen by the state, actually, um, and. In fact, there have been, and I think, I think actually even in this session of the state legislature, I think there are uh, some legislative proposals around training of mandated reporters. So this is an issue I think is interesting. I'm happy to, uh, to raise it with the state and see if it's something that uh, would be interesting. But I think ultimately, uh, obviously, you know, the organizations that mandated reporters work for could voluntarily decide to do it. Right. But to do it sort of as a system-wide initiative, I think would require state legislation. Um, mm -hmm. But that's something we could certainly discuss with the state. Sure, absolutely, and I, maybe it's a conversation to have with 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 the union as well, because the, I think you know, obviously CPS are, are union members, and you know, and I think that it, it I think it it um, something that they uh, have to rest you know wrestle with, and it's a it's a difficult it's difficult for them. The stress that they take home with them every night when they go home to their families has got to be uh, incredibly uh, wearing on them and intense. And, uh, and so this is something I think that we should explore. And maybe with the Family Enrichment Centers as an opportunity to engage with the, the local, their local schools and their, and, and their local um, pediatricians and, and so on and so forth. I think it might be an opportunity. Yeah, um, or actually really with the community partnership programs, which are really their job is to sort of create those networks of of providers within communities, so that might be an appropriate place to introduce the conversation. Okay. Um, and being sensitive to the time, I have two more issues that I, uh, I need to address. Uh, one, and this is uh, you know also an issue for the Department of Education, but um, as ACS prepares to hand over the Early Learn system to the Department of Education, there is still this structural problem of pay parity that is persisting and I believe threatens to undermine the entire early childhood education system if we don't resource the early learning system to pay the teachers what they need to be paid to survive and what they need to be paid in order to be on a level playing field with their DOE UPK counterparts. And it's, I mean, as you know, I mean, it's just, it's just, it, it is uh, so galling to see that teachers in an early learn setting who are working a longer day and a longer school year, it's the entire year is their school year, are getting paid so much less and I brought this up with the mayor when he presented the preliminary budget. I did not get a good answer about uh, how we're going to address this. And it got kind of a, well, maybe we need to look at the whole system. I don't know what that meant. I don't know whether, they, whether that meant that we were gonna stop doing early learn, but we can't stop doing early learn. And so it's expensive. It's going to be a huge commitment of resources, probably over a hundred million dollars a year to write this, but it is, we can't continue to, uh, we can't continue to, to mistreat our teachers and expect them to continue, continue to educate our children. And I, and I, this has to be resolved and I hope that it's part of the process of the handoff to the Department of Education, but it just has to be resolved. It cannot continue to persist. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Chairman, I appreciate your concern very much. Um, obviously having qualified teachers who are appropriately uh, compensated is critical 
to um, making sure that children are getting the quality of services that they need and that they deserve in the uh, early learn system. What we've been doing at ACS, uh, and we've talked about this in previous hearings, is implementing the agreement that was reached between the administration and the daycare council and the union in 2016, which was to raise salaries for community-based uh, teachers over a four-year period. And we have been implementing that in stages over that period of time. Um, the issue of the disparity between community-based salaries and DOE salaries obviously is an issue that will be for DOE to address um, as we hand the program over to them. We will certainly do whatever we can to support them as they, uh, you know, figure out how they can address that issue. Right. I mean, the daycare council only had the resources that they were given by the city to be able to, uh, to compensate the teachers. So it just, you know, I mean, when we're at the rallies, daycare council is there with us mm -hmm. asking the city to make the commitment to fully fund the program so that the teachers can make a, uh, you know, a, an adequate salary. And so just, just, it's just something that we have we have to do before we do any new big uh, initiatives. Before we are, you know, uh, uh, before we do 3K, we need to pay our teachers in early learn. Really, we knew, need to do that. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, f a few questions around the R RFP um, that I think I'm going to have to follow up with in mm -hmm. writing, just okay. in the interest of time here. And and um, my last question is about Fair Futures, which is this, uh, this new initiative. Um, so, this is a program to have coaching or mentorship for uh, youth uh, in the continuum of, of, of uh, as they're uh, in adolescence and into uh, aging out of the foster care system, uh, particularly those that are not, you know, being adopted but are, are aging out to their own, um, you know, into their own cognizance. And, um, have, have, has ACS examined this proposal to see what the fiscal impact would be? Because presumably, um, based on programming that is now done, I think that's either self-funded by some of the not-for-profits or foundation-funded by the not-for-profits. Um, they're able to show, they have data that shows uh, how effective it is. Have we been able to extrapolate from that data what the fiscal impact would be of something like this? Um, that's interesting. So let me start by saying um, that the, you know, the issue of making sure that we are adequately preparing young people who are aging out of foster care to enter the workforce is a critical issue for us. And um, talked about in my testimony, we now have a dedicated office under Deputy Commissioner Farber that focuses on exactly that. We invested in a number of programs that I, we, we talked about today, the Why I Work program, the Fostering College Success program, and others. So we are very focused on the issue. Um, we've had, uh, and you know, in addition to things we're doing, we're always looking for other, other programs or other interventions that we think would be uh, appropriate additions to the services that we have in place. Um, we've had discussions with the providers and the advocates and Fair Futures. Um, I don't know that we have looked specifically at the financial sort of modeling or estimates. Um, with that, so I know that's very compelling that. to, to First Deputy Mayor Fullahan. Uh huh. Uh, is <laughs> Uh -huh. Yeah, somewhat facetiously. No, he's. I mean, but he was. You know, that's the kind of thing I've talked to him before about. Um, you know, the long-term fiscal impacts of, of different types of programming, nurse family partnership, and when he was budget director, and and um, you know, that's just something to examine if it's a. You know, as yeah, a, as, uh, we can certainly do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, I would strongly encourage that. And do you do you have it? Have you have you developed an opinion on it, or, or have you examined it to um, uh, to see if you think it would be impactful? Um, not specifically on the program itself yet, but we're continuing to have dialogue with the providers around it and also, you know, as part of the many discussions we're having with OMB in the development of the executive budget, we're looking at a range of options, uh, including options in the area of um, uh, additional support for older youth aging out of foster care. Because those, I mean, and you have seen, though, the impact that it has had on youth uh, in the programs that do do it, right? It's a very small percentage of programs that, of youth that are, that age out that actually have a a mentorship or a coach. I think it's like 10% or 12%. Um, but uh, but you've seen the impact of, of, of the programs that do. We do. have, and as, as you know very well, this was a subject of uh, considerable discussion in the Foster Care Task Force. So mm -hmm. we've looked at a, a number of different models in this area, and you know we're okay. very interested in what, in addition to what we're currently doing, would make sense. 
Okay, because we do have this new needs uh, opportunity coming up in the executive budget. So it would be a great time, in addition to making sure that those commitments that OMB made to uh, our finance director and our speaker last year, that they also uh, uh, fund uh, Fair Futures as part of a new needs. It would be great to see that. Um, and then, sorry, my last uh, question is around um, uh, non-mandated vouchers. Um, so I just want to reiterate, as I've reiterated uh, many times, that the number of vouchers that were in place, my understanding is that the administration had commi has committed to making sure that there's not a decrease in the number of vouchers year over year, that then what was uh, there in, in 2014 when they started. And so if we can continue to have a conversation to make sure that as we're budgeting for 2020, that, uh, that we can continue to, to, to fund uh, non-mandated vouchers so that they're, um, so that they're uh, um, uh, staying at the, the same level that they have been over the last five and a half years. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yes, I mean, as you know, um, we've now baselined something over $27 million mm -hmm. uh, in this area. Um, this has been a conversation every budget year. I assume it will be a conversation again this year. Um, I can say from, from our perspective at ACS, um, we, have, uh, you know, we have committed all the funds that have been available to us. The SCCF vouchers are, are fully committed and will continue to be. And uh, to the extent that, that funds are made available to us for the non-mandated vouchers, we will make sure mm -hmm. that they're made available to provide child care for young people that need them. Great. And lastly, this is my, my last question. On final, final, final. Final question. <laughs> that, um, so, uh, <clears throat> the last peg that the Bloomberg administration did in 2013 was post-transitional child care. So it was, that, it was that year after the transitional child care um, that ACS funded in the past with CTL um, to extend, I think, for another year, and, um, or maybe even beyond that. It was around, at the time, it was around $13 million, I believe, and that was the peg um, this is something that could help a lot of families as they get back to work and uh, are not receiving public assistance any longer, uh, but still have a need for childcare. So I think of Jasmine Headley's case actually as very instructive here. She, it's not exactly, she wasn't there, a post-transitional childcare would not necessarily have kept her from having to go in that day. But here's a young mother who, uh, went back to work, was no longer receiving public assistance, and, that, and she lost her child care as a result. Now, she was supposed to get that, that, uh, that transitional child care for the next 12 months. But in thinking about families that rely on child care in order to stay working, that post-transitional child care is very important. And it was cut during a time when you know, we were kind of having our austerity in New York City and it's something that has not been restored yet. And I think that it's something to, to re-examine. So I, I would hope that uh, ACS could look ag again at that. Yeah, we can certainly do that and we can talk with OMB about that. It's, I mean, we're unfortunately in a period of austerity again. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm not sure how it compares to 2013. Um, okay. But yes, it's certainly something we can take back and have discussions with OMB about. Great, thank you, Commissioner. And I wanna thank uh, your entire team here. Thank you very much. You. I'll turn it back to my co-chair. Thank you, Chair Levin. Um, and I want to thank you all. Uh, we don't have any more questions. We just want to say thank you for your time today. But I do have a, a closing comment just to use the phrase piggyback off my co-chair. And when it does come to looking at our young people as opposed to having them age out at 21, I think there is some precedent that when you know, the federal government decided to move health care, you stayed on your, fa your parents' health care to the age of 26, then you know when the city takes the responsibility to say that the parents no longer can handle the child and you're gonna have a child for the duration of their teen years into the early, early 20s, then yeah, you might wanna consider continue the care for them so close. What's happening is that if they're not stable, either they go into the world of homelessness or they end up in being locked up and then they go into another adult system that's not designed to help them get themselves together but designed just to have them there. So if we're gonna do it right, let's figure out how to do it right. And then, and finally, any criteria that we have, like the sister who had to go in there and it became a whole fiasco because she lost her childcare services, maybe you might wanna start looking at 
a parameter of gray area. So even though the bottom line is that if you make 2750 and if you're at 29, that doesn't change your whole existence. You know, and that's what the system looks at, those hard numbers, as opposed to having a gray up and down place, play space, knowing that because I'm a dollar over doesn't mean that I'm able to, I, I get it all together. But the system is really kind of unfair and it goes back to how, how biased is our system towards certain people in the system. So I'm asking you to please take a look at that, see if you can find some fairness and equity amongst all the people sitting at the table. And yes, someone mentioned diversity a little earlier. Maybe our team needs to look more diverse as we do this work as well, so that compassion can be right there at the table. So again, thank you for your conversation. And anything you need to get to us, to any question, I'm asking you to get it to us in a timely manner so that we can review it, and that you we can be and have a conversation as opposed to two hours before a meeting or a day before a meeting trying to assess what, what our today's conversation looked like. So we can be responsible in the conversation. And then you, you know, we'll be all good. We're on the same page. All right, so I appreciate you. Thank y'all. God bless you. Be well. I know we have a public conversation. We have a couple of people who have signed up from the, from the public to say a few words. I want to thank you all for your patience today who have sat and listened to today's conversation. I know we've all learned something that we didn't know when we woke up this morning. Um, so as the administration proceeds to exit, or even if you want to sit back and listen to, listen to some of the testimony of the public who sat and and endured our conversation for the last four hours. Maybe we want to show them a little love and sit back and listen a little something. <laughs>if everyone could please find seats again once again find your seat we're going to start with public testimony momentarily
Okay, we're back. All right, um, first again, I wanna thank the public for your time and energy and the department. ACS is still in the room, so they will hear you. So I thank them for sticking and staying. Um, but we will say, um, do the, and we wanna give everybody an opportunity to speak, and it's been a long day. So we're gonna ask each panelist, you're gonna have two minutes to speak. We wanna get you on the record. We're just trying to be fair, because so, if we would have tried to do it the other way, we'd be here at 9.30, and I know somebody got to go home and cook children, food for their children, and I want somebody calling ACS on you because you're not home. So we want to make sure that you get home in time. All right. So Rosemarie Sinclair, first vice president. Please come up, CSA Council School Supervisors. Lisa Caswell, daycare council. And Ralph Palladino, local 1549, DC 37, second vice president. Okay, we can start left to right, right to left. We'll leave it in your capable hands. Just identify yourself for the reckoning. Go. Can you hear me now? Okay, great. Hello, my name is Rosemary Sinclair. I'm the first vice president of CSA, Council of School Supervisors and Administrators. Uh, we have over 16,000 members serving uh, supervisors and administrators in the Department of Education and directors in city-funded early childhood centers. So good afternoon, Chairman King and Chairman Levin and the distinguished members. We wanna thank you for this opportunity and also for passing the resolution 358, which supports pay parity. This includes equal pay for our directors and assistant directors as their counterparts in Department of Education. We are proud of this resolution. However, we still see that our members continue to live close to poverty line. Even though they are supervisors, they support, supervise, observe, and evaluate teachers. Most of our directors are making 11% less than a beginning teacher in the Department of Education. And again, our directors as, long, as well as our teachers work long days and they have a longer year. Recruiting and retention is for highly specialized professionals are at risk. Our members are losing teachers at the centers. Also, this leads to a risk of the quality of the program that um, we have for our children. This stubborn pay parity persists and it runs counter to DOE's mantra of equality and excellence. We have 93% of our directors are women, and a majority of them are women of color. We know you share our frustration, and we believe our members should get the pay and respect that they so desperately deserve. Thank you, and please help us with this. Thank you for staying within your two minutes. Next. My name is Lisa Caswell. I'm the senior policy analyst for the Daycare Council of New York, and I would really like to appreciate whoever it is that scheduled the two of us to sit next to each other, um, because we are together along with 1707. Yes. Uh, the Daycare Council of New York, for more than 70 years, has served the needs of nonprofit organizations that sponsor child care programs across the five boroughs. Currently, we have 91 members operating 200 programs. We are responsible for negotiating collective bargaining agreements on behalf of our member agencies with the two unions, 1707 and CSA. First of all, we'd like to thank you for your persistent support of our membership, even earlier today, the continued raising of the issue. Uh, our concerns are really uh, in three areas, salary parity, program vacancies, and the overall physical infrastructure of the system. Uh, the recent release of the DOE's Birth to Five RFP will have long-ranging repercussions. On the matter of salary parity, our members continue to struggle with the hiring and retention of qualified teaching staff in the face of ongoing professional staffing competition with the DOE. 
entry level early childhood education teachers who have their master's degrees and are state certified are paid seventeen thousand one hundred sixty eight dollars less than their entry level counterparts at the deal we based on last month's salary bump for the uft for more than a year the daycare council has been engaged in complex complex research on salary parity to determine the fiscal impact our goal is salary parity for all staff however we are starting the analysis by focusing on CBO directors and master's and bachelor's level certified teachers for two reasons. Our members have repeatedly discussed the difficulty in hiring management and state certified teaching staff for their agencies, and Article 47 of the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's regulations require this staffing for all early childhood programs. Our calculations are based on the UFT's collective bargaining agreement salary scales with specific attention excuse me for going over, with specific attention to cost of living adjustments and longevity increases. In calculating the funding amount, consideration has been given to the current employee benefit structure, which includes salary, FICA, a pension, and health insurance. Salary parity is the only path forward for an integrated early ed system, and we are committed to laying a proper foundation for long-term stability. We will be releasing our research findings very shortly and are preparing for a city council briefing as well. I'm just going to summarize our concerns related to our, the RFP and program vacancies. Right now, the average provider would not be able to get their full funding if they were going to be paid within the pending formulas with the DOE. And we've spoken with the DOE about how they came to their decisions. Um, right now, what they're going to be doing is uh, the, the RFP states that programs with enrollment rates at 58 percent or less will receive 65 percent of their monthly contract value. Programs with an enrollment rate between 58 and 93 will receive funding for their monthly enrollment plus 7 and program 7 percent and programs enrolled at 93 percent or higher will receive 100 percent. The issue is this. They have centralized the enrollment process for UPK already. They've done well with Head Start recently. They have made changes to be able to try to accommodate the nonprofits. We are not saying that they are um, unaware of the problem of children going to the school system instead of staying in the CBOs. But right now, there's a new formula that risks underfunding for the nonprofit sector, and it is not necessarily going to be working for us. Finally, physical infrastructure. Many of our programs are in NYCHA. You're aware of the problems there. At this point, we have parent testimonies that they're choosing school-based settings over CBOs located in NYCHA settings. Um, so that's our final concern. Um, we must see, as as Councilmember Levin has said, we, this has to change. It, it, it isn't right, and um, we can't make it. And we're doing better than the school-based settings academically. So uh, we want to thank you, and that's it. Yeah. Good day, I'm Ralph Palladino, Second Vice President, Local 1549, Clerical Administrative Employees, uh, representing the uh, eligibility specialists in the food stamp and uh, the SNAP program, and also Medicaid recertifications. Re uh, and clerical associates working in HRA and ACS. Um, there are, if you see what's going on uh, with the staffing numbers that I have provided, you will see that there are 400 less clerical associates in the last four years in, um, in HRA. There are 400 less eligibility specialists in HRA than there were four years ago. Eligibility specialists are key and critical and the determining factor in, in determining eligibility for people in SNAP and Medicaid research. 400 less is almost a 20% uh, reduction in staff the last four years. If you do not hire the people, rather than have them attrited as, as the city has done in the last four years when there were surpluses, and even under bad times there's been surpluses at the end of the year, we all know, uh, then you will, not, you will continue to have the lines, you will continue to have the weights, especially in Medicaid, but also in the SNAP areas and on the phone lines because the workers are doing double duty. Our staff, the ESs, are, uh, have been uh, hounded. They have been disrespected by management at work. They have been followed to the bathroom. They have been timed to go to the bathroom, all because the city decided that they, an HRA decided to attrit those positions. And they are the ones who are responsible for signing up all those people when Trump shut the government down, all the SNAP people. They had to work forced overtime. Many of them did it because they wanted to, but forced overtime. 
They need to get, get, find the money to hire those people and fill those lines. And the clerical associates are being replaced by other titles, higher titles, non-competitive titles, and that includes an ACS, costing the city money, subverting civil service. So I ask you to look at both of those things as well as the language issues which I've out outlined here. One last thing, if you don't mind, they talked about the loss of centers in the Bronx in the last hearing that I testified at, which I have a copy of here, I attached to our, my, my testimony. I think you need to look at what happened under the Bloomberg administration when he cut, had every single agency cut 10% of its a budget dealing with rents. And when they started doing that, they started closing and consolidating centers. And we argued that they should not do that. They should be expanding them into the community. And if they did that, then the Bronx would not be underserved the way it is now. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you all uh, to this panel. I very much appreciate all the work that your membership does uh, in serving uh, all New Yorkers. Thank you. Uh, next panel, uh, uh, Dominique Dillon Tatum, um, Michael Leak, Sophia Gurley, and Kevin Nicholson. Yes, okay. Okay, whoever wants to begin. Start. Hi, my name is Sophia Gurley and I have been, um, I am one of the individuals who was speaking out against the homelessness, the Department of ACS and so forth. I have been one of the victims who unfortunately have been uh, in the circumstances of being homeless and being biased in the system. And I feel like personally that the system is, is an error in it and it needs to be fixed. Some of the things that need to be fixed is the judgment towards the people that are in the system because not everybody that is in the system has a mental illness. That's for one. Not only that, yes, it is very biased against people of color because I am one of those people who unfortunately have been through ACS system numerous times due to forced allegations and stuff, and I have had my children taken from me. My children have been out of my care for a whole month and a half before I was able to get my children back. And when I did get my children back, everything was unfounded. So how does that right there consist of ACS is working on the issues that they have presented today. That was my first concern when I was sitting in the back listening to them. Second, the school systems is corrupt because not only are they not paying attention to our children, but they are failing to properly educate our children in a manner to catching their, their attention. I know because I am a teacher's aide in the state of New York. You, can, you cannot sit there and constantly call parents day in and day out when you feel like the child has a problem. Not all children have problem. Every children come from a different background. Not everybody came from good backgrounds. Not everybody come from bad backgrounds. But you do have a mixture of both, and that needs to be addressed. Third, on the homelessness, I am a victim of, of being in the system. I know my time is up. I have been a victim of being homeless, and I have been one of those families who was moved out of New York and placed into New Jersey. I have been on the news three times already due to this incident, so I know what it feels like to be in the corrupt system, going through the corrupt system and still in the corrupt system, and the system is not being fixed, it's not being adjusted, and it's not being handled. You're welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Levin, Chair King, members of the Committee on General Welfare and Juvenile Justice. I'm here to share my personal experience with having a coach in application for the Fair Futures Program. 
My name is Dominique Tatum, but I prefer to be called Dylan. I entered the foster care system when I turned 13 with, Saint, with HeartShare St. Vincent Services. I moved from foster home to foster home twice a year with the hope of finding a genuine connection with my foster parents. Unfortunately, that was unsuccessful. Adapting to being in foster care where I was separated from the only family I knew was an emotional journey for me and at one point reflected in my poor academics performance. I quickly realized that I had to change because I knew that my circumstance wasn't and then as a result, I graduated from high school on time. If you would have asked me seven years ago if college was an option, I would have quickly replied by saying no. If you would have asked me four years ago if college was an option, I would have said perhaps or maybe. But if you would ask me today if college is an option, I would not hesitate to respond and encourage others like myself that college is absolutely, positively, not only an option, but a reality for many youth in care who are afforded the support of a coach that is committed to their personal development and future goals in life. I was introduced to my coach, Lauren Petit, during a pivotal moment in my life. I chose to attend LaGuardia Community College. However, I was unprepared for the obstacles that awaited me during the enrollment process. I lacked the knowledge of this process because no one I lived with went to college or cared to assist. I was guided through the extensive process because being a youth in care meant that there was additional paperwork to handle. Lauren eagerly advocated on my behalf to obtain the necessary documents that my enrollment status was contingent upon. In the end, I not only was successfully enrolled, but Lauren made it a priority to connect me to resources on campus that were fundamental to the college experience. It is safe to say that without the support of my avid coach, I would have struggled with registration and the motivation. I'm you can keep going. You can keep Thank going. you. To remain in school. I graduated from LaGuardia Community College in June 2017 and currently attend John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Attending college is something to feel good about. Yet staying in school and making the firm decision to continue and pursue higher education expands one's access to opportunities. To my coach, the options are endless. College is an option, but so is vocational training. Entrepreneurship is attainable because there is no limit. To my coach, I am a valuable person with a unique skill set. I am not just a case number. To my coach, the entirety of youth welfare matters, which means that a plethora of service are provided to benefit successful youth development. Throughout the course of our relationship, I have been surprised with care packages, provided a shoulder to cry on when my grandmother passed on, given mental stimulation and access to job opportunities. I have been rewarded for my accomplishments and encouraged to persevere during the most difficult yet pertinent times in my life. Gratefully, I have been paired with a coach who possessed a personal experience with the goal I have of attending law school, and she has demonstrated 100% commitment towards ensuring that this goal becomes materialized. You think here need people to look up to that they can emulate. It is important for you to have someone in their corner that is dedicated to changing the narrative for them. I urge you all to think about the many 13-year-olds that you came or will come across at some point, and to then take a look at what we know about precedent outcomes of these youths when they age out. The trajectory of their lives depend on the implementation of programs designed to address the needs of youth in care. There is no one who has done life alone, and we certainly cannot expect vulnerable youth to do so either. It is prominent that we ensure that every foster youth has a fair future, a fair shot, and a fair opportunity to transform into the best versions of themselves because every kid deserves a chance. Thank you. Thank you, Dylan. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Shade Collington. Um, I am one of the forgotten families that's been on the CBS 2 News. Today I'm here just to advocate for my family and let you guys know that in June 2018, my family moved into unlivable conditions through DHS and now we're back in the same predicament. We're back in the shelter system, going through everything all over again. Um, I'm really here just to reach out and wish that certain programs change, such as the soda voucher. I wish that DHS took the opportunity to really understand that cutting the check and dumping your problem 
onto another state is not fixing the problem. It's only making the problem worse, and it's only making things worse for our families. I have an eight-year-old and a two-year-old who's chronically asthmatic, and during our stay, we have endured conditions that are unspeakable. Um, so I just really wish that everyone is able to help our family and really be there to vouch for us and understand that things aren't black and white. There are definitely great areas. Um, DHS has not helped my family as of yet, and I'm hoping that by speaking out today, they are willing to at least come to us and apologize for the lack of communication between themselves and other states and really just shake our hands and be willing to work with us for future endeavors. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Kevin Nicholson. Um, I'm a husband to Shadi Collington and a father to Kevin Nicholson Jr. right there, the eight year old. And I have a two year old, Katie Nicholson. Um, I was one of the families on the news. My family was the first to get the news eye to our situation, we led other families to get onto it. Um, the first night we were dropped off to our apartment in New Jersey, they dropped us off. The workers were still working on the house, so they told us, why did DHS send you guys? So the first three nights we got there, me and my family stayed outside. We slept outside the first three nights, as soon as we got there, because the workers wasn't done on the house. So we stayed there outside. From there on, it has been, it has been like downhill declining. Raining inside of the house, over the stove, over beds, over couches. My son was sleeping in negative 12 degree temperature would cause him to go to the hospital, anemic and everything. We stood in the hospital for two weeks for my son and his asthma. It was just the worst experience that I ever felt. And um, Stephen Banks, I watched him over the um, news say that we had traces and traces. No, we didn't have no choice of anything. We was forced there. If we deny housing more than twice or three times, then they saying now we denying it and we got to leave the hotel or the shelter and go back to PATH and start over. So we have to take these options. Whatever choice they're giving us, we have to take it. There's no choice, or there's no, so we took it. And right now we're back in this hotel. Nothing's happening. We've been here for three to four months. If it wasn't for me and my wife sticking together, it would be the worst thing. So I'm just reaching out and asking for help and in the midst of just apologies and understanding because I don't think that um, Stephen Banks and other people that's in the DHS chairs understand what we're going through. Um, I'm sorry, can I also like kind of piggyback off of them because we're all going through the same situation. Um, I, I, just ha I just find it mind boggling that people could sit and say that they strategically thought about a plan to help families move into permanent housing, but yet there's an issue that is still going on and on and on where nobody is placed in permanent housing. You can't even get yourself together because of the other issues that you are facing. You understand? And when you strategically think of something, that means you plant it out, you mapped it, you have a, you have a strong plan. Me personally, giving people $17,000 up front for a family is not strategic thinking. Mm -hmm. That's not. Now, when you strategically think about something and you have a plan, and especially if you're moving families out of where they are comfortable at, then that means there should be a plan in place. Okay, what's gonna happen after this family move into, right, what's gonna happen when this family moves into this next state? You know what I'm saying? Because I was also one of the families that was moved out of New York into New Jersey, and I didn't have no family there. I learned New Jersey as I moved there. Where, where in New Jersey, by the way? I, I'm in Newark, New Jersey. Newark. Right. Yeah. And I was also one of those families as well. When I saw their story, that's what prompted me to speak up as well. And about the, 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 uh, the, the foster care, my children was placed in five different homes within a month and a half time frame. Five different homes. 
So right now, I could relate to everybody on this table, and I really do have way more that I could speak on, but I know we don't have that type of time today. But I just wanted to piggyback off of them and let y'all know that this is a major problem that has to be, that has to be addressed. Not only that, the mayor of New Jersey is calling for the mayor of New York and the commissioner to come and meet with him because of this. And no one has reached out to our families or nothing like that yet. Yeah. Mm. Not the commissioner, not DHS, not the mayor, nobody. And I do have a meeting with the mayor coming up soon okay. because of this. Because I also now have a DCP case in Jersey because of my living arrangements. Which is ACS in Jersey. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, and just one question um, uh, for Shade and Kevin: Did did you choose the apartment? You did not choose the apartment. No, right? we didn't choose it. Like I said, we we seen two apartments before that prior to it, which was messed up. The third one, we were told if we don't choose this one, we're denying housing. Yeah. So we would have to go leave. back to path. Yeah. We'd go back to path and start all over again. And so it was like. You know what? Let's just go here, and then yeah. we went. They told us in two weeks, be ready. They knocked on the door of the hotel. They packed all of our stuff up. They took us there, dropped the bags off. The workers was there. They said, "Why did DHS send you guys? It's not ready." First three nights, me, me and my kids and wife stood outside. The first three nights, everything was done through DHS. Everything was done the, through DHS. The yeah. van run, everything. Us to, yeah. Taking us there to the actual property. Um, from my knowledge, they were supposed to conduct some sort of inspection and ensure that everything was done. Nothing. Obviously, they didn't. None, right. they did nothing. nothing. We done. went back to the hotel to show them pictures like two weeks after we got there. They threatened to call They the said police. that we're trespassing, so they can't do nothing right now because we're no longer tenants now. We reached so. out and made several 311 complaints. Um, the only thing I received was someone from the ombudsman office. Her name was Miss Singleton. She told me that we had the right to go back to PATH, but they were not going to do anything for us until the soda voucher ended, which is in June. Right. And as of right now, that's what it seemed like it's, it's happening. We have yeah. to wait yeah. because we haven't even received a voucher. I, I want to thank you for, um, for uh, ca uh, calling a lot of public attention to this program, and uh, we're, we're looking at it um, in depth. Um, but it, I don't think that that wouldn't have happened without without um, your story coming to light. And I just want to wish you and your family well, um, and uh, and you know urge you to to um, keep up uh, you know um, advocating and um, and uh, and working for your family. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then uh, Dylan, I just want to thank you. You did an amazing job at the rally earlier, um, and uh, uh, you know inspired. I think uh, everybody that was there, all hundreds, you know, hundreds of people, and um, and I want to, uh, you know, wish you the the best at John Jay. And I know you said you wanted to go to law school afterwards, um, so I, I, I want you uh, to to keep on with it because you're uh, you're doing an amazing job. I want to thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much to this panel. Thank Have you. a great day. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, next panel, uh, Reed Reland, Housing Works, Ted Houghton, Gateway Housing, John Sentiger, Covenant House, and Sarah Childs, RH Capital.
Thank you all. Uh, whoever wants to begin. Sorry, make sure that the light is on. Sorry. There you go. Can you hear me? Good evening. My name is Sarah Childs, and I'm the executive director of the Red Lake Horowitz Foundation. We're a philanthropy dedicated to improving the foster care system in New York. In re recent years, we have granted close to $1.5 million to ACS for technical assistance and over $4 million to New York City foster care agencies. Thank you to Chairperson Levin for your unwavering commitment to children in foster care and to the members of the General Welfare Committee for your leadership in creating the Interagency Foster Care Task Force. With Commissioner Hansel's leadership and his exceptional management team, ACS has increased permanency rates and also increased placements of children with relatives. We congratulate ACS and its provider community on these successes, all of which were major recommendations of the task force. We know that if this administration sets its mind to something, it gets it done. The task force also recommends providing services to ensure older foster youth can meet their education and career goals. The Fair Futures campaign launched this year to do just that. With over 80 organizations signed on to the coalition, we urge ACS and the city to support our older youth to meet their potential. The good news is that we know exactly what works. Several agencies have received private funding to provide coaching and academic tutoring to foster youth aged 14 to 26 and have seen tremendous results. While only 22% of youth without these services achieve a high school degree, nearly 90% of program participants graduate from high school. But currently only 12% of our foster youth receive these services. The return on these investments is clear. More young people educated, employed, housed, and thriving. Several foundations are raising close to $2 million to match public funds so that we can scale these successful programs. The private funds are being invested to create the infrastructure to track results and to train staff. But we need $50 million to scale these successes to even more deserving young people, and we have creative ideas for where that money can come from. We urge you to make New York the first city in the nation to ensure all our young people have a fair shot at a successful future. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is John Suntagar, and I'm a member of the advocacy team at Covenant House New York, where we serve runaway and homeless youth ages 16 to 24. I'd like to thank the Committee on General Welfare and Council Chair Levin for the opportunity to testify today. Um, in 2018, Covenant House served over 2,000 young people in our residential programs, including pregnant women and mothers with their children, LGBTQ youth, and commercially sexually exploited youth and trafficking survivors. Many of our youth have experienced abuse or neglect at the hands of parents or other caregivers, and a disproportionately high percentage of our youth struggle with pervasive impacts of trauma, mental health issues, and substance abuse. We provide young people with food, shelter, clothing, medical care, mental health and substance abuse services, legal services, high school equivalency classes, and other educational programs programs, including job training programs. I just wanted to highlight um, some of the initiatives that we are applying for discretionary funding for this fiscal year, and these include LGBTQ youth mental health. We're requesting $50,000 to improve and expand our mental health offerings at Covenant House New York, specifically as they relate to LGBTQ young people. Um, we're also requesting money to support our homeless students initiative and job training and placement initiative. Education and employment is extremely important, especially for our young people at Covenant House, and we want to be able to provide more of that. Um, finally, I'm also requesting, um, on behalf of Covenant House, expanded um, funding for our MetroCard program. We really applaud the city's effort in um, rolling out fair fares. Um, unfortunately for our young people though, fair fares would not cut it for them. We need to be able to provide full subsidized Metro cards for them to be able to get to job interviews, medical appointments, and the like. So I urge you to consider those requests on behalf of Covenant House New York. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Chair Levin, Chair King, and members of the General Welfare Committee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Brendan Cheney. I'm an associate director at Gateway Housing, a nonprofit organization that works to improve the shelter system by helping to create model nonprofit owned, purpose built transitional residences with innovative financing methods and uh, evidence based practices. Uh, you've got our full testimony before you, um, but I will try and summarize uh, and, and be brief. Um, 
The mayor's budget shows a commitment to improve the city's homeless shelter system. We support the turning the tide plan. Um, and we support the model budget process, though we think the process should be improved to allow some more flexibility with providers during negotiations. Um, and now we want to talk about some of the concerns we have in the, in the budget. Uh, we think the city council should work to preserve Thrive NYC funding. Um, the Thrive NYC is a large ambitious program that spans many agencies, causing some to criticize it as unfocused and lacking metrics. This has not been our experience at Gateway Housing, where we are seeing firsthand positive concrete results being achieved with new staff positions funded by Thrive NYC. Um, we run a program that seeks to improve school attendance for homeless children, and that program works with Thrive-funded positions, including the client care coordinators that are at the city shelters and the um, Bridging the Gap social workers from the Department of Education. Both of those positions are critical to our program and critical to, we think, improving um, school attendance among homeless children. We've seen some pretty positive results already early on with the program. Um, one third of the students we've worked with have improved from having chronically home, being chronically absent or severely chronically absent to good attendance over the first four months of our program. That couldn't have happened without these Thrive funded positions. Uh, unfortunately, the mayor's budget cuts the Bridging the Gap social workers. We're asking the city and the city council to restore these funding cuts and add an additional $6.5 $6 million to expand the program. And we also hope that uh, the client care coordinators are not vulnerable despite the sort of criticism that's come from Thrive NYC. Uh, lastly and briefly, I'll just say that Gateway fully supports the House Our Future campaign uh, to set aside 30,000 units of the mayor's housing plan for homeless families and individuals and we support intro 1211. And finally, we support the human service community's calls to address uh, the chronic underfunding in their sector by investing $250 million this year to fill the gap between their indirect costs and the contract reimbursement rates. Thank you. Thank you, and I just wanna thank uh, the work that you guys do at Gateway Housing for providing an effective model uh, to help transition uh, people into permanent housing, and I think it's uh, something that we should be, you know, uh, replicating, uh, you know, all over the city. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, thank you, Chairs Levin and King, <clears throat> for hearing our testimony today. My name is Reed Vreeland, um, and I'm with Housing Works, uh, one of the largest uh, HIV AIDS community-based HIV AIDS services organizations in the city. I'm here today uh, to to really thank the council. Uh, for the ending the HIV AIDS epi epidemic initiative um, that the council has, has uh, funded. Um, due to this initiative, both at this, the, the mayor and the city, um, the city's investments, we've been able to decrease new HIV infections in New York City by 36% um, by, since 2013. Um, so that's a really considerable achievement. Um, I'm here today to specifically talk about um, the HASA healthcare integration pilot project. So as we know, um, housing is healthcare, especially uh, with, for people with HIV, and it's uh, almost impossible to um, stay on antiretroviral treatment for HIV if you don't have a stable place to live. Um, we we uh, have uh, proposed and are in the middle of um, a HASA healthcare integration pilot project, um, and we hope for continued funding and support from the council for this initiative. Um, despite current services, um, many HASA clients continue to face uh, structural psychological barriers to effective care uh, that can result in high utilization of healthcare services, uh, yet poor health outcomes. Since 2016, uh, working groups composed of staff from HASA, New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and HealthX, and community-based organizations and healthcare providers um, have worked together to develop demonstration projects to improve outcomes and uh, health opportunities of people uh, within, living with HIV who are part of HASA. Um, I, I look forward to future opportunities, but I do want to be here and say thank you on behalf of Housing Works um, and people with HIV um, for the council's continued attention on how to continue to help people with HIV um, who need housing assistance. Thank you, Reed. Um, 
I, I just want to say I, I apologize for not uh, getting to ask questions about HASA uh, during the uh, DHS uh, HRA testimony because um, we were running late. Um, but we do plan on having a hearing um, in this committee uh, sometime, hopefully before the summer, on the HASA demonstration projects to see if we can get a clear update as to how the progress is and what, what's working um, and what's not working as well. So, but we're looking forward to, uh, to doing that and we'll be in touch. With, with you and Housing Works. Great. Thank you very much, Chair Levin. Um, also, I wanted to note that Housing Works does support the How's Our Future campaign um, request, too. And Excellent. Thank you. Um, thank you to this panel. Thank you for all the work that you do. I look forward to continuing to work with uh, you and, and, your, uh, and your organizations uh, for many years to come. So thank you. Next panel, Chelsea Goldinger, LGBT Center, Ariel Savransky, UJA Federation, Michelle Jackson, Human Services Council, Gregory Brender, United Neighborhood Houses, Catherine Chapani, Homeless Services United, Michelle Yanch, Good Shepherd Services, and Christina Coleman, Children's Village. And I apologize to everybody whose name I did not call yet. Um, we're doing this in somewhat random fashion, so um, you know, I, I appreciate everybody's patience uh, with this annual uh, marathon that we do here at the General Welfare Committee. Okay, whoever wants to begin. All right, I'll go first. <laughs> um, good afternoon, my name is Michelle Jackson. I'm the Deputy Executive Director for the Human Services Council. Thank you so much for providing me the opportunity to testify and for staying with us um, on the marathon day. Uh, that happens every year. HSC represents 170 human services organizations. You're fam very familiar with our work and familiar with the work of our providers who help over 2.5 million New Yorkers every year. Um, this year, I really want to focus on the gap between what the city funds for human services contracts and what providers can supplement with private philanthropic dollars. That gap has grown too large, and our ask this year, which you've heard a couple of people testify already, is $250 million for indirect funding. The Nonprofit Resiliency Committee has put together an indirect manual uh, that does not contain funding to actually pay nonprofits real indirect rate. While a not very sexy issue, um, what a lot of people testified about today and the questions that you had really do come down to how providers are paid for their work or not paid for their work and their ability to provide quality services. There's a lot of work that needs to be done in that area from program design involving providers. We're seeing RFPs, whether it's Compass and Sonic or caregiver RFPs that are coming out that don't uh, fund the full costs and don't um, take a lot of the qualities that we've seen the Nonprofit Resiliency Committee put forward. Um, they're not implementing them as we see new RFPs roll out. So there are a number of issues, but one issue we know we can focus on this year is the indirect funding initiative. Uh, providers need to be able to pay their staff. They need to be able to track outcomes. They need to be able to budget better. Uh, the city knows that when they pay providers, they're not covering the real indirect expenses. And that leads to some of the issues that we're talking about, about how providers can better serve um, people in our communities and make sure that the quality programs that New Yorkers deserve and that you're hearing from today are, are really implemented in the right way. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair Levin and, and Chair King for the opportunity to testify. My name is Gregory Brender. I'm here on behalf of United Neighborhood Houses. Wow, that was quick. <laughs> we are New York City's Federation of Settlement Houses, and I wanted to talk today specifically about um, early childhood um, and the RFPs that are now coming out. Um, most of the issues, or actually I think all of the issues that I'm gonna talk about are things that this committee has been uh, fighting for for many years. Um, DOE has now released two requests for proposals to replace programs that are currently run through ACS under Early Learn, the Birth to Five RFP and the Head Start RFP. Um, 
And in both these RFPs, we found uh, five major issues that um, are so severe that many providers who've been longstanding providers are actually questioning whether they can apply or if they can apply it's to serve the same number of children. Uh, the first of these is around the salary disparities, which um, I know you've heard about from uh, earlier from folks in the union as well as the daycare council. Um, truly uh, stark disparities that are leading to turnover in the programs. Uh, secondly, it's the failure of these uh, contracts, which are eight-year contracts to include any provision for cost escalators. Um, it's reasonable to expect that rent and other expenses would increase over eight years, and there's not even a method with, within the RFP for future budgets to include that funding. Uh, thirdly, as uh, Michelle mentioned, uh, these RFPs do not fund indirect costs. Um, fourth, the um, program brings back the pay for enrollment system, uh, which had actually been phased out by ACS, um, started in the Bloomberg administration over the um, objections of then Council Member de Blasio and phased out. So it's been, it's really surprising and disappointing to see it return in the birth to five RFP. And finally, um, in the birth to five RFP, they create a new, Steely creates a new distinction between um, program, the extended day programs between the pre-K hours and the hours that are not covered by pre-K, splitting them into what they're calling core and non-core hours. Uh, this, diff this goes away from a model of early childhood education that, um, that uses the understanding that children are learning all the time, that there's not a separation between learning and recreation in early childhood. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify and um, look forward to working with with on it. Thank you. Hello, my name is Chelsea Goldinger and I'm the manager of government relations at the LGBT Center, uh, the largest center, LG LGBT center on the East Coast and the second largest nationally. And we've covered a lot of important content already and I can't thank the advocates enough, wish they were still here. Um, I just wanted to call everyone's attention to the disproportionate number of LGBTQ youth um, in the homeless population. An uh, estimated 43 percent, um, yes, 43, almost half, of homeless youth identify as LGBT, LGBTQ, um, and LGBTQ young adults have 120 percent higher risk of ultimately ended up ending up homeless. Uh, once within the system, uh, hopefully folks from ACS are still here, finding affirming care um, from providers and families becomes even more challenging, especially for especially for those most vulnerable within our community, the transgender and gender non-conforming folks. Um, so often they end up kind of stuck between families because they can't find placement, um, whether they're the actual families or the caseworkers and staffers are just not trained um, in affirming language. Secondly, uh, at the center, we don't actually have housing services, but one thing we provide is what we call our LIFT program, which aims to actually keep families together. We know that the best way to actually keep children out of the foster system and lead for the best future outcome is to help those families stay together, so providing that direct counseling and support, um, especially for LGBTQ youth who often face, um, actually um, have to leave their homes due to not welcoming environments from their families. Um, and so we just urge the inclusion of that um, within whatever trainings um, ACS is working to include for those services. Uh, and the only other thing I did want to just point out, we also do a youth advocacy program, um, which again is to help connect folks who've been within the system um, and helping with that mental health support afterwards. Um, so I have 18 seconds. So yes, affirming training, next. <laughs> Good evening, my name is Arielle Spransky. I'm an advocacy and policy advisor at UJA Federation. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and for holding this hearing today. Uh, so my colleagues, Michelle and Gregory, did a pretty good job of <laughs> summing up the concerns of the human services sector, so I'm just going to echo everything they said and um, highlight just a few other things from our testimony. Um, so I'd just like to discuss the importance of investing in the Elie Wiesel Holocaust Survivor Initiative. You know, the council has been very supportive over the past few years, and we really appreciate that support. Um, it's essential that we continue to invest in this program. Um, many of our nonprofit partners provide services such as uh, case management services, personal care and assistance, legal services, entitlement counseling, and a whole host of other services that are really important to this population and their specialized needs. Uh, so we would just request that uh, we increase funding by $500,000 to $4 million in FY20. Um, and then I would just like to highlight the importance of increasing access to meals, especially kosher meals. Uh, there are over 500,000 people living in poor or near poor Jewish households in the greater metropolitan area. Uh, the high cost of a kosher meal presents a unique challenge for many of our agencies that work with this population. Uh, SNAP benefits often run out 
after the third week of the month for uh, the majority of people who live in New York City. It happens even earlier in the month for those who keep kosher because of the high cost of kosher food. Um, so it's essential that the city invest resources in ensuring that food pantries are equipped with enough food to serve their clients, especially culturally competent foods such as kosher and halal. Uh, we're also supportive of other initiatives meant to increase access to meals throughout the city, including increased investment for EFAP, congregate and home delivered meals for, for seniors, uh, investment in expanding the anti-hunger safety net, and increasing access to kosher and halal school meals. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Hi, good evening, uh, Chair Levin, Chair King. I'm Catherine Trapani. I'm the Executive Director of Homeless Services United. Um, I too have run out of time pretty early. Um, I'm going to speak on a couple different areas of the budget. HSU represents uh, the nonprofit providers of both prevention, um, so under the HRA umbrella, as well as shelter and aftercare on the DHS side. So before I get into the specifics, I want to echo, um, certainly we're all human services providers, um, and I echo the request for increases to the indirect rate um, so that the full operations of our program could be funded. Um, on the prevention side, I want to talk a little bit about rental assistance and the vouchers. Um, the, the, the CBOs that do FEPS applications for persons living in the community um, used to be handled by the state. They were transferred over to the city. The city is now considering eliminating that $3 million program um, where the CBOs uh, facilitate applications for rental assistance. Um, they do much more than just push paper and applications. They actually have a tremendous role in preserving housing for people in our community, so we would urge HRA to continue funding the FEPS CBOs. Um, we also would urge uh, the city to finally extend rental assistance eligibility to DYCD shel uh, shelter residents. Um, I know you know this, Chair Levin. Um, that has not uh, been uh, explicit in the budget, um, and we would also request enhanced support for the all important walkthroughs. We heard from families the devastating consequences when uh, walkthroughs are not fully uh, funded and people aren't held accountable for that. The nonprofits that are doing those walkthroughs need the resources to do them correctly uh, to dedicate staff time, so we need enhancements on the prevention and on the shelter side to do those walkthroughs. Um, I also want to touch briefly on services and shelter. You mentioned earlier um, when you were questioning Commissioner Banks that um, there are not social workers for children and families in hotels. We would like to see client care coordinators under the Thrive Initiative assigned for families with children's sh uh, shelters. Um, we would also like to see the Bridging the Gap social workers funded in the schools for homeless children. So all of these speak to wellness um, for children and families. And then the, the last thing I want to say is that um, for the Street Solutions portfolio, we would really like to see a rate adjustment because those uh, providers were left out of the bottle budget and I think that doesn't get talked about enough that um, drop-ins and safe havens have not seen any rate increases since the inception of those programs um, in addition we need uh, assistance for uh, opioid treatment in those programs with those uh, with those clients so clearly I have a lot to say uh, you have my written testimony with all the different program areas but we just want to thank you for your advocacy and just with the DYCD uh, population, <clears throat> I thought that was supposed to happen by now. It was supposed to happen um, about two to three years ago. When yeah. was the 90-day review? That yeah. was one of the initiatives. So yeah, we've been waiting yeah, for every iteration of the program. And right, I'm right. becoming increasingly concerned that it's a savings uh, initiative to uh, delay the implementation. Uh, yeah, I mean, I saw in the new uh, the new rules for the you know for the new the new program, it allows right for for a referral from DYCD but I don't know whether it actually uh, yeah, I'm told they're close. I'm thing. told they're close. Um, so that was November 2018. Um, mm -hmm. I've been talking with DYCD. I know they intend to 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 do this and that they almost have regulations, but we're we're all still waiting. Yeah, really frustrating. Uh, totally unacceptable at this point. So okay. Okay. thank you. Hi, how you doing? My name is Christina Coleman. Um, I'm with Children's Village. I've been there about 10 years. I'm currently the program manager over the Way to Success program, which is a program that supports children aged and out of care. Um, we also assist children with that transition into adulthood. Um, we are privately funded, so money is really um, important for us to do the work that we are doing. Um, also, we focus on three essentials um, in the program, which is education, um, employment, and financial literacy. 
we have some different things that we do because the children, for the children, the program is optional. So they are not required to be in it, but they do come on their own. We do that through encouraging them by coming through doing workshops. We offer incentives. One of the incentives that we do offer is we do a matched account. And what that is, is we encourage our kids to save their own money and we will match up to $500 a year for each kid. Um, also, what we do, we um, offer workshops and we also do a lot, of, um, a lot of our work with Credible Messengers as far as the mentoring component of it to keep our kids engaged. I'm just gonna give you some of the statistics that we do have right now. Um, we have about 80, over 80% 80 of our youth that are currently in school or registered in, with some type of education program. We have 100% of our kids that currently have stable housing and about 92% of our kids that are employed through our program, so the funding is really important for us. Sounds successful. It is very successful. <laughs> uh, perhaps it's something that we should be expanding. Right? Yeah, for Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. Th congratulations. Thank you. I look forward to continuing to work with you on that. We should be funding it by the city, yeah. for sure. Supplementing your private. <laughs> yes, you should. <laughs> Hi, I'm Michelle Yanchi, Associate Executive Director of Good Shepherd Services. Uh, we're a member of Human Services Council, so I want to uh, underscore what Michelle said about the need for right-sizing our contracts, and in particular, funding indirect. And also want to join with my colleague Gregory as a member of the Campaign for Children and lending our voice uh, for the need for salary par parity in early childhood. Um, I won't be reading my testimony, but I want to use my time to underscore two uh, and focus on two areas in foster care. Well, the first is the crisis in residential care, uh, and the second is um, to lend our voice in support of the need to fund fair futures and expand um, the incredible model that is having inc such great success with young people. Um, first on residential care, uh, the recent media coverage of the Children's Center shined a spotlight on um, what has been a really ongoing crisis. Councilman Levin, at your budget roundtable, you may remember me talking about um, our staff who are um, under the most incredible stress dealing with our most traumatized youth and who are the uh, most likely to be physically assaulted at work. Um, these are the same young people uh, that, we're, that we're talking about here. Uh, we, of course, uh, are in full support of addressing the crisis at the Children's Center, but we want to underscore that the crisis is, is not limited to the walls of the Children's Center. Um, it's also uh, affecting our programs, and what we need is a systemic solution and a systemic investment to make sure that uh, we can take care of these young people wherever they are. Um, also, to make sure that um, the investment can't be one-sided on the ACS side, because what then happens is that sucking sound of our staff going to ACS, which is our own uh, child welfare foster care version of salary parity. Um, we need to be, make sure that the providers can also um, fund sta uh, staff and have services um, and the kind of model that will enable us to be successful for these young people also so that we can accept more of the young people that need to leave the Children's Center and come to us. We have lost a lot of capacity because we've lost staff. Um, and I know many other colleagues will be saying a lot about Fair Futures. Um, we just want to say that when, when a young person is taken away from their family, we, together with you, the providers in the city of New York, serve in loco parentis. Um, and we need to be fulfilling that responsibility both to keep our young people safe and secure when they're with us and to launch them successfully into their futures the way that we do as parents with our own children. Thank you. Thank you. Couldn't, say, couldn't have said it better myself. So. Um, I want to thank all of you for the amazing work that you do day in and day out um, on the front lines, uh, um, helping and advocating and supporting um, uh, you know, New Yorkers in need. And, and I, I just want to um, uh, thank you for all that great work and your organizations as well. Thank you. Thank you. Ditto. <laughs> I just want to uh, let everybody know that um, there is at 6 p.m. scheduled to be a Charter Revision Commission uh, hearing in the chambers, so I think we might have to move next door if we, if we go past 6, but just right there into the committee room. Okay, next panel, Georgia Booth, Children's Aid, Danielle Fuller, Forestdale, Don O'Toole, Forestdale, Don Safaya, Hartshire St. Vincent, Jess Danhauser, Graham Windham, 
and Raisa Rodriguez, Citizens Committee for Children. And one more, Dareth Ogle. Ready? All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Honorable Council, ACS leadership, staff, and esteemed guests. My name is Danielle Brown Fuller, and I am Director of Youth Development at Forestdale, a family service organization out of Queens. I am here today to ask for your support for the Fair Futures Initiative to make sure all young people in care are given the supports they need to succeed. And I am also here with the message, together we can do this. Since 1854, when Forestdale was founded, we have helped tens of thousands of youth, adolescents, gain skills that will serve them long after they leave the child welfare system. Samantha, not her real name, after being separated from her family in foster care, struggled with trusting people, sharing her feelings. She needed what any young person needed, a safe home, education, health care, among other things. In working with our life coach, she has been able to go back to college and she's studying psychology. She rents an apartment with her, near her sister. She has full medical coverage but the statistics are staggering for other youth. There's joblessness, homelessness, pregnancy. But there is good news. We have discovered what works with the right support, a coach, education, career services. Kids can thrive. And that is what Fair Futures is about. Together, we can do this. New York can be the first state to offer comprehensive support for youth ages 15 to 26, and in doing so, change the system and thousands of lives in the process. Thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Um, thank you, Chair Levin and Chair King. Uh, for the opportunity to testify. My name is Raisa Rodriguez. I'm the Associate Executive Director for Policy and Advocacy at Citizens Committee for Children. CCC is an independent, multi-issue um, child advocacy organization. You have um, my testimony. CCC has done a comprehensive budget analysis or analysis on the impact of the preliminary budget, which I've um, attached to the, to the um, testimony. And I won't read my entire testimony, but I'll, I'll highlight or focus on two key areas, early childhood education and family homelessness. Um, in the area of early education, I will echo um, what many of my colleagues have already said and what Chair Levin has already said as well earlier in the day uh, regarding the significance of this time, really, to bring about much needed change to the early childhood system by ensuring, ensuring salary parity. Um, I don't have to tell you the impact this is having on programs, but there is a real challenge to attract and retain, and retain uh, quality teachers, right? And so if we want equity in education, we have to start early on. Um, and most of our early childhood UPK seats are in CBOs. Um, in the area of family homelessness, uh, I want to echo again um, the key critical services that are needed for homeless students. Um, we fully support the Bridging the Gap um, initiative to place social workers in schools with high concentration of homeless students. Uh, this budget fails to make significant investments in that area. Um, and we know that there are a large number of schools that still have no social workers with a high number of homeless students. Um, and so we urge the council to, to continue its, its relentless push to make sure that this funding is made available to restore the 13.9 and also expand to reach the 100, which was last year's goal. Um, I'll also end with two other points. 
Um, thank you, Chair Levin, for bringing greater attention on the need of children in, that are staying in hotels um, while the city is, is phasing out hotels as a uh, temporary placement. There still continues to be a lot of children there that, as you mentioned earlier in the day, don't have access to much needed services. So please continue to shed a light on that. And then lastly, the need for prevention. Um, we know we continue to hear home base um, is a resource for communities, but we know that it's not doing all that it can um, to prevent entry into shelters. Thank you. Good evening, Chair King. Good evening, Chair Levin. Thank you for um, having us here today. I'm Jess Danhauser, the President and CEO of Graham Wyndham. You've heard a lot about Fair Futures already. You're going to hear a little bit more. Um, but I, I want to echo um, something you said earlier, Chair King, that we can decide to do something about this now, or our young people are going to end up in other systems. We've been talking about this issue forever. I was in graduate school in 2003, and I was studying this. Um, I've been working in this city in around these issues for 15 years, and we've been talking about it and talking about it. Now is the time to do something. It seems like an awfully noisy time in our system, lots of new ideas, lots of um, great ideas, a lot of priorities. But we cannot go another year and let down our kids again. We have to see them through one of the hardest transitions of their life. Kids who have families with resources don't have to make the choices our kids have to make. And I just appreciate your leadership on this issue. I appreciate you starting the morning and finishing your day on this issue, Chair Levin. Um, ACS um, says the right things, they are committed to these kids, they've done a lot of good things. But we can't get away from the reality that only about 12% of the kids um, are getting this type of service post foster care because philanthropy has stepped up. It's time for the city to step up and show the country how this can be done well. You know the stats. At Graham Wyndham, we started a program five years ago. We're coaching 400 kids now. 92% of the kids who reach aging out have graduated from high school. It is doable. We have stopped blaming the kids. We act like those stats are their fault. It's not, it's the adults. Um, and I just wanna ask you to try to clear out the noise and for once and for all, help us compel the city to do something by these kids. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Chair Levin and Chair King. A little, little more about Fair Futures here. So I'm Don Zafay. I'm the Executive Director at Hartshire St. Vincent's. We're a, we're a nonprofit located in downtown Brooklyn. Um, we serve over 6,000 New Yorkers every year, 600 of them in foster care. And our goal is to keep every child safe and with a loving family, but that's not all we try, strive to do. Removing a child from their families is the most extreme event that can ever happen in their lives. Oftentimes, due to this loss and the pain associated with missing their parents and adjusting to a new home, youth fall behind in school and cannot catch up. The current foster care system is primarily based around a case planner model. Uh, case planners are required to work with all parties in the system, judges, attorneys, birth parents, foster parents, the young person too, um, to work towards permanency, a permanent home. This can take months, years, or for some children, never happens. And there is no one in the system that is just focusing on the needs of that young person. So this is especially problematic for teens and young adults who have limited help to catch up in school and navigate middle and high school. We hear from young people that they are often forgotten by the system when they become a teenager. We heard that from Gabby this morning at our rally. And this is evidenced in the data. Only 22% of 700 youth who age out of the foster care system every year have a high school or high school equivalency degree. We think this is shameful. We know that we can do better. We know that our kids can do it with just a little bit of support, a very small investment by the city um, that will pay dividends. It's not only the morally the right thing to do, it will pay dividends for the city financially. So. Um, I'm going to leave it to Dareth to, to talk more. We have one more youth speaker. Hi, good evening, um, Chair Levin, Chair King, members of the Committee on General Welfare and Juvenile Justice. 
My name is Derek Ogle. I'm here to testify on behalf of the Fair Futures Initiative Campaign and the American Dream Program of Harshia St. Vincent's. I'm 22 years old and have recently discharged out of foster care. I entered foster care at two and a half years of age and remained in foster care for 20 years. Um, I've been in 25 plus foster homes and about half of that uh, is how many schools I've been in. Um, at times I felt very misfortunate and discouraged in regards to my academic future. However, I later realized the advantages of being in care in my adolescence when I entered college in 2014. I was introduced to the American Dream Program aimed to help youth success successfully navigate through their higher education experience. I then was assigned a coach who would assist me in that navigation. Since then, I've learned a great deal. Our coaches, they play an invaluable role in foster youth academic pursuits as they provide academic, moral, and base, baseline emotional support while in school and thereafter. Coaches in the American Dream Program act as guardrails and advocates. My coach, like many other coaches, often serve as a liaison between executive personnel and students. Having a coach, apart from my case planning team, has made a great difference in my experience of being, in, being a foster youth in higher education. Harshia St. Vincent, Harsh, Vincent coaches assure that students receive optimal support and resources toward their financial and emotional needs. In my personal experience, the support from the Vice President of the American Dream Program down to the coaches have, have always inspired me to keep going. Whether it was a holiday card containing motivational quotes or a hand-knitted scarves throughout the winter, those small gestures are what made it bearable to push through. In the most challenging moments, of doubt and confusion, sorry. <laughs> Coaches assure going. that should we need anything, that they're an email, text, or telephone call away. As a result, May of 2018, I graduated University at Albany with a Bachelor of Arts. Thank you. Moving forward, foster youth need to know that there are measures and resources in place that are intended to continue investing in, the, in their academic success. Foster youth also need to know that there are people in their government who want to see them succeed and will continue to provide opportunities to, juice, to do just that. Programs like the, American Dream, like the American Dream allow foster youth that, that chance as well as the opportunity to break many generational cycles of formerly uneducated working class families. Allocating the proper resources and funding for programs relative to the academic success of foster youth is vital to society as well as the upholding of the mission and values of human service organizations throughout New York State. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to testify before you. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Georgia Booth and I'm the Vice President for Child Welfare at the Children's Aid um, Society, and I am here today. Uh, you have my testimony, so I'm not going to read it. Uh, I want to just highlight a few things in the budget that I think are important. So you, important you've heard from my colleagues today. You were at the, the rally. Thank you uh, very much for being there um, and for having us here today, uh, Chair Lemon and Chair King, um, to talk about Fair Futures. It, at Children's Aid, we have our Next Generation Center in the Bronx, um, in the South Bronx, and we, we work with young people that are aging out of the foster care system to make sure they continue their educational goals, that they hold on to the housing that we're able to, to get uh, for them, that they see, you know, that they see that they can um, you know, get a job and keep a job. And we provide training and internships with the support of a lot of um, private funders to allow us to do that. And so um, young people have that opportunity. As you heard from my colleagues, it's a small investment. We need to be able to do this to help young people you know, get on their feet and, and, and move forward. I also want to um, uh, just give a, a, a quick example of the importance of um, you know, funding our nonprofits appropriately. Um, our homemaker program has been around since 1933, started uh, in partnership with Eleanor Roosevelt and the Junior League, and we've been providing support to families in their homes, helping them to take care of their little children and preventing them from ending up in foster care. We've not had a COLA 
increase in that funding since 2011. Actually, we had one Kohler increase since 2011. Um, and we're at the point now where every year we're subsidizing a $300,000 deficit on that contract because it's not appropriately funded. And we're at the point as a nonprofit, as you've heard through the Human Service uh, Council, that we can't continue to operate these contracts um, without the support and resources that we need. And so, you know, that's an important thing uh, to mention. And just one final point that I want to make. I know ACS, uh, where all of us uh, going through the uh, RFP process for our preventive programs, uh, we know preventive programs work. Uh, you've heard about that in terms of the lower amount of kids coming into foster care and how many families we're, we're supporting. As we we work to implement Family First at the federal level in New York City. One of the things I, I just want to highlight as we're implementing more evidence-based models into our preventive um, portfolio is the need for support for our child welfare work, uh, workforce. You've heard about parity in, in, um, in child care and in other uh, areas. This is desperately needed in our child welfare workforce. We can't keep kids safe. We can't um, do the work that we need to do if we don't have the right staff that's trained and that's being compensated well. And so as we're moving through this process, I would ask you all to keep that in mind in terms of making sure that these contracts and the budget models support nonprofits to pay our staff well so we can do the work um, that's needed for the city. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, no, I, I, uh, it's as if we're playing a game of chicken with, um, with the not-for-profit sector that we entirely rely on to deliver services um, by uh, perpetually underfunding the contracts um, and uh, daring uh, not-for-profits not to uh, bid on the RFPs, and I think that that's shameful, and I think that we need to stop that and fully fund these contracts and fully fund our not-for-profit sector, because if we were to try to rely on ourselves as a city government to deliver services, we would never be able to do it. Um, and you have the expertise and, uh, and the passion and the, the ties to the community, uh, all of these agencies, to do it, and, um, and we rely on you. So I want to thank you. Um, and, and I want to thank you very much for your amazing testimony um, and for, uh, for being here today and for continuing to advocate. Thank you very much. So we actually have to uh, move over now because they have to prepare this room for, uh, for the charter revision. They didn't, they didn't think that we could go this long, but we proved them wrong. Uh, so uh, thanks everybody for your patience and we'll just uh, uh, move over it'll take uh, just a couple minutes okay welcome back everybody uh, so we're gonna go with the next panel uh, around this one around uh, um, food insecurity Victoria Wolf neighbors together Vernon Jones neighbors together Harold Alexis, Neighbors Together, Nicola Daru, Food Bank of New York, Joel Berg, Hunger Free America, Joel's still here, and Michael Otley from Holy Apostle Soup Kitchen. All right, I think we've lost. Well, well, we'll call some more folks then. We have five people, so we'll just move on. Okay, so Greg Walt, Walt, Waltman? Yep. Right? Kawaki Kamatsu? Lisa Gittleson? Clark Wheeler? Joanne Yu? Rachel? Eicher and Louis Sawi. Good. Uh, okay, Mr. Sawi will put you on the next panel.
Okay, whoever wants to begin. Good afternoon, Greg Waltman. Uh, I have a clean energy company called G1 Quantum. We're about seven years old. We specialize in different types of proprietary innovation, solar tech. Um, just bringing to attention the mayor's office today, matter of importance, uh, the issue right out of the right out of the gate, out of the headlines is the issue of reciprocal real estate in the Golan Heights with respect to instability and the unnecessary need for that, as it may relate to a potential solar West Bank solution that could ease those tensions. So I was just I was just bringing that to the to the mayor's attention because it does relate back to the OMB and ACS and fiscal 2020 budgetary concerns as you build your vision moving forward that parsing through the value mainstream media of narratives becomes at uh, you know a, a premium to make sure that our allies Israel and other Middle Eastern allies are protected with the best solutions available at the time and that these solutions can be executed in a real-time manner to create the type of stability necessary. I know that's a paradigm shift in, in thinking, but these are real dollar and cent solutions and if these walls, the US-Mexico border wall, West Bank wall are gonna be in existence, you have 500 miles approximately of West Bank wall that could generate some $72 billion of energy at 12 cents per kilowatt hour at 10 feet of solar wall on one side of the wall. And when you're able to create energy price stability, you can create reciprocity. And when you do that in reapplication to potentially uh, legislated contracts out of New York, as it pertains to the US-Mexico border wall, you're able to reshape and redistribute different types of funds within the state of New York to different types of Section 8 NYCHA-related housing, so you can supplement the federal budget with different types of um, proprietary innovations and, and different types of needs um, where these issues can be addressed and, and reach finality. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Chairpersons Levin and King. I'm Lisa Goodelson. I'm the Associate Executive Director of Kafka. We represent 52 child welfare agencies in New York City. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak on behalf of our members, the staff, and the families that we serve. First, with regard to Fair Futures, I want to thank everybody who participated today. It was really incredible. Thank you, uh, Councilperson Levin, for being there. I want to just say three quick things about Fair Futures. It's about fairness for the youth, it's about fairness fiscally for the city, but even more, it's about fairness for all the members of New York City, because when any single member of our community doesn't reach their full potential, all of us are not reaching our full potential. And to fully invest in the people of our city is to fully invest in all of us in the future for our city. In addition to supporting Fair Futures, I just want to briefly touch on some of the other areas my colleagues have talked about today, all of whom have spoken extraordinarily well, so I just want to do a few more quick things. Our members are working with youth who have entrenched trauma behaviors, many of whom are a danger to themselves and others, many of whom have been recently incarcerated and need to be appropriately reintroduced into residential settings, and many with serious mental health diagnoses. Our members have decades of experience in working with these youth, and we are really ready to partner in meaningful ways with ACS to bring change to these youth, to these families, again, to make sure that New York City citizens are living up to their full potential, and we need full funding in order to do this. We need structured funding to support new ideas, to support the partnerships. We all are in this together and want to do it effectively together. I also just want to uh, touch very briefly on the preventive and raise the age programs. While the numbers of foster youth have gone down so significantly in New York City, that's in part because of the, our success with both the preventive and raise the age programs. We want to continue to see the funding that we're getting for those programs exist so that we can continue to successfully work with the youth in those programs. So I want to thank you for allowing me to testify. I need to excuse myself because I do, as you mentioned earlier, have a child at home that's sick and texting me, asking me to come home. So I thank you for your time. Good evening. 
Uh, I'm Mikola Daru, uh, Vice President for Public Affairs at Food Bank for New York City, the city's major hunger relief organization throughout the five boroughs. I want to thank the city council, this committee in particular, Chairs Levin and King, Councilmember Grudenchik, and Speaker Johnson for your leadership and for your investment in programs that work to address hunger in New York City. During the course of a year, food insecure New Yorkers face a meal gap in their household food budgets of nearly 208 million meals. These people, our neighbors, rely on a diverse network of services to put food on the table. As the council works with the mayor on the city budget, we urge you to continue to invest in vital programs that alleviate hunger, including expanding baseline food funding for EFAP, New York City's emergency food assistance program, as well as initiative funding for food pantries, growing the food access and benefits initiative, which connects low-income New Yorkers to a range of anti-poverty services, and continuing the campus pantry initiative, which enables families to access nutritious food from pantries located in public schools. Last year, thanks to the City Council's leadership, EFAP received a historic increase to baseline food funding in the city budget, the first such increase in years. At a time when our anti-hunger safety net is under constant threat by draconian federal policies, any cuts to EFAP would result in exceptional harm to the most vulnerable among us and to the more than 500 New York City pantries and kitchens that rely on EFAP to serve those New Yorkers. Dedicated funding is still needed to fortify the anti-hunger safety network for low-income New Yorkers in urgent ways. Essentially, we can't take food from pantry shelves to help promote access to anti-poverty benefits. We cannot impede and erode our own progress. This moment calls on us to come together as a city and commit to the principle that all New Yorkers should have access to an affordable, nutritious diet. Thank you. Good afternoon, um, members, uh, leaders. I'm uh, Harold Alexis from Neighbors Together. Um, um, good afternoon, committee on general welfare. Thank you for this opportunity to testify today. I have been in five going on six years. I am sick of the manipulation, threats, mismanagement I am subject to by DHS and HRA staff. In my time in the shelter system, I have had 22 case managers. I have been passed from one staff member to the next and have yet to receive the proper assistance I need to move into housing. The DHS system that uses threats and intimidation to make you feel utterly powerless and submissive. My case managers would expect me to find housing under impossible conditions. I have a physical disability. I cannot manage stairs very well. I need a first floor apartment or a building with an elevator. And with my city FEPS voucher of $1,246, that is an impossible requirement to work with. When I go to my case managers with the status of my own housing search, they would speak down to me consistently. When I would have leads, they wouldn't help. I'm gonna go off the script for a second and just say that this has been a traumatizing experience for me. I've been sick and tired of going from shelter after shelter with promises of housing. And when it looks uh, very great, it seems that I'm going a step backwards. The funding is not there. I have storage in the Bronx. We've, we've touched it because where I lost my apartment, I was in the Bronx. My belongings are in the Bronx. I have explained to the staff members at my shelter that if you make me take a room, I lose my belongings. HRA will no longer pay rent because they will consider that, uh, that uh, a room is, um, is housing. And to me, it's not housing. I'm not a bum on the streets. I don't collect garbage. I have memoirs. I'm a railroader. I'm a, I, I have train collection. I have car collections. I've got dishes, everything in them um, that I want to uh, bring into an apartment. And I'm stuck in shelter. I'm really sick of these threats that they put upon me. I'm being signed with papers, and I don't know what I'm signing. I feel very intimidated. I'm very uh, disgusted. I've been here since 10 o'clock this morning. It's, this has been a very overwhelming day. And when I go back to the shelter, it's the same old foolishness. Uh, where are you? Can you come to the office? Can you sign this paper? I'm a nervous wreck since I've been in this shelter system. I've had it. I want furniture to go back 
to an apartment. I'm ready for an apartment. I'm ready to go home. And I just want to bring this uh, committee. This is my second experience and journey to uh, City Hall. And I thank you for listening and taking uh, time and patience with all your efforts. Please, I need your help. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Hi, my name is Tawaki Komatsu. Um, my testimony today is for Federal Judge Lorna Schofield for, for my lawsuit against the city. Um, this is an audio recording of a chat I had on August 29th, 2017, with a witness about the vicious assault I experienced on July 2nd, 2016, due to zero oversight by HRA of its business partner, Urban Pathways, where I reside, that is housing for military veterans. That assault followed an attempted assault on May 12th, 2016, and was preventable and foreseeable. recording I'm going to play for your benefit is a face-to-face -face conversation with, that I had with fraud uh, HRA uh, Stephen Banks on December 18th of last year in regards to a FOIL request that I submitted to him and my federal lawsuit. So, and the last question that implicates two FOIL requests. Uh, I was assaulted in the building where I resided. I submitted a FOIL request to HRA to find out after I reported to HRA back in, I think, March of 2016, uh, my complaints against urban pathways. What action they took in regards to my complaints. Um, HRA had mm -hmm. refused to comply with those FOIL requests that I have a uh, First Amendment right to. So you've raised this with us before, and HRA made a determination. If you don't agree with it, you can go to a legal services provider, you can go to the City Bar Association, and you can challenge it. And we don't agree with your conclusion. In three days, I have to be in housing court. I need a defense. I submitted a FOIL request to HRA to try to ascertain what corrective action, if any, it took in response to my complaints against Urban Pathways. So you're the chairman of this, of this committee. There's also a public hearing about proposed contracts. HRA is illegally preventing me from examining, examining those proposed contracts in its offices. Um, again, you're the chairman of this committee that is supposed to have oversight of HRA. What can you do about that? Certainly the contract budget is within the purview of the, uh, the budget uh, as a whole, and so, you know, there's, we actually dis discussed that we earlier in the hearing today around um, a desire to have clearer picture of unit appropriations because it's it's not. Uh, That's not the issue. He's, HRA is making proposed contracts available for draft inspe for inspection at Fort World Trade to every other member of the public. When I make that request to go there to see those contracts, their position is we're not going to let you in the building to our offices to see those with your own two eyes. Um, and certainly, if you could uh, send over the FOIL request to me as well, I'll, I'll, I'll do what I can to ensure that it is, it's a public document that it be made public. Court hearing is in three days. Can you get that turned around within three days? I don't know if I can do that, but send me an email tomorrow and we'll, we'll see what we can do. I sent one yesterday. I didn't get a response. We'll, we'll, we'll see what we can do. Good afternoon, Council Member King, Council Member Levin. It's nice to testify in front of my own council member. Um, my name is Joanne Yu, and I'm the Executive Director of the Asian American Federation, and I'm here to submit testimony on behalf of our 70 plus member and partner organizations. Um, as you all know, Asian Americans are the fastest growing uh, racial group in New York, having increased 61% from 2000 to 2017. And, um, we are about 16% of the population. Um, with this dramatic uh, growth also comes dr drastic need 
one in four Asians live below the poverty line, and about 33% of those who, Asian Americans who are eligible to submit, uh, apply for food stamps do not. Um, I think one of the things that um, we've seen, the challenges that we've seen, um, we did a study from that ranged from 2000 to 20, 2002 to 2014 um, of all the organizations, um, the contracts that uh, city has given to Asian serving organizations and um, we only receive about 1.4% of the city dollars and that's a, that's a, a tragedy and um, we've been fighting um, City Hall to make sure that uh, our members have more access to, uh, to resources. Um, one of the biggest challenge, challenges we recently saw, a huge panic in our community was around public charge. Um, and I will tell you that so many, you know, the story from our member agencies was that uh, the, those who are eligible perfectly within their right to apply <clears throat> came and asked to be disenrolled because they were so panicked. And I think, you know, one of the challenges of New Yorkers being intimidated into believing that they have to choose between citizenship and survival is a travesty. Um, the thing that we want to ask you as we are starting to see, you know, um, rules uh, from DC come in, you know, come in hitting our, hitting our cities is to ensure that there's adequate support for the nonprofit organizations that serve the frontline um, communities. We ask that uh, the city council fully fund HRA and ACS to implement language access. And I know that council member, you had talked about um, the new minimum wage. We want to, so many of the member agencies from the Asian American Federation are subcontractors, which means that they don't even get to um, get to the, that level of asking for minimum wage. So we ask for parity with that issue and for a continued request for you to support the nonprofit organizations that serve the most vulnerable in our city. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. Uh, thank you to this entire panel. Um, we look forward to continuing to work with you all um, in, the, in the days and, and weeks and months to come. Thank you. Next panel, Ruth O'Sullivan, Chris Gerasimi, Clark Wheeler, Louis Sawi, Rachel Eicher, Andrea Louis. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Good evening, Chair Levin and Chair King. Thank you for having us here today. My name is Ruth O'Sullivan. I'm a clinician at the Center for Court Innovations. Brooklyn Mental Health Court. Um, I'm here to request the council to support the Center for Court Innovation as it seeks to renew and strengthen the work that we do with over 75,000 New Yorkers annually, many of whom are children and young people in early diversion, alternatives to incarceration, and receiving mental health support. Populations that we serve include children who are victims of crime or involved in neglect cases where they are or are at risk of being placed in child protective custody. Our programs have been shown to be effective. Researchers have documented that our operating programs throughout the city have decreased violence, aided victims, and reduced the use of jail. Our city council funded work has provided individuals with meaningful off ramps from a cycle of poverty and recidivism to real integration back into their communities. To continue to accomplish this work, we seek continuation funding for our core citywide speaker request, our youth-focused supervised release programming that divert defendants from lengthy and costly pretrial detention, and our pre-court project reset pro program. Project reset permits New Yorkers to resolve low-level misdemeanors without ever setting foot in a court, and the case di disappears from the criminal justice system as a decline to prosecute. This avoids many of the collateral co consequences associated with a prosecuted case. Reset cases have been evaluated to be resolved significantly more quickly than traditional criminal court cases. Participants, many of whom are youth, have a lower likelihood and frequency for new arrests. Council provided mid-year fiscal year 19 support to begin borough-wide implementation of Project Reset in Brooklyn. We seek council support for our application to continue this implementation in fiscal year 2020. We also request that council expand funding available under the Mental Health Initiatives for Vulnerable Populations and for Court-Involved Youth. 
we have submitted several applications to permit us to increase mental health access in the outer boroughs where demand outstrips our current capacity. Through council support, we could provide enhanced mental health services and community supervision to diverted youth and their families. For example, our Strong Starts initiatives has resolved neglect cases in as few as six months compared to 17 months in the traditional system. That's the difference between a child returning home as an infant as opposed to a toddler. But currently, demand outstrips capacity for this program. We only have four Strong Starts case workers citywide and there are over 3,000 qualified neglect petitions filed annually. These in the Bronx, we are seeking to expand the number of child crime victim survivors we can serve. These children receive ongoing therapy following their victimization from violent crimes such as sexual and physical abuse. A summary of our applications has been su submitted with our testimony. The City Council support has been invaluable to our work in improving the welfare and expanding fairer justice for New Yorkers. We respectfully urge you to continue to support our work and thank you again for the opportunity to speak. Good evening and thank you Chairman Levin and Chairman King. Uh, my name is Chris Durasimi. I'm Assistant Director for Government Community Affairs for the Wildlife Conservation Society. Um, I'm here to testify today on behalf of the Cultural Institutions Group. I'm a coalition of 33 cultural organizations who share a public-private partnership with the City of New York that spans across the five boroughs. Collectively, we demonstrate a portfolio of work that illustrates our service and connection to the diverse communities that are supported by the city agencies covered through these respective committees. The CIG operates on the understanding that we are owned by the people of New York, and as a community partner, we work diligently to provide greater access to our facilities by working hand-in-hand -hand with city agencies. One such example is the Wildlife Conservation Society's Community Access Program. Since 2006, the Community Access Program provided free access to thousands of individuals, mainly children and families and seniors, to our WCS parks. Through partnering with agencies such as DHS and ACS, along with organizations such as the Cayuga Center and Catholic Charities who house unaccompanied minors, we provided over 3,000 families access to the Bronx Zoo and New York Aquarium this past summer alone. In addition, Carnegie Hall provides songwriting workshops that reach court-involved young people in secure detention facilities, Horizon Juvenile Center in the Bronx, and Crossroads Juvenile Center in Brownsville. Participants develop and express their musical skills, work closely with peers, and build connections to other young people, adult mentors, and artists around their shared interests, giving them an increased sense of agency and personal motivation while reinforcing positive decision making. These examples and more highlighted in my full testimony demonstrate that the cultural community is the city's staunch partner in delivering its services and achieving its vision. Each CIG integrates the communities they live, serve as examples of accessibility, and remain the go-to entity that the city relies on a pilot program such as IDNYC and Plan NYC, both of which have been major successes. Therefore, as the council determines its budget priorities for fiscal year 2020, we ask that we are held at $20 million and consideration be given to additional funding for both the CIG and our program group partners. We ask that the 10 million total that culture has previously received be baseline, inclusive of the 2.25 million that was baseline for CIGs in the budget the last year. Both CIG and program groups are supportive of using the same distribution model for that 10 million that's been used over the last three years. It is our hope that this committee and the city council understand what we offer to New Yorkers and that the CIG is responsive to the needs of the people of the city of New York. But in the end, we need the city's and council's full support. Thank you for this opportunity to testify today, and we appreciate the council's unwavering support. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Louis Sowie, and I am the policy coordinator for CICF, the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families. I thank you, uh, Chairperson Levin and Chairperson King, and members of the General Welfare Committee for holding this important oversight hearing on the city's fiscal year 2020 preliminary budget. Since 1986, CACF is the nation's only pan-Asian children and families advocacy organization and leads the fight for improved and equitable policies, systems, funding, and services to support those in need. Earlier in the last panel, you had someone from Asian American Federation that talked about APA background. Well, I'm gonna add a little more to that. In data collection efforts across the city, including city agencies such as ACS, our communities are 
many times mistaken in our ethnic or language backgrounds and needs or relegated to the category other. This lack of accurately collected data and information on the community, coupled with a lack of accessible information and entry points for APA children and families who require resources and services, is often erroneously equated to a lack of need or risk within our communities. The barriers that Asian Pacific American, also known as APA, families face in navigating the child welfare system are significant. First, many APA and other immigrant families who come into contact with the child welfare system struggle with limited English proficiency. In its own language access and policy implementation plan, ACS recognized nine priority languages based primarily on high frequency of requests for child welfare and child care services in these language. Five of these priority languages were Asian, Chinese, Arabic, Korean, Bengali, and Urdu. Second, APA families may engage in child rearing and disciplinary practices that reflect the cultural norms of their countries of origin, but are, but are considered potentially harmful here. Third, APA families are often misinformed about child welfare laws, the role of ACS, or the availability of resources for at-risk families. For undocumented families, this lack of familiarity is exasperated by the, fact, by the fear that interacting with government agencies will result in punitive action or even deportation. As a result of these barriers, APAs experience great difficulty in communicating with ACS and other ch child welfare staff, understanding and exercising their rights and accessing critical support services that strengthen families and improve child safety. Unfortunately, for many of the APA community, including those most disenfranchised franchise and struggling such as many South Asian and Southeast Asian communities, there's still no culturally competent and language accessible preventative uh, service options. APAs struggle not only with a lack of culturally competent options for services, but also struggle with cultural stigma regarding receiving government services. The recent federal proposals and mandates such as changes in the public charge serve to alienate and punish immigrants, especially those who are undocumented that access needs services. This has only increased the amount of misunderstanding and fear among our communities regarding accessing city services and driven those who require services to remain in isolation. As reported by many of our APA organizational members, language and cultural barriers that persist within the child welfare system in New York City, it includes a mismatch in interpretation services with, regret, with requested language dialect, lack of quality interpretation and interpreter bias, delays in interpretation and poor quality translations of written materials. CICF has wor been working with organizations including ACS to improve child welfare services to immigrant and APA communities for over 15 years. But most recently, CACF has been meeting along with various member organizations with a number of divisions within ACS to develop collaborative strategies to better serve NYC's APA communities. Additionally, CACF was actively involved in CW 2021 process over the past many months through which we participated in a series of meetings convened by ACS and also helped to convene an APA CBO focus group with ACS. Still, there remains much to be done and multiple families are languishing without enough data and understanding of our communities and without appropriate preventative services. So, our recommendations today are and to ensure salary parity for all childhood educators, um, to restore $5.355 million to discretionary child care centers, Expand preventative services and child care programs for the APA community by improving contracting processes with Asian-led and serving organizations, improve language access and cultural competence for APA families, increase education and outreach to the APA community on services and programs available through ACS, and lastly, to increase capacity and partnerships with APA community-based organizations. Thank you. Thank you. I'm pleased to testify this evening along with my Asian American colleagues and those in culture. So my name is Andrea Louie and I'm a founding board member of New Yorkers for Culture and Arts, a citywide cultural advocacy organization. We are a coalition of groups and individuals across the five boroughs working to ensure that every New Yorker has the right and opportunity to engage in culture, express their humanity, and strengthen their community. Arts and culture can powerfully advance the work to support all New Yorkers. And I'd like to share just one example from my colleagues at the Children's Museum of Manhattan. 
Crafting Family Connections is spearheaded by First Lady Shirley McRae and was lost, la launched last April for mothers at Rikers who just de demonstrate good behavior. Once a month, these women shed their tan jumpsuits and shackles, put on street clothes, and send a, spend a few precious hours with their kids engaged in arts activities. In the safe space of the museum, these mothers and children can play, explore their creativity, and bond together away from prison walls. One mother, Amanda Martinez, 32, has visited the museum twice to spend time with her daughter, Ananda, who is 12. Quote, I would have never thought in a million years I would be able to see my daughter without shackles, she said, without a uniform and without these bars. It's already changed my train of thought. End quote. Important programs like Crafting Family Connections cannot succeed without support from the city. Therefore, we join our colleagues in requesting that 10 million be baseline for culture from last year, inclusive of 2.25 million that was baseline for the cultural institutions groups, as my colleague mentioned earlier in this panel. We also request that an additional 10 million be added to the cultural bu budget to be evenly bet divided between the CIGs and the program groups. All of us in the cultural sector are eager to work with you during this budget season to help make sure that the well-being of all New Yorkers is fully resourced and supported. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to thank this panel for all the great work that you and your organizations do. Uh, and we look forward to working with you in this budget and for many years in the future. Thank you. Next panel up, Ricardo Vasquez, Kim, Asha, and I'm Samila, and if I messed it up, Sister Queen Don Project. Chapel Staggers. Well, I'm sorry, Sister Chanel Staggs, I apologize. Manny Keed, Manny T. Keed, Ashley C. Sawyer, Eva Santiago, I'll read them again, Ricardo Vasquez, you Ricardo? Who's Kim? Hi Kim, who's Chanel? Her last name, is it Staggs? Staggis? Saggis? Sister Saggis. Manny, is Manny here? Manny, there's no Manny? Oh, Mary, I'm sorry. Looks like an end, my bad. Who's Mary? It's not your bad, it's my writing. Who's Mary? Oh, oh, hi, Mary. I know there was something about Mary. Okay, Ashley, and Ashley's right. Hey, how you doing? Good to see you. And Eva? All right. Uh, so, let the testimony begin. I'll start, because everyone's hesitating. So, hi, uh, Chair King, thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Mary Keene. I'm the Executive Director of Youth Out of the League, Chair Levin, um, and City Council. Uh, you Gotta Believe has been around for 24 years, and the only thing that we do in all that time is try to find families for kids uh, before they age out of care so that they can have a relatively normal life. I myself have been a parent for over 19 years to youth from the foster care system, um, far too many than I care to admit to. But I started out just as a foster parent until my kids taught me they needed much more than that. They needed a permanent, loving family forever. So they're the reason I joined You Gotta Believe, because through them I saw that all kids who've not been able to return to their birth families need a new family to begin the healing that is essential if they're to live safe and productive lives with healthy relationships and the skills and supports to raise healthy children who will never experience the lives their parents did and who will not become part of the generational pattern of foster care. In over 14 years with You Gotta Believe, I've learned that it's possible for all kids, even the most resistant, to open up to a family, even when they're terrified of getting hurt again. It's not our kids who do not believe in family. It is everyone around them who do not think they can get a family or they are too old. 
We've worked with youth in broken adoptions, giving family another chance. I've seen them blossom when they finally get someone who genuinely cares about their well-being and are not just being paid to do things for them. I've never met a kid, or adult for that matter, who does not want to be loved, even when they show it in the most lovable ways. Most people acknowledge their families and what they've done for them. Uh, Speaker Johnson, at his State of the City address recently, thanked his mother when he started, when he ended, and he went out into the audience to thank her again um, after she had introduced him. Chair Levin, you just acknowledged that you still ask your parents for advice on the New York One interview. Uh, my apologies for going over a little bit. You went on to say, though, that youth aging out of foster care don't have that resource, and we have an obligation as a city to provide them with that resource. But the resource you were referring to is parents. My question is always, why should our kids not have the same? Federal law says to provide permanency, which means a legally permanent nurturing family for every child involved in the system. You gotta believe, believes this, we do it. We've proven it now for 24 years. And because it's so challenging, easier paths are always taken to provide youth with substitutes for family. We've requested fu funding from the City Council discretionary funds. We've begun to work with Children's Village, and we ask your um, support of this so that our kids can heal with a family. Over a year ago, Families First federal legislation passed. I just love the name. Families first, which sums it up. Everything else is gravy, but without a family, everything else is not enough. Thank you again for your consideration. And my team will use much less time than they were allocated, so they'll make up for this. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Ricardo Vasquez, and I'm a speaker and a youth advocate for You Gotta Believe. So um, I'm here to speak on, um, meanwhile, meanwhile main mentoring and coaching is extremely important for in a youth's life. A family is the main core of the youth, for the youth to be able to heal. Throughout my experiences in foster care, I faced a lot of adversities until my social worker made a decision to become my mom. Had it not been for her becoming my mom, I wouldn't be sitting here today, nor do I know in what direction my life was, would, would have gone and due to the mentality and behaviors and the people that I was around at, at that point in time. She was the one who actually taught me to how to develop a new thinking process. She taught me how to develop um, different ways of self-care. Um, she also was very supportive of everything I wanted to accomplish in my life. So no matter what it was, she was backing me. Um, she, my mom was able to look past the behaviors that I had, past the behaviors that I was displaying on a regular basis and was able to see the real person that I was in, that real person that was in me. She was able to steer me in the right direction and help me to heal. If I didn't have a family, I, you know, I think um, my life would have turned out to be a lot more difficult than what it already was. I've been homeless, I've slept on the train. Um, and because of a family, I was able to come out of that situation very quickly. Um, there were some situations that I have gotten into, and at the end of it all, I was able to go home to a family. Had I not had a family, things would have just maybe continued, or I would have just kept falling deeper and deeper down to the point where I may maybe lose my mind and need some sort of men mental health service, because at times things can get very difficult. Um, you keep going. Services are great, but family who pushes you that's where the core and the support is. The family, sir, <clears throat> families is what really help the youth utilize these services. If, a, if the youth has a family to back him, any all the services that we're speaking of, spoken on today, all the services that may get funding for the youth, coaching, mentors, um, just all of these services are effective but when the youth has someone to direct him to make sure that he knows about these services and make sure that he or she, excuse me, um, utilizes these services, then we would see more success. The family encourages youth with love and we all need that to be able to move forward in life no matter what. Thank you so much. Thank you. My name is Kimalisa. 
<laughs> for the, it's for the official record, so. Okay. My name is Kim Alicia Selig Miller, um, currently a youth in foster care. Um, I'm a 19 year old college freshman pursuing my degree in biology. Um, I'm currently dorming at Queens College through the Dorm Project, which is the way foster children can experience the full college life while staying in the city. I've been in care since I was around two or three, and both of my parents' rights have been taken before I turned six. So 10 plus years of legally not having any parents can be very overwhelming, especially being in care when staff do things they shouldn't do and you have no one to speak up for you, just yourself. I appreciate the staff in YGB, you gotta believe. Um, they've kept me confident in the hopes of me finding a family. Crazy how old I am and yet I still have to go to family court for my case since I'm a free child of the state, which basically, which basically means New York State is my legal guardian. I stopped going for a while when two years back when, my se when I was 17, the judge told me that at my age, I wouldn't find a family. It hurt me, I wouldn't lie about that. And what made it worse was that my previous case planner also agreed saying that maybe I should just start doing supportive housing until my NYCHA comes through. I don't see how people could just be okay with not giving a child something that we all deserve and that's a family. Thank you. Yeah, I think, it, yeah, hi. <laughs> hi, Councilman Levin. Um, we know each other pretty well, and how are you doing, Councilman King and, and the committee? Thank you so much for allowing me to, to talk about um, these issues that I hold very close because I have a child who's on the autism spectrum. I work at the Child Welfare Organizing Project as the Director of Programming and Parent Advocate. I've been a parent advocate for three years for families who have involvement with ACS. I go to court regularly, initial safety conference meetings, family team conference meetings, supervised visits, uh, wellness checks, you name it, I pretty much do it. I truly believe in preserving families. We educate our parents on systemic racism. We talk about disproportionality. We talk about the high percentage of removals of children in poor communities of color. We empower, empower parents so that they can advocate for themselves. We definitely intervene when necessary when a parent is hitting a roadblock and they're unable to speak to their attorney or their caseworker in knowing what's going on with their case. I am a parent affected. I had a case in 2011. I have a child who's on the autism spectrum who has several diagnoses. The fear for a lot of parents who have children who are either on the spectrum or who have several diagnoses is that they'll enter another system, and that is a real fear for myself that my son will enter the juvenile justice system because of lack of supports. It was ironic to me that ACS had discussed today that they were having difficulty in placing children with, with behavioral diagnosis and that they had to stay in children's centers for a lengthy amount of time because they did not have the qualifications or expertise in addressing the issues that these children have who have diagnosis. They also talked about OPWDD. Um, my son and many children who are high functioning do not qualify for certain services because they're high functioning. So they fall through the cracks. Their behavioral issues come into play when we talk about their future successes, even though a lot of these children are high functioning and they academically excel um, to the point where my son can comprehend 12th grade and he's 13 years old. So, but they don't take into consideration that these children who are high functioning academically are emotionally delayed. And so they need the pr 
proper supports that are needed for them to excel. I have two cases right now that I'm working on that I'm going to court for, for parents who have children with, with diagnosis, who ACS has told to bring to the agency because of educational neglect, because they are unable to get their children to go to school because of their behavioral issues. And then we come to find out in court that the agency that they had advised these parents to take their children have lost their children. And so now the judge has told this particular family that if your child gets in contact with you, your child can stay with you for the time that we find appropriate placement. So now the parent is adequate in taking care of that child because the agency cannot find adequate, appropriate supports. So I am here, and this is my plight for um, children and all children who are affected by the child welfare system because of poverty. It's all about lack of supports, and I truly believe that if ACS or any other agency, because it happens to be ACS when ACS is no longer here, it'll be another agency. But it's about approaching these families with a restorative lens. They approach these families with a punitive lens, and then they're not able to thoroughly assess the situation correctly, and they're not able to know what is going on in these homes. So thank you again for allowing me to speak today. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Chairperson Levin and Chairperson King and Council staff. My name is Ashley Sawyer. I am the Director of Policy at Girls for Gender Equity, and I'm also an attorney. I will be in lieu of time, because of the time, I won't go into the background about Girls for Gender Equity, but as you know, we are committed to supporting the needs of cisgender, transgender girls, and um, gender nonconforming youth of color in New York, and now, obviously, nationally. Um, our conversation today is specifically related to issues related to the juvenile justice system. Recently, the Administration for Family Services reached out to Girls for Gender Equity, along with Steps to End Family Violence, to pilot a alternative to placement program specifically designed to meet the needs of girls and gender nonconforming youth in New York City. As you know, there was a task force across the city led by the Vera Institute for Justice to end the incarceration of girls in New York. As an outgrowth of that process, we are committed to creating close, excuse me, creating programming in community where young people are still able to live with their families, live in their communities, but receive the social work services, economic empowerment, and what we specialize in at GGE is political organizing skills um, and helping young people learn what it means to be political organizers, to um, drive policy work. That program has the potential to transform the lives of young people. We understand that there's a growing body of research that says that when people who have been affected by criminalization and systems are able to use their voice to change those systems, they have remarkable outcomes. And we wanna make sure that the council is aware of what's happening and aware of the potential for this program and also the critical need for resources. As you may know, before I came to Girls for Gender Equity, I was an attorney representing young people who were in the system in New York. I spent once a week in the housing areas on Rikers working with young people 16 to 24, particularly girls. And in this city, um, I will try to briefly conclude, but in this city, there were no reentry programs that specifically met the needs of girls and gender nonconforming people. There were no um, juvenile justice services that specifically spoke to their needs. The data is really clear now that 90%, I'm gonna repeat that, 90% of the girls who end up in the juvenile justice system have experienced some form of sexual violence. There's no other system where you'll find a higher concentration of sexual assault survivors than if you go to a girls' juvenile prison. And so we cannot expect young people to have great outcomes if they're going to programs that have no idea what they're experiencing or what their needs are. So GGE, along with STEPS and, to, and the Vera Institute, are working together to develop a program that can meet the needs of young people, particularly girls and queer and trans young people. As you'll see in my comments, there are specific, there's data and specific details about what the needs are, but we cannot use a one-size-fits-all 
model when we talk about reentry and prevention services. And so this is an opportunity for the city to invest in the prevention work, making sure that there are no young people sent upstate, making sure that young people have access to the services and the supports that they need. And doing this work with fidelity and integrity is going to require resources and a financial commitment from this body. So we hope that there will be an investment in the young people that deserve our care. These are young people who did not make a choice to end up in these systems, but because they are our in the care of, our, of ACS and other systems, we have an obligation to provide them with the supports and the services that they need. So I look forward to continuing to engage in this conversation with uh, both of you as well as council staff and moving forward, hoping that there will be a commitment made to the girls and the gender nonconforming young people of New York City. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Chanel. I wrote something, I put good afternoon. It's not even afternoon anymore. <laughs> but, um, and I said, I hope y'all join in y'all morning. It's, like, it's all the way evening. But um, my name is Chanel Staggers. I'm currently 18 years old, pursuing my HSC and working with Good Call. Um, I'm residing at Marion Hall, which is a group home that I've been staying at for two years. Being that I struggled with um, choosing whether or not um, if school was more important than staying in school, I said school, if, if working was more important than staying in school, um, um, yeah, I've been in foster care since I was 11, 12. Um, in the beginning, I started off living with my brother, but it didn't work out, which led me into like the eight other foster homes I've been in. The last one I thought would be my big break. I was 16 when I got adopted. I stayed well for like two years. And however, I was happy, but things changed and people changed. It did not work out. To this day, I remain adopted, but me and my adopted mother have not, we don't have no contact whatsoever. I'll be 19 next month. I face challenges that I never imagined. I've also overcame more than I can tell you. I've been doing it by myself, but I can never be more proud. Still, there's more work to be done. I was once resistant to starting over and having a new family until I met Yadi from You Gotta Believe. She enlightened me in explaining her story and why she's helping young adults like myself that's looking for family or family resources, even if I already aged out of foster care. It's a blessing to know there's families willing to adopt young adults, young adults with traumatic experiences. And um, I wanna be where y'all at, because it starts with the policies. That's what I feel like, and that's, that's, that's where it could start to break down and things could start to get fixed. All right. Well, I look forward to you being on this side of the table sometime very soon. Um, and just, I just wanna say really quickly, uh, uh, y, YGB, GGE, and CWAP are, are three of the, uh, my favorite organizations that I get the opportunity to work with. Uh, you all do amazing work. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really an, an honor to be able to, to, to uh, support that work. And this council takes that very seriously and, and, um, and uh, you're out there doing it and, and we, want, we want to be supportive. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Like last call, Jesse Lehman, New York City Employment and Training Coalition. I think Jesse left. Go on one, go on twice. Right, right. I don't oh. see Jesse. He was here before, I saw him before. Julia Durante Martinez, New Economy Project. Okay. And then people we've called before, but might not be here. Michael Leek, Michael Otley, Joel Berg, I know Joel is not here. Vernon Jones. Victoria Wolf, Rachel Eicher, and Clark Wheeler. Going once, going twice. Okay. We got the stage. Floor, yeah. Ms. Durante Martinez, you are our last <laughs> okay, one. member of the public um, to testify. Thank you. Yes, um, good, good evening, um, Committee Chair Levin and um, Councilmember King, my name is Julia Durante Martinez and I'm the Community Land Trust Coordinator at New Economy Project. Along with Picture the Homeless and other advocates, New Economy Project co-founded and co-convenes the New York City Community Land Initiative, which is a coalition of more than two dozen housing and social justice organizations advocating for community land trusts to address the root causes of homelessness and displacement. 
As an outgrowth of this work, New Economy Project and 14 partner organizations are proposing a new citywide CLT initiative uh, that would incubate and expand CLTs in all five boroughs of New York City in fiscal year 2020. Um, so just a little bit of CLT, a little bit on CLTs, they're a proven mechanism to preserve vital affordable housing stock, prevent the extraction of public subsidies, and combat displacement. The CLT is a nonprofit that owns and stewards land in the community's interest and leases use of the land for affordable housing development and other community needs. And CLTs issue renewable 99-year ground leases um, that establish resale and rental restrictions, uh, which helps uh, protect public investment in CLTs from being lost to the market over time. CLTs also engage community members in meaningful decision making over neighborhood development. Um, the boards are typically composed of equal parts residents, community members, and public stakeholders. Um, and they engage in ongoing community organizing and partnership to carry out their work. And both the longstanding Cooper Square Community Land Trust here in New York and the new pilot East Harlem El Barrio CLT, as well as emerging CLTs citywide, have grown out of sustained community led planning and organizing processes. Um, so the CLT model has sparked a citywide movement that has achieved tremendous gains in recent years, and that includes the passage of the city's first local law defining and entering CLTs into the administrative code, increased support from HPD, expanded training and legal assistance networks, and investment of New York State Attorney General settlement funds into local CLTs. And now there are more than a dozen community-based organizations from the Northwest Bronx to Brownsville that are working to develop local leadership and deepen community partnerships, um, organize tenants and homeowners, and identify properties suitable for, the, for their CLTs. Uh, so the proposed initiative would allow groups to build upon this exciting progress at a really critical moment of opportunity. The initiative will support essential CLT community education and organizing, board and member training, build capacity through legal, financial, and technical assistance, and promote coordination among CLTs so they reach a sustainable scale. So we ask the committee to include the CLT initiative in its budget recommendations for 2020. And thank you so much for the opportunity to testify. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we love the work that New Economy Project does. Thank you. Um, okay. Does anyone else wish to testify? <laughs> Chicken, do you have anything else you want to add? Uh, just thank you. It's been a delight. Um, as Carol Burnett would say, I'm so glad we had this time together. <laughs> but I learned a lot, and I appreciate what all, all everyone who serviced City of New York and understand the challenges that we have. However, they are equal or unequal, if we can recognize and we can uncover to recover. And I think that's what today's conversation is all about. So thank you. It's an honor being thank with you, you today. Thank you. Right. And I, I want to thank uh, all the staff, uh, Julia Harris, Daniel Krupp, uh, Aminta Kilowan, Tanya Cyrus, um, uh, Regina Parada ryan Latanya McKinney, Councilor uh, King, do you want to, the, the staff of Mr. Juvenile King Justice? And uh, Josh Kingsley, and of course, Daniel again gets a double billing here today. Mm -hmm. uh, but everybody in this budget process, from the head of Latanya McKinney and, and the whole team here that help us get this right day one, day two. I forgot Tohini Sampura. Um, uh, Frank, Frank Sarno, uh, and uh, our uh, uh, oh, Crystal Pond, Crystal Pond. Uh, and okay, Crystal, Crystal's on here. Okay, and our amazing sergeants at arms yes. uh, who uh, have kept this show running. Um, thank you very much, gentlemen, and thank you all. Uh, with that, I adjourn this hearing. Thanks, guys.